Hey guys, good morning and welcome back again to your Run Academy Need English channel. I hope all of you are doing amazing, all of you are doing great. So my dear students, quickly, let me know in the chats if all of you can hear me, if I'm perfectly audible, visible to every one of you. Let me know in the chats quickly with some fire emojis. Good morning people, good morning, good morning and welcome back. So quickly, give me some, give me some fire emojis in the chat so that I'll get to know I'm perfectly audible and visible to every one of you. Quickly, people. Yes, I'm not well. I have got cold, cough, fever, etc., etc. Yeah. But still, it's okay. <clears throat> Perfect. I feel that, I believe that I'm perfectly audible and visible to every one of you, right? Uh, just give me a second, people, and we shall be starting. Just give me a second. Just give me a second and we shall be starting. <clears throat> just give me a second. Perfect. So, as you all must be knowing, today it's going to be the complete class 11th in Organic Chemistry Marathon, right? Complete class 11th in Organic Chemistry Marathon. I'll be taking in this particular session. Okay, so the ones who have not liked the session yet, I would want every one of you to smash that like, right? And if you have not subscribed to this particular channel, do subscribe to the channel as well so that you remain updated about all the sessions which we are going to take on this particular channel, which is your Unacademy Nate English channel. Okay, perfect. I don't know what is going to be the duration of the class. We have to complete. The whole class 11th in organic chemistry, right? Whatever time it requires, I'll be standing in front of you, right? And I would want you guys to be with me till the end. So first of all, let me know in the chats, are you guys ready to be with me till the end? Because whatever I'll be teaching you, you know, I'll be starting everything from the basics itself, from the scratch itself. So no worries if you have not studied these chapters before, you need not worry about them at all, right? Everything will be discussed in detail. And I'll be touching every single concept which will be asked in your need examination. Okay? And people at the same time, whatever I'm going to teach you today, that's going to be complete relevant stuff. No irrelevant stuff I'll be teaching you. I'll be teaching you straight away those concepts. I'll be teaching you straight away those questions which will be asked in your need examination. Okay? Perfect? <coughs> so should we start then? Should we start? Sir, where are you from? I'm from Srinagar, JNK. And the session PDF, you know, I'll be sharing it with you on the Telegram group. I hope you are already enrolled. You're already there in the Telegram. Perfect, guys. Perfect. So, without wasting a lot of time, let's get going then. Let's get started with the first chapter. Of your class 11th in organic chemistry and that first chapter is your that first chapter is your chemical bonding that first chapter is your chemical bonding are you students first of all first of all from this particular chapter alone from chemical bonding chapter alone let me tell you you are going to get four to five questions you are going to get four to five questions in your upcoming NEET examination. Number one. Number one. Number two. If your chemical bonding chapter is strong, then only your organic chemistry can become strong. So basically in the organic chemistry, you need some fundamentals of chemical bonding. 
तो लेट्स मेक श्योर दो फंडामेंटल ऑफ केमिकल बॉन्डिंग गेट स्ट्रॉगर इन दिस पर्टिकुलर सेशन सो दैट your organic chemistry will get automatically stronger right right people and after chemical bonding once we are done with chemical bonding then there is going to be periodic classification of elements as well right which is one very small chapter perfect from this particular chapter itself also you'll get some two questions in your upcoming neat examination okay perfect so are you all ready should we start <clears throat> Should we start, people? Should we start? Are you all ready? Yeah, exactly. This particular bounce back series will be getting over by twentieth of April, right? We'll make sure it gets over by twentieth of April. So let me know in the chats quickly. Okay, a lot of people are asking about P block. P block won't be done in this session. This session includes. Class eleventh inorganic, and your P block will be done in your class twelfth inorganic marathon. Okay, <clears throat> perfect. P block will be done in class twelfth inorganic chemistry marathon. Today it's going to be class eleventh inorganic. So quickly, people, are you all ready? I want. I want you guys to let me know in the chat. So are you all super super excited about the session? Are you all ready? Okay. So let's get going then. Let's get started. So my dear students, again I'm repeating. In the today's session, almost almost eight questions you'll get from the today's session. Number one, number two. If this session gets clear, then only your organic chemistry can become stronger. Otherwise, not. Otherwise, not. Okay. And tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll be doing some 500 questions of your class 11th in organic chemistry, which will be extra 500 questions. You know that, right? After every marathon, on the next day, we take extra question practice session, right? In which we solve a lot of questions which can be asked from the marathon, which can be asked from the chapters which we do in the marathon exactly. Okay. So let's get going then. Let's get going. No spamming, nothing. Let's have a look. <clears throat> My dear students, if I ask you, how do you define the term chemical bond? What is a chemical bond basically? All of you must be knowing any force, any force of attraction, any force of attraction which holds the atoms or ions. together that is something which you'll be calling as the chemical bond in short any force any force whatever is the nature of the force any force which holds the atoms together in a molecule any force that holds the atoms together in a molecule that force of attraction which holds the atoms together in a molecule that force of attraction is something which you call as chemical bond which you call as chemical bond right for example you have got h2 molecule for example you have got h2 molecule right one simple molecule i took h2 molecule in your h2 molecule there are two hydrogen atoms you know it right there are two hydrogen atoms so there is some force of attraction which is holding these hydrogen atoms together and any force of attraction which holds the atoms together in a molecule that force of attraction is something which you call as chemical bond which you call as chemical bond right for example if you talk about any cl this is na positive this is cl negative na positive cl negative there is some force of attraction which is holding these ions together there is some force of attraction which is holding these ions together and any force of attraction right that is something which you'll be calling as your chemical bond so in short what a chemical bond is all about chemical bond is nothing it is just the force of attraction which holds the atoms together in a molecule right in short my dear students the first type of the chemical bond the first type of the chemical bond which you need to know which one is that the first type of the chemical bond which we are going to do right which we are going to talk about what is that going to be that is going to be ionic bond Ah, uh, someone is spamming. Barani, let me tell you, this is class eleventh inorganic chemistry marathon, right? 
okay so don't spam whatever chapters are there in class 11th in organic chemistry i'll be doing them okay so please don't spam okay cool cool just see the title of the video it's class complete in organic chemistry class 11th there is one more marathon which is scheduled in this week itself that is going to be complete in organic chemistry class 12th marathon i hope i'm clear okay <coughs> <coughs> Someone is asking me why you went to Unacademy. I think you are new to the channel, right? It's been more than one year I'm here. Okay. So the first step of the chemical bond which we are talking about right now, that is your ionic bond or you call it as the electrovalent bond. This is the first type of your chemical bond. Now, what an ionic bond is all about? What an electrovalent bond is all about? Try to understand. Try to understand. Let me tell you the chemical bond. The chemical bond formed between the two atoms due to complete transfer of electrons. The chemical bond formed between the two atoms due to the complete transfer of electrons is something which you call as ionic bond. What does it mean exactly? Let's try to understand. My dear students, for example, for example, I'm taking NaCl. For example, I'm taking NaCl, right? In your NaCl, as you can see, you have got two elements. One is sodium and one is chlorine, right? Sodium, it belongs to group 1, you know it. And chlorine, it belongs to what? It belongs to group 17. Chlorine belongs to group 17. I'll say sodium, as you all must be knowing, it is metallic in nature. It is metallic in nature and your chlorine, it is non-metallic in nature, right? If sodium is metallic in nature, it has got tendency to lose electrons. It has got tendency to lose electrons. Chlorine being your non-metal, right? It has got tendency to gain electrons. It has got tendency to gain electrons, right? Now, if I talk about this particular sodium, since sodium belongs to group first, that means it has got one electron in the outermost shell. That means it has got one electron in the outermost shell. So what this sodium is going to do, sodium is going to lose that outermost electron. And when sodium loses an electron, it gets converted into Na positive. It gets converted into Na positive. Right? Similarly, this particular chlorine which I am talking about, this chlorine, it is non-metallic in nature. Right? It has got high tendency to gain electrons. So what happens? Since sodium, sorry, since chlorine, it is a group 17 element. If it is a group 17 element, it has got 7 electrons in its outermost shell, right? So what this chlorine is going to do, since this chlorine, it has got 7 electrons in its outermost shell. So it just needs 1 electron to complete its octet. Now, since the sodium has lost 1 electron completely, this 1 electron will be gained by chlorine completely and will get converted into what? And it will get converted into Cl negative. So what happened first of all? Sodium lost its electron. Chlorine gained the same electron. Sodium got converted into Na positive. Chlorine got converted into Cl negative. Right? So my dear students, I got, if you look carefully, I got the cation and anion formed over here. The cation is your Na positive. The anion is your Cl negative. Since this is cation, this is an anion. They have got opposite charges. If they have got opposite charges, don't you think there will be electrostatic force of attraction between them? Absolutely, there will be electrostatic force of attraction between these oppositely charged ions. And that electrostatic force of attraction, that electrostatic force of attraction, which arises between these two oppositely charged ions, that electrostatic force of attraction, you'll be calling as ionic bond. So either you'll be calling it as ionic bond, or, or, let me tell you, you'll be calling this as the electrovalent bond. You'll be calling it as the electrovalent bond. Can you let me know in the chats if you got the idea of what this ionic bond, what this electrovalent bond is all about? Right? Perfect. 
I hope I'm perfectly clear. And let me tell you, let me tell you, that particular compound, that particular compound in which ionic bond or electrovalent bond exists, that is something which you'll be calling as ionic compound. That particular compound in which ionic bond or your electrovalent bond exists, that particular compound is what you will be calling as ionic compound. Perfect. I hope I'm perfectly clear to everyone. My dear students, one more thing. One more thing. Remember, sodium lost its electron completely. Chlorine gained that electron completely. So can I say, during the formation of ionic bond, during the formation of ionic bond, can I say complete loss and gain of electron is taking place? Absolutely. So do remember, in your ionic bond, in your ionic bond, what happens? Complete loss and gain of electron takes place. Complete loss and gain of electrons takes place. Perfect. This is one more important point. I hope this is clear to everyone. Now, my dear students, the point is, what are the favorable conditions? What are the favorable conditions for the ionic bond to get formed? What are the favorable conditions for the ionic bond to get formed? See guys, it's evident. For the formation of ionic bond, what has to happen? Cation has to get formed easily. Right? Cation has to get formed. Anion has to get formed. Once cation anion is formed, once cation anion is formed, then there will be attraction between them. Then there will be attraction between them. Right? Then there will be attraction between them. Perfect? Now try to understand what exactly I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> try to understand what exactly I'm going to talk about. My dear students, what are the conditions? Conditions for the ionic bond formation. Conditions for the ionic bond formation. Or I'll say conditions for, favorable conditions for the ionic bond formation. Try to understand what exactly I'm going to say. The first thing, the first thing, it's evident, it's evident my dear students, for the formation of ionic bond, Cation formation has to take place, anion formation has to take place, right? So I'll say one simple thing. I'll say one simple thing. The first condition, one element should be metallic and another should be non-metallic, right? As you have seen over here, your sodium, your sodium, it was metallic in nature. Your chlorine, it was non-metallic in nature. Metallic one, it has got tendency to lose electrons. Non-metallic one, it has got tendency to gain electrons, right? If one has got tendency to lose electrons, then only it can form cation. If one has got tendency to gain electrons, then only it can form anion, right? Then only it can form anion. Perfect. And once cation anion gets formed, then automatically there'll be force of attraction between them. And that force of attraction is your ionic bond. So remember the first thing, the first condition. One element definitely should be metallic. Another one should be non-metallic. Metallic one loses electron, forms cation. Non-metallic one gains electron, forms the anion. Right? Now, my dear students, try to understand very carefully. So one element should be metallic in nature and another one should be non-metallic in nature. The one which is metallic in nature, it should have low ionization energy. Right? So, the one which is metallic in nature, the one which is metallic in nature, which loses electrons and forms a cation which loses the electron, forms a cation, right? Now, the one which is metallic, it has, it should have low ionization energy. It should have low ionization energy, right? If it has got low ionization energy, then it can form the cation easily. Then it can form the cation easily, right? Then it can form the cation easily. Similarly, that element which is non-metallic in nature, that element which is non-metallic in nature, it gains electron, gets converted into what? Gets converted into the anion. Gets converted into the anion. Perfect. Since it's gaining electron, can I say this non-metal should have high electron affinity? It should have high electron affinity. This should have low ionization energy. Because if the metal has got low ionization energy, then it can form cation easily. If it has got more high electron affinity, then it can form anion easily. Right? And as, as that particular metal which has got low ionization energy, that forms a cation easily. 
So that is the best candidate for the formation of cation. Similarly, that non-metal which has got high electron affinity, that is the best candidate for the formation of what? For the formation of anion. Perfect. So my dear students, remember, remember from now onwards. Remember from now onwards. This is very important. One element has to be metallic, another has to be non-metallic, number one. Number two, the one which is metallic, that should have low ionization energy, then only it can form the cation easily. The one which is non-metallic, that has, should have high electron affinity, then it can form anion easily, right? Then it can form anion easily. I believe these conditions are absolutely clear to every one of you. Okay? Now, people, <laughs> now, people, there are some important characteristics of these ionic compounds which you need to know. Some important characteristics. Try to understand. Notes at the end I'll give you, okay, in the telegram. My dear students, since we saw in ionic compounds there is ionic bond. What is ionic bond? Electrostatic force of attraction. And you know, electrostatic force of attraction, that is very strong. That is very strong, right? Electrostatic force of attraction is one of the strongest forces. Perfect, right? Due to which, if electrostatic force of attraction is the strong, stronger force, right? Can I say your ionic compounds, they'll be generally hard due to the strong electrostatic force of attraction which exists between the ions, right? Your ionic compounds, they are going to be generally hard. Number one, due to the strong electrostatic force of attraction, they'll have high melting and boiling points. They'll have high melting and boiling points. Due to the strong force of attraction, these ions will be very close. If the ions are very close, my dear students, these ionic compounds, they will have high density. They will have high density. They will have high density. Right? They will have high density. Perfect. One more thing. One more thing. Do remember this particular point. My dear students, for example, you have taken the ionic compound as NaCl. Let's say it's in solid state here. NaCl solid. Perfect. Now, for example, for example, I am converting this into NaCl liquid. I am converting this into NaCl liquid. Perfect. I am converting this into NaCl liquid. I had NaCl solid. Now, I am, for example, heating it up, continuously heating it up. I am heating it up till it gets converted into a liquid. Perfect. My dear students, when your ionic compound is in solid form, when your ionic compound is, your, is, is in your solid form, it behaves like your insulator. It behaves like your insulator. When the same ionic compound is in molten form, is in molten form, you call this state as molten state. You call this state as the molten state. Rem remember, it behaves like your, it shows the conductance. It shows the conductance. When it's in solid form, it does not show conductance. When it is in liquid form, it shows the, when it is in molten form, it shows the conductance. Or when the same ionic compound is in aqueous form, is in aqueous form, it also shows the conductance. It also shows the conductance. Right? I hope you know what is meant by NaCl aqueous. That means with NaCl, there's water associated as well. With NaCl, there's water associated as well. Perfect? Right? So do remember this particular point from now onwards, my dear students. When ionic compound is in solid state, it behaves like the insulator. It behaves like the insulator. When it is in molten or aqueous state, Molten or aqueous state, it is going to behave, it is going to show conductance, right? It is going to behave like your conductor. Perfect. One more thing, dear students, these ionic compounds which we are talking about right now, they do not show any regular geometry. Have you heard ever that this ionic compound is trigonal bipyramidal? That this ionic compound is linear? This ionic compound is bent? No, that we see in covalent species, that we see in covalent compounds right? That we see in covalent compounds. In ionic compounds, the bonds are non-directional. The bonds are non-directional, right? The bonds are non-directional. Perfect, right? There is no regular geometry. We do not say ionic compound has got this shape, has got that shape. No, right? Geometry is not defined. Geometry is not defined for what? Geometry is not defined for the ionic compounds. This one more thing which you are going to remember from now onwards, right? Perfect. Someone is saying, what is the difference between this and this? Guys, it's simple. Over here, you have taken any seal solid, right? You are heating it up. You are heating it up. You are heating it up till it gets converted into liquid. Right? Till it gets converted into liquid. Perfect. What is meant by this? 
This is NaCl in liquid form. For example, this is the marker, right? It's in solid form. I'm heating it up. It will get converted into liquid, right? Perfect. It will get converted into liquid. Now, if I take some same NaCl, if I take same NaCl and I'm introducing it into water, I'm introducing it into water. Perfect, right? Then NaCl over here, I'll be writing as NaCl aqueous. There is water associated with this NaCl as well. So remove these points. It's simple. Perfect. Now, people. Now, people, there are few things which you need to know about their ionic compounds. Few things which you need to know about these ionic compounds. Number one, lattice energy. Lattice energy. How do we define the term lattice energy? Okay. How do we define the term lattice energy? <clears throat> Try to understand. This is important. Okay. Just a second. Just a second, people. Okay, lattice energy. If you look at its definition, the first definition about lattice energy. The amount of energy which is released when one mole of an ionic lattice is formed. The amount of energy which is released when one mole of an ionic lattice is formed from its constituent gaseous ions. What it means. First thing, do remember. Do remember. Whenever you see attractions between the species. Whenever you see attraction between the species, whenever you see attraction between the species, do remember, energy is released at that point of time. Do remember, energy is released at that point of time. And due to the release of energy, do remember, stability increases. Do remember, stability increases. Do remember stability increase. Now, if you look carefully, look carefully. Can I say in this particular reaction, one mole of ionic compound is getting formed? Absolutely. One mole of ionic compound is getting formed. From what? From what? From what? From its constituent gaseous ions. One mole of ionic compound is getting formed from its constituent gaseous ions. This is positive, this is negative. And it's forming any cell. So there will be attractions, there will be attractions. This Na positive would have attracted Cl negative, formed NaCl, there will be attractions. And due to attractions, what happens? Due to attractions, what happens? Energy is released, stability is increased, right? My dear students, look carefully. One mole of ionic compound is getting formed from its constituent gaseous ion. At that point of time, whatever energy will be released during this particular process, whatever energy will be released during this particular process, that amount of energy released is something which you'll be calling as lattice energy. Number one. Number one. So what is lattice energy? It is the amount of energy which is released when one mole of ionic compound gets formed from its constituent gaseous ions. Okay. Since energy is being released in this process and that particular process in which energy is being released, that's something which you call as exothermic one. So over here, I can say your process over here, it is exothermic. And if the process is exothermic, I'll say delta H lattice here. Delta H lattice here will be negative. This is one way of defining the lattice energy. This is one way of defining the lattice energy. Second way, second way. Second way or of defining the lattice energy, which I believe is more important. What is that? I'll say the amount of energy, the amount of energy which is required, the amount of energy which is required, to break the amount of energy which is required to break one mole of ionic lattice, one mole of ionic lattice into, into its constituent gaseous ions, into its constituent gaseous ions, into its constituent gaseous ions, what it means. Try to understand. My dear students, for example, you are taking any seal solid. You are taking NaCl solid. In your NaCl solid, you are taking one mole of NaCl solid. In your NaCl solid, you have got Na positives, Cl negatives, and there are attractions, electrostatic force of attraction. Now, if I ask you, if I ask you, in order to break this attraction, in order to break this attraction, in order to break this attraction in such a way 
this NaCl gets converted into Na positive gas plus Cl negative gas. In order to break this attraction, energy is required. Energy is required. And my dear students, let me tell you, the amount of energy which is required, the amount of energy which is required to break one mole of ionic lattice into its constituent gaseous ions, the amount of energy which is required to break one mole of ionic lattice into its constituent gaseous ions, that's also what you call as lattice energy. That's also what you call as lattice energy. In this particular case over here, is energy released or energy is absorbed? I said energy is required, energy is absorbed. And over here, I'll be calling this process endothermic. This will be endothermic here. This will be endothermic in nature, right? If it is endothermic, so for this process, I'll say delta H lattice will show positive sign. Over here, delta H lattice is negative. Over here, delta H is positive. See, magnitude wise, both will be same. Magnitude wise, both will be same. Perfect. But signs will be different. Signs will be different. If you are defining lattice energy in this way, right, the amount of energy released when one mole of ionic lattice is formed, at that point of time, delta H lattice is exothermic, right, delta H is negative, right. If you are defining it in this way, then delta H will be positive. Magnitude wise, both are going to be same. Perfect. Let me know once in the chats if it is clear. Let me know once in the chats if it is clear. Let me know once in the chats if it is clear. My dear students, lattice energy, it depends on two factors. Lattice energy, it depends on two factors. It is directly proportional to the charge on ions, inversely proportional to the size of ions. Directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size. Directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size. Directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size. Right? Directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size. Tell me the answer of this particular question quickly. Arrange in the order of increasing lattice energy. Quickly, people. Quickly, quickly. I don't want you guys to waste the time. Quickly. <clears throat> quickly. Done? See guys, first of all, LiCl, NaCl, KCl, RbCl. See, this is basically Li positive, Cl negative. Na positive, Cl negative. K positive, Cl negative. Rb positive, Cl negative. What is same here? Your anion is same everywhere. Your anion is same everywhere. So you are not going to decide on the base of anion. Because anion is same everywhere. Now decide on the base of cation. Cation is different here. Cation is different here. But, but, Charge on every cation is same. Charge on every cation is same. The magnitude of charge on every cation is same. My dear students, if the magnitude of charge on every cation is same, you are not going to decide on the base of charge of cation. You will be deciding on the base of size of cation. Right? And you know, lattice energy is inversely proportional to the size of ions. Right? More the size, lesser the lattice energy. Now, Li positive, Na positive, K positive, Li positive, Na positive, K positive, Rb positive, Cs positive. And moving from top to the bottom, the ionic size, the ionic size increases. If ionic size increases, size increases, lattice energy decreases. So this is going to be the order of lattice. As simple as that. 1, 2, 3, 4. Correct? Now people, MgO, NaCl, LiCl. Over here, if you look carefully, if you look carefully, this is Mg di positive, this is O di negative, Na positive, Cl negative, Li positive, Cl negative. First of all, first of all, first of all, try to understand. Do remember, do remember. I told you your lattice energy, I told you your lattice energy, it's directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size. Remember, always prioritize charge first, then prioritize your size. Always prioritize your charge first, then you'll be prioritizing your size. Right? So people, if you look, look carefully, where is the charge on the atoms more? 
charge his maximum here. So first we'll have maximum lattice energy, right? Plus two minus two, plus one minus one, plus one minus one. So charge over here is more. Now among these two, anion is same, cation is different. Charge on cation is same, but size of cation is different, right? Lesser the size of lesser the size, lesser the size, more the lattice energy, right? So Li positive has got lesser size than Na positive. So three will have more than two. I believe it's clear. If it is clear, say yes in the charts quickly. If it is clear, say yes in the charts quickly. <clears throat> so one, three, two is going to be the order. Absolutely right. <coughs> Perfect. Perfect, guys. Now, what is hydration energy? You would have discussed, you would have studied hydration energy as well. Okay. What is hydration energy? What is hydration energy? What is hydration energy? See guys, <clears throat> as, per, as per the definition, hydration energy, the amount of energy, the amount of energy which is released, the amount of energy which is released when one mole of a gaseous ion, when one mole of a gaseous ion undergoes hydration. What is meant by that? What is meant by that? Try to understand. My dear students, this is the container. This is the container. Imagine in this particular container, I have kept water. Imagine in this particular container, I have kept water. If I have kept water, since I believe all of you know about the structure of water, this is the structure of water. Among oxygen and hydrogen, which one is more electronegative? Oxygen. So it will carry delta negative. This will carry delta positive. Similarly, this carries delta negative. This carries delta positive. So can I say in water, oxygen is your negative end? It is your negative end. Hydrogen is your positive end. In your water molecule, there are two ends. Negative end, positive end. Negative end means oxygen. Positive end means hydrogen. Simple. Now, imagine that I am introducing one mole of Na positive gas. Imagine that I am introducing one mole of Na positive gas here. Imagine I am introducing one mole of Na positive gas here. One mole of Na positive gas here. Imagine that. Okay. What will happen when this one mole of Na positive will enter into this water? Can I say the negative end of water, the negative end of water, the negative end of water will show interaction with this positive ion. The negative end of water will show interaction with this positive ion. And whenever there are attractions, energy is released. Whenever there are attractions, energy is released. Right? So can I say during this particular process? First of all, when you are putting a gaseous ion here in water, in water. Water molecules are getting associated with this gaseous ion. Water molecules are getting associated this, with this gaseous ion. And this process overall is what you call as hydration. This is what you call as hydration, right? Your water molecules, they are getting associated with this Na positive, right? The process is called as hydration. During hydration, during hydration, what happens? Attractions are there, energy will be released. And that amount of energy which is released, that amount of energy which is released when one mole of a gaseous ion undergoes hydration. Okay? Clear? Clear people? Now, since energy is released during this process, since energy is released during this process, that particular process in which energy is released, you call that particular process exothermic. So, hydration is exothermic in nature. Hydration process is exothermic. Hydration process is exothermic. And if it is exothermic, so delta H value, will be negative. Delta H hydration will be negative. As per sign convention, you know it. <clears throat> Perfect. Perfect people. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. Right? Now, hydration energy. It is also directly proportional to charge. And it is also inversely proportional to size of the ions. Just two things you have to remember. Don't go into details why, etc, etc. Right? We don't have time for that. Remember hydration energy that's directly proportional to charge. Inversely proportional to size. As simple as that. As simple as that. Try to understand what exactly I'm going to say. Try to understand what exactly I'm going to say. My dear students, <clears throat> try to understand, okay? Let's say I'm writing Li positive, Na positive, A positive, Rb positive, 
TS positive, right? Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Down the group, down the group. Size, down the group. Size increases. Down the group, size increases. Down the group, size increases. If size increases, if size increases, if size increases, if size increases, what about hydration? What about hydration? Which one has got, which one has undergone maximum hydration? The one which has lesser size will have undergone, would have undergone more hydration. So, this is the order of hydration. This is the order of hydration. The one which has undergone maximum hydration, the one which has got undergone maximum hydration, with that one, more water molecules will be associated. So, quickly tell me, wherein, in which of the following case, more water molecules are associated, more water molecules are associated with Li positive, right? If I ask you about the hydration energy, more water molecules getting associated means more energy released. So, hydration energy order, Li positive maximum hydration, Na positive maximum hydration, K positive, max, uh, after K positive, Rb positive, and Cs positive, this is the hydration energy order. This is the hydration energy order, right? This is the order of hydration energy. Now, 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 tell me one thing. Which ion is undergoing maximum hydration? Li positive. So with Li positive, towards Li positive, more water molecules are associated. Right? If I write something like this, Li positive to aqueous. If I write Na positive to aqueous. If I write K positive to aqueous. If I write Rb positive to aqueous. If I write Cs positive to aqueous. What is meant by them? It, is, it means that with Li positive, water molecules are associated. With Na positive, water molecules are associated. With K positive, water molecules are associated. Where are more water molecules associated? More water molecules are associated here. More the water molecules associated. Can I say more will be the hydrated size? Hydrated size means Li positive plus the water molecules which are associated. Where will be the hydrated size more? Tell me the hydrated size order. Since Li positive have undergone maximum hydration, right? So maximum hydrated size here. Maximum hydrated size. Maximum hydrated size. So if hydrated size is more here, can I say Li positive aqueous is maximum bulky? It is maximum bulky among all. Right? If hydrated size here is maximum. So Li positive aqueous among all these aqueous signs, it is bulky. Li positive is the most bulky over here. If it is bulky, what about the speed of moving? Will its speed be more or less? Will it be moving with more speed or less speed? This will be moving with less speed. Less speed. Less speed means less ionic mobility. Less speed means less ionic mobility. So if I ask you, what is the order of the ionic mobility of these hydrated ions? Tell me the order. Tell me the order quickly. Tell me the order quickly. Tell me the order quickly. Which, where, where do you see? Ionic mobility the least. Here it will be the least, right? This is the order of the mobility, right? Lesser the mobility, lesser the mobility, lesser the conductivity. Lesser the ionic mobility, lesser the conductivity. Lesser the conductivity, right? So give me the conductivity order as well. Can I say same is going to be the, see, this is the mobility order. This is the mobility order as well as conductivity order. Lesser the mobility, lesser the conductivity. Yes. Say in the charts quickly. If I'm clear to everyone, quickly, quickly, quickly. Quickly, people. Let me know in the chats if it's clear. <clears throat> I believe all these things are absolutely clear. I believe all these things are absolutely clear. I believe all these things are absolutely clear. Okay? I believe all these things are absolutely clear. Okay? Perfect, guys. Now, let's talk about the solubility of these ionic compounds. Let's talk about the solubility of these ionic compounds. Okay? Let's talk about, I hope all the things are clear together. Guys, you have to be very active in the chats. Let me know in the chats. Let me know in the chats. Mm. Everything clear?
perfect 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 solubility of ionic compounds when you hear the word solubility of ionic compounds there are two things which strikes my mind what are those two things what are those two things try to understand and yes students imagine this is the container in this container what is there there is water imagine there is water present imagine there is water present inside this container for example you are introducing nacl here you are introducing nacl here nacl perfect but yes students there are two things which happen when you introduce nacl here in this solvent there are two things which are going to happen number 1 when you put nacl into water when you put nacl into water since this na positive this cl negative there is force of attraction there is force of attraction when you put nacl into water this force of attraction breaks down this force of attraction breaks down force of attraction you are breaking down which thing is coming into your mind lattice energy is coming into my mind lattice energy is coming into my mind right so first the ionic compound which you are introducing in water first what happened what is going to happen the force of attraction is going to get break, broken down once the force of attraction is broken down that with that which factor comes into my mind lattice energy now once the force of attraction is broken down then you have got na positive and cl negative here right they are separated now they are separated now towards this na positive towards this na positive the negative end of water the negative end of water is going to attract perfect it's going to attract and towards the cl negative positive end of water is going to interact and whenever there is an attraction energy is released what do i call this energy as hydration energy so two factors are coming into my mind one lattice energy second hydration energy they are going to be the ones the hydration energy and lattice energy these two are the factors which play a vital role when you talk about the solubility of ionic compounds okay when you talk about the solubility of ionic compounds yeah right right people perfect <clears throat> now guys understand and remember the first thing the first thing that solvent that solvent that solvent which has got more dielectric constant that solvent which has got more dielectric constant in that solvent ionic compounds are more soluble now you must be thinking first of all what is meant by dielectric constant of solvent what is dielectric constant of solvent let me tell you dielectric constant of a solvent dielectric constant of the solvent what kind of information it gives me my dear students dielectric constant of the solvent gives me the information about it gives me the information about the tendency of solvent it gives me the information about the tendency of solvent to weaken to weaken the force of attraction between the ions to weaken the force of attraction between the ions more the dielectric constant of the solvent more is the dielectric constant of the solvent more is going to be its tendency to break this force of attraction and more the tendency of the solvent to break the force of attraction can i say more will be the solubility is it simple right perfect solubility of an ionic compound it depends on what it depends on dielectric constant of solvent more the dielectric constant of the solvent more is the tendency of the solvent to weaken the force of attraction more will be the solubility right number 1 you know why do you call water as the universal solvent you know why do you call the water as the universal solvent why because water has got the maximum dielectric constant it has got a large value of dielectric constant so water has maximum tendency to weaken the force of attraction between the ions of the ionic compound that is the reason why your ionic compounds are soluble in water okay perfect 
Now people, as I told you already, when you talk about solubility of an ionic compound in the polar solvent, two factors come into my mind. One is lattice energy, one is hydration energy. Lattice energy, energy is required to break. Hydration energy, energy is released, right? Now, I'm going to write few statements. Number one, solubility of ionic compound. It is directly proportional to, it is directly proportional to, or it is inversely proportional to lattice energy, more the lattice energy of the ionic compound, lesser than solubility, and it's directly proportional to hydration energy. It is directly proportional to hydration energy. So these are the two factors which play a role when we talk about the solubility of ionic compound. Okay? More the lattice energy, lesser the solubility. More the hydration energy, more the solubility. So these are the two factors which combinedly play a role when you talk about solubility of the ionic compound. Okay? Now guys, I remember one thing. If, 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 if lattice energy is more than hydration energy, if lattice energy is more than hydration energy, lattice energy is endothermic, hydration energy is exothermic. Tell me the overall process of dissolution. Is dissolution going to be endothermic? Overall dissolution process, is it going to be endothermic or exothermic? Quick. If lattice energy is greater than hydration energy, the dissolution is? The dissolution is endothermic. The dissolution is endothermic. The overall dissolution is endothermic. Overall dissolution is endothermic, right? The overall dissolution is endothermic. Okay? Right? Can I say the compound? The compound, the compound is, is partially soluble? Can I say something like that? The compound is partially soluble? Say yes or no in the chats, everyone. Or I'll say in simple words, the compound is less soluble. Perfect. Second, second, if, if hydration energy is greater than lattice energy, tell me about the overall dissolution process. Is the process of dissolution endothermic or exothermic? It is exothermic. And I'll say in this particular case, the compound is completely soluble. I hope this particular point is absolutely clear to everyone. Okay? I hope this particular point is absolutely clear to everyone. Now, this was all about ionic compounds which you need to know. This was all about ionic compounds which you need to know. Okay? Just remember the criteria when the ionic compound is more soluble, less soluble. Right? Remember that criteria, people. Okay? Both the factors. Both the factors. One is your... Lattice energy, one is your hydration energy. Both the factors are going to play the role when you talk about solubility of ionic compounds in a polar solvent. Okay, now, now, what are covalent compounds? Yeah, this is something very important. Now we are going to talk about the covalent compound. Basically, your complete class 11th organic inorganic chemistry that is based on covalent compound, majority. Okay, majority. So remember it. How do we define the covalent compounds? What are covalent compounds? My dear students, the first theory which we are going to analyze, that is Lewis Langmuir concept. Lewis Langmuir concept. This is something which you have been studying from your class 8. The bond formed, the bond formed between the two atoms by the mutual sharing of electrons. The bond formed between the two atoms by the mutual sharing of electrons. By the mutual sharing of electrons, by the mutual sharing of electrons, so as to complete their octet or duplet, so as to complete their octet or duplet, point number one. Point number two, the number of electrons, the number of electrons contributed by each atom is known as, is known as covalency. What is meant by these points? It's very simple. My dear students, for example, I have got a fluorine atom. This is one more fluorine atom, right? Two fluorine atoms I took. Tell me, how many valence electrons fluorine has? It has got seven valence electrons. How many valence electrons this fluorine has? It has got again seven valence electrons. 
in order to complete its octet it needs one electron it also needs one electron so what they are going to do what they are going to do this was your fluorine atom this is your one more fluorine atom perfect right this needs one electron to complete the octet even this needs one electron so what is going to happen they are going to mutually share electron right how exactly let's say this is fluorine this is fluorine 2 4 6 2 4 6 and one i'm keeping at the middle one i'm keeping at the middle right this pair of electron this i'm calling as the bonded pair of electron this i'm calling as the bonded pair this particular or this one or this one or this one or this one this is what i'll be calling as non bonding electron pair non bonding pair or you'll be calling it as a lone pair or you'll be calling it as a lone pair non bonding electron pair or you'll be calling it as a lone pair perfect so basically what happens what is happening here mutual sharing of electrons is happening mutual sharing of electrons is happening just to complete their octet or duplet right tell me how many electrons this fluorine contributed it contributed one electron this one also contributed one electron for the sharing right and the number of electrons contributed by each atom that defines its covalency right so covalence of this is one covalence of this is one and remember Whenever, whenever each atom contributes one one electron, a single bond gets formed. A single bond gets formed. Whenever each atom contributes one one electron, a single bond gets formed. Very simple and basic. Very simple and basic. For example, this oxygen, this oxygen, two, four, and six. Six valence electrons. Two, four, and six. Six valence electrons. So both of them would need two electrons to complete the octet. Both of them would need two electrons to complete the octet. Now, how, what are they going to do? They are going to mutually share some electron pairs. This oxygen, this oxygen, two, four, six, right? And eight, two, four, six, and eight. This electron pair, the one which I've kept at the middle, it is mutually shared by both. This I'm calling as bonded pair, bonded pair. And all these are what I'll be calling as lone pairs. Each oxygen atom is contributing two electrons, right? So covalency of each is two. And when, when, when each atom contributes two electrons, which bond gets formed? A double bond gets formed. Correct? Correct, people? Correct? Okay, now similarly, nitrogen, let's say this one more nitrogen. How many valence electrons nitrogen has? Five, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. What they are going to do? They are again going to follow the same thing. They are again going to follow the same thing. Perfect. And these are the three bonded pair of electrons, lone pair of electrons. And covalence here is three. And a triple bond gets formed. I hope this is clear to everyone. I hope this is clear to everyone. Okay. So the point is why this is happening? Why this is happening people? Why this is happening? Just to complete their octets. Or duplets. Duplet in case of HF. Over here hydrogen. It has got only one electron. Chlorine has got seven valence electrons. Right. So it would want to complete its duplet. It would want to complete its octet, right? So just as to complete their octets or duplets, this happens as per Lewis theory is concerned. Now, this is not the case which is important. The point is, the point is, how do you draw the Lewis structures? How do you draw the structures of simple civil molecules? And how do we identify the charges? Okay? Right? Now, guys, understand. Now, guys, understand. Now, guys, understand. Now, whatever I'm going to teach you now, that's important, okay? Over here, I've taken CO, carbon monoxide. I want to draw its structure. I want to draw its structure. I want to draw its Lewis structure. I want to draw its Lewis structure. If you talk about carbon, how many valence electrons are there with carbon? Tell me that. How many valence electrons are there with carbon? Carbon has got four valence electrons. Oxygen has got... Six valence electrons. So in total, how many valence electrons are there? 
there are five valence electrons. Understand? There are five valence electrons, right? If, sorry, there are 10 valence electrons. If there are 10 valence electrons, if I ask you, how many valence electron pairs do we have? We have got five valence electron pairs. One pair is equal to two electrons, right? So we have got five valence electron pairs. Five valence electron pairs. Now people, this is carbon over here. This is oxygen over here. Perfect. First thing, do one thing, put a single bond. Put a single bond. A single bond is made up of one electron pair. One electron pair. Right? One electron pair. How many electron pairs we had? Five. Out of five, how many have used? Have used one electron pair. Have used one electron pair. So how many electron pairs are left? Four. Right? Now, now go to the more electronegative element. Which one is more electronegative element? Oxygen. Try filling its octet. Two, four, six, and eight. Done. Okay, how many valence electron pairs we had? Five out of five. How many we have used? One, two, three, four. Right. So one electron pair is left. That one electron pair keep here. Keep here. So I have utilized all the five valence electron pairs. Now the point is, no doubt, octet of oxygen is complete. What about octet of carbon? Is the octet of carbon complete? Octet of carbon is not complete. Octet of carbon is not complete. Check it out. Two. Four. It is not complete yet. So what am I going to do? Understand. What am I going to do? I'll remove one lone pair from here. And instead of that, put a bond. Perfect. I'll remove one more lone pair here. Instead of that, put a bond. Right. Now check the octets of both atoms. Now check the octets of both atoms. Carbon. Two, four, six, eight. Oxygen. Two, four, six, eight. Octet of both of them is complete. Octet of both of them is complete. Right? Now if I ask you. Is there any charge on carbon or any charge of, on oxygen? How do I check that? How do I check that? So basically, I am talking about the formal charge on carbon. Is there any charge on carbon in this particular compound? How do you check it? Tell me in the normal non-bonded state, non-bonded state, imagine carbon has not formed any bond. How many valence electrons carbon will have? Four valence, valence electrons. In non-bonded state, carbon will have four valence electrons. Right now, in this particular compound, how many it has? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? But, but I'll be considering only one here, one here and one here. I won't be considering, I won't be considering all the six over here to calculate the formal charge. I'll be considering only one, one, one. So three plus two, five. Four minus five is equal to minus one. There is basically minus one charge on carbon. Okay. Now, formal charge on oxygen. Formal charge on oxygen in non-bonded state. Six. In non-bonded state, oxygen has got six valence electrons. Now, in the bonded state, one, two. 3, 4, 5. 6 minus 5 is plus 1. So this oxygen has got plus 1 charge. Right? Clear? This is how you calculate formal charge as well. I believe I'm clear. I believe I'm clear to everyone. <clears throat> I believe I'm clear to everyone. Yes? Let's take a few more cases so that you'll understand it properly. NO2 negative. NO2 negative. Look carefully. NO2 negative. How many valence electrons nitrogen has? Nitrogen has got 5 valence electrons. Oxygen has got 6 valence electrons multiplied by 2. Right? There is a negative charge. Negative charge means plus 1. Edit. Edit. Right? Now, how much it comes? 12, 13, 18. So, there are 18 valence electrons. 18 valence electrons means how many valence electron pairs? Nine valence electron pairs. Nine valence electron pairs. Now, first of all, it's a triatomic species. It's a triatomic species. Tell me one thing. Which one is less electronegative among nitrogen and oxygen? Nitrogen is less electronegative. The one which is less electronegative, I'll keep as a central atom. So this nitrogen, which I'm keeping as a central atom, and this oxygen, this oxygen. Correct? The one which is the less electronegative one. 
right? That I'm keeping as a central atom. Take a note of it. Less electronegative element will be your central atom, right? If there is hydrogen or fluorine, if there will be hydrogen or fluorine in the compound, always keep them as the terminal atoms. Always keep them as the terminal atoms. Always keep them as the terminal atoms, right? Now people think carefully. Nine electron pairs, right? Put a single bond here, put a single bond here. So out of nine, how many I have used? One, two. Two I have used, right? Two I have used. So I'm left with seven. Now which one is more electronegative? Oxygen, right? Try filling the octet of oxygen. Two, four, six, eight. Done. Two, four, six, eight. Done. Right? How many I had? Nine. Out of nine, how many I've used? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One is left. So this is nine. Right? Octet of this oxygen is complete. Octet of this oxygen is complete. Is the octet of nitrogen complete? Octet of nitrogen is not complete. Two, four, six. Only six. How many it needs? Eight. So what's going to happen? From any of these two oxygens, remove one lone pair. Instead of that, instead of that, what you need to do? Put a bond here. Put a bond here. Now check the octet of all the atoms. Octet of all the atoms is complete. It is complete now. Okay. Now, time for the formal charge calculation. Calling this atom 1, calling this atom 2, calling this atom 3. So if I ask you what is the formal charge of atom 1? What is the formal charge of atom 1? Quickly. Formal charge. In non-bonded state, oxygen has got 6 valence electrons. Right now, it has got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Right? So 6 minus 6 is 0. Formal charge on second atom. Second atom. In non-bonded state, in non-bonded state, oxygen has got 6. Minus. In bonded state, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 1 more 7. So 6 minus 7 is equal to minus 1. Right? Formal charge of third is equal to. Is equal. In non-bonded state, 5. And right now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5 minus 5 is 0. So this is the formal charge calculation as well. Done? One more example and I'm moving ahead. One more example and I'm moving ahead. Okay? Talk about O3. Talk about O3. Do all these things for O3 as well, quickly. Do all these things for O3 as well, quickly, quickly, quickly. All these things quickly. <clears throat> Done? See guys, we have got O3, one oxygen has got 6 valence electrons, so 6 multiplied by 3 is 80, so there are 18 valence electrons, that means how many valence electron pairs? We have got nine valence electron pairs. Now there are three oxygen atoms, right? So calling this oxygen one, second, and third, right? Both are all the three are same. Okay. Now what is the first thing which I'll be doing? Put a single bond. Put a single bond everywhere. Done and dusted. Put a single bond everywhere. Okay. Put a single bond everywhere. Right? Put a single bond everywhere. Now people, out of nine valence electron pairs, how many have used two? So try filling the octet. Two, four, six. 8, 2, 4, 6, 8, right? How many I had? 9. Out of 9, how many I have used? 3, 6, 7, 8. And this 9. Okay, and this is 9. Octet of the terminal oxygen is complete. Octet of the terminal octet, octet of the terminal atom is complete. Okay, but what about the octet of the central atom? 2, 4, 6, only 6. Now it is your choice. Take this electron pair out and instead of that, what do you need to do? Put a bond here. Check the octet now. Octet of every oxygen atom over here is complete. Octet of every oxygen atom is complete. Oxygen 1, oxygen 2, oxygen 3. Three atoms. So, first thing. Formal charge of first atom is equal. Formal charge of first atom is equal. Formal charge of first atom. In non-bonded state, oxygen has got six valence electrons. Right now it has got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So 6 minus 7 is equal to minus 1. Formal charge of second is equal. Formal charge of second is equal. Non-bonded state 6 minus right now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 
तो सिक्स माइनस फाइव इज इक्वल टू प्लस वन फॉर्मल चार्ज ऑन थर्ड इज इक्वल टू सिक्स माइनस वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव सिक्स सिक्स माइनस सिक्स इज इक्वल टू जीरो तो दीज आर द फॉर्मल चार्ज ऑन ऑल दीज आइटम्स आई बिलीव आई एम परफेक्टली क्लियर टू एवरी वन राइट एंड गाइज वन मोर थिंग on 7th of april there is one mega event which is going to happen in bangalore from an academy side right and that event will be live streamlined on one channel which you all must be knowing an academy spotlight channel is there right we all will be there in that particular event which will be live from bangalore which will be telecast on that particular channel do join that as well right perfect that's going to be super beneficial for all the neat aspirants Yeah, do join that. We all will be there together. All the unacademy teachers who you see on different channels of YouTube, we all are going to be together in that particular. Yeah. <clears throat> Suddenly, it struck my mind, so I thought to share with you. Right. <clears throat> Perfect. Now, people, have you heard about Fajan's rule? From this, you'll get a short, short question. Short, short question. Short, short question. Pajan's rules. Pajan's rules. Have you studied them ever? Have you studied them ever? I'll Santosh. I'll let you know about the venue in the Telegram. Okay. Perfect. Have you studied about Fajan's rules? My dear students, from Fajan's rules, you get a short, short question. Okay, from Fajan's rules, you get a short, short question. Now let's get into the details of Fajan's rules, but only those details which are required. Crack a question, not detailing or something. Understand and remember directly. Understand and remember directly. My dear students. You know, there is no bond. There is no bond. There is no bond which is hundred percent ionic or covalent. There is no bond which you can say directly it is hundred percent ionic or hundred percent covalent. Every covalent bond has got some ionic character. Every covalent bond has got some ionic character, and every ionic bond has got some covalent character. Every ionic bond has got the covalent character. Every covalent bond has got some ionic character as well, right? And this Fajan's rules, this Fajan's rules, this Fajan's rules, this Fajan's rules. With the help of Fajan's rules, what we are going to do? We are going to compare. We are going to compare covalent characters in ionic bonds. we are going to compare covalent characters in ionic bonds in short with the help of fajan's rules we are going to compare we are going to compare covalent character in ionic bonds which are going to compare covalent character and ionic bonds in ionic bonds now two simple statements and we are done covalent character in an ionic bond depends on two factors depends on two factors one is called as polarizing power of cation polarizing power of cation and and it is directly proportional to polarizability which is the term defined for anion which is the term defined for anion let me tell you covalent character in an ionic bond it depends on two factors number one polarizing power of cation polarizing power is the term which is defined for the cation polarizability is the term which is defined for anion now here few things and we are done see if i talk about polarizing power of the cation it is directly proportional to charge on cation inversely proportional to size of cation okay similarly polarizability polarizability it is defined for what it is defined for anion and it is directly proportional to the charge on anion it is directly proportional to charge on anion and and it is directly proportional to 
size of anion as well. Only these things you need to remember. So basically, 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 covalent character in an ionic bond, it depends on two factors. One, one is your polarizing power, which is defined for cation. Second is polarizability, which is defined for anion. Polarizing power of cation depends on two factors, charge and size. Polarizability also depends on two, two factors, charge and size. Charge and size, but directly proportional in both. Okay, and remember, covalent character, it is inversely proportional to ionic character. So once you get the covalent character order, you can get the ionic character order as well. Right? Few examples and we are done. Few examples and we are done. Arrange the following on the basis of polarizing power. Arrange the following on the basis of polarizing power. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Arrange the following on the basis of polarizing power. Quickly. Li positive, Be positive. Polarizing power of cation depends on two factors, charge and size. Prioritize size, ch charge first. Right? 2, 1. Polarizing power, more the charge, more polarizing power. More polarizing power, more polarizing power, more polarizing power. We, what is the reason? Reason is the charge. More the charge on cation, more the polarizing power of cation. Okay? Li positive, Na positive, K positive, Rb positive, Cs positive. Charge everywhere is same. But size of these cations is different. Lesser the size, more the polarizing power. Lesser the size, more the polarizing power of the cation. Right? B positive, Mg positive, calcium positive, strontium positive, barium positive. Down the group, ionic size increases. Right? Lesser the size, more the polarizing power. 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 Am I done? Lesser the size, more the polarizing power. Is that clear? Lesser the size, more the polarizing power. Are these two questions done and dusted? So people, as you know, your polarizing power, directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size, right? And we are done. We are done. Okay. Remember the polarizing power of the cation. It is also called as ionic potential. It is also called as ionic potential. Sometimes they might ask you a question. Not in terms of polarizing power directly, in terms of ionic potential. In terms of ionic potential, right? And your polarizing power, it also depends on the effective nuclear charge in case of the D block elements. More the effective nuclear charge, more the polarizing power. More the effective nuclear charge, more the polarizing power. In case of what? In case of D block elements. In case of D block elements. In case of D block elements. Now, Fe di positive, these are all D block. Fe di positive, CO di positive, Na di positive, CO di positive. Quickly. Polarizing power, it depends, also depends on effective nuclear charge in case of D block elements. Tell me which one has got more polarizing power. Where the effective nuclear charge is more. Right? Effective nuclear charge is more. Which one has got more effective nuclear charge? It's copper dipositive. So copper dipositive will have maximum polarizing power. Since it has D6 configuration, D7, D8, D9. Perfect. And in case of D block elements, generally on moving from left to right, what happens to the effective nuclear charge? Effective nuclear charge increases, therefore, polarizing power is going to be maximum for CO dipositive. Right? Particularly in case of what? In case of D block elements. In case of D block elements. Do remember one more thing. On moving from 3D to 4D to 5D, 3D series to 4D, 5D series to 5D series, right? Effective nuclear charge increases, hence polarizing power also increases. 3D, 4D, 5D. Effective nuclear charge down the group increases, right? So polarizing power of cations increases. Now, if I ask you which one has got more polarizing power, this is the 3D element, this is the 4D element, this is the 5D element, 5D will have more polarizing power, done and dusted. It has got more polarizing power, done and dusted. Right? It has got more polarizing power, done and dusted. Now, if you talk about the polarizability, which is defined for anion, which is defined for anion, which is defined for anion. You know, as I told you, polarizability, it is directly proportional to charge. It is directly proportional to size of anion as well. Okay? Polarizability. Polarizability of anion is directly proportional to charge on anion. And at the same time, it is directly proportional to size of an ion. It is directly proportional to size of an ion. Right? 
इट इज डायरेक्टली प्रपोर्शनल टू साइज ऑफ एन आइंड या इट इज डायरेक्टली प्रपोर्शनल टू साइज ऑफ एन आइंड टेल मी द ऑर्डर क्विकली Quickly, guys. N tri negative O di negative F negative. More the charge, more the polarizability of an ion. Okay. P tri negative S di negative Cl negative. More the charge, more the polarizability. Right. More the polarizability. Done. More the polarizability. F negative Cl negative Br negative I negative. Charge on every an ion is same. Talk about size. Polarizability. is directly proportional to size as well more the size of an ion more the polarizability more the size of an ion more the polarizability more the size of an ion more the polarizability done done people okay now here are the questions here are the questions here are the questions which are asked here are the questions zncl2 cdcl2 HgCl2. Arrange them on the basis of covalent character. You know covalent character. It is directly proportional to polarizing power of cation, and it's inversely proportional. To, sorry, it is. It is directly proportional to polarizability of anion as well, right? And you know your polarizing power of cation. Directly proportional to charge of cation. Inversely proportional to size of cation. Polarizability is directly proportional to charge on an ion, directly proportional to size of an ion as well. Think carefully now. Think carefully. Think carefully, people. Ah, uh, guys, just give me a second. I'll be back. Okay, just give me a second. Where did I keep the mic? Okay, are you done with this? Are you done with this? My dear students, if you look carefully, this is ZN di positive, this is cadmium di positive, this is Hg di positive, right? Cl negative, N and everywhere is same. So leave the N and S side. Look at the cation. Look at the cation, people. This is your 3D. This is 4D element. This is 5D. 3D to 4D, 4D to 5D. What happens? Effective nuclear charge increases. Effective nuclear charge increases. Polarizing power increases. Polarizing power increases. Covalent character increases. So this is the order of covalent, right? Look at the next one. Zinc di positive, cadmium di positive, Hg di positive. N ion everywhere is same. N ion everywhere is same, right? This is 3D. This is 4D. This is 5D, right? Perfect. This is the order. Done. Look at the next one. Li positive, Na positive, K positive, Rb positive, Cs positive, N ion. Leave the N ion aside. N ion is everywhere same, right? Look at the cations now. For cations, what do we define? Polarizing power, and polarizing power of cation. Directly proportional to charge, inversely proportional to size. Charge on every cation is same. Now size. Lesser the size, more the polarizing power. Lesser the size, more the polarizing power. More the polarizing power of the cation, more the covalent character. Done. Okay. Look at the next one. Look at the next one, guys. Look at the next one. This is this is BE here. Okay. This is BE. Perfect. So BE di positive F negative. BE di positive Cl negative. BE di positive Br negative. BE di positive I negative. So ket ion everywhere here is same. Ket ion everywhere here is same. Ket ion everywhere here is same. Ket ion everywhere here is here is same. Okay, look at the N ion. N ion is different. For N ions, what do we define? Polarizability. Polarizability. 
charge on every anion is same. Talk about size. More the size of anion. More the size of anion. More the polarizability of anion. More the size of anion. More the size of anion. More the polarizability of anion. And more the polarizability of anion. More is going to be the covalent character. These are the covalent character order. This is the covalent character order. If you reverse these orders, you get the ionic character order. Right? If you reverse all these orders, you get the ionic character order. Okay. Few more questions. Tell me the answer here. F negative, Cl negative, A, Br negative, I negative. More the size of anion, more the polarizability, and more the covalent character. This is F negative, Cl negative, again the same. Right? F negative, Cl negative, Br negative, I negative, again the same. Again, here the same. Perfect. <coughs> Perfect, guys. Remember this particular point as well. This is important. Polarizing power, polarizing power of the pseudo inert gas configuration is greater than that of, is greater than that of polarizing power of the inert gas configuration. That means if you will be having two cations, if you will be having two cations, one having inert gas configuration, one having inert gas configuration, like Na positive, talk about Na positive, talk about Na positive. Right? What is the configuration of sodium basically? What is the configuration of sodium? I'll write neon, then 3s1. But this is Na positive, so take one electron out. If you take one electron out, this is 3s0. Perfect. So Na positive has got noble gas configuration. Na positive has got noble gas configuration. But if I talk about Cu positive, Cu positive, what is the configuration of Cu? I'll write argon, 3d10. Or is one, but this is CU positive. Take one electron out. If I take this electron out, if I take this electron out, this particular configuration, noble gas with D10 configuration, noble gas with D10 configuration, this is called as pseudo noble gas configuration. This is called as pseudo noble gas configuration. That cation which has got pseudo noble gas configuration will have more polarizing power. More polarizing power means more covalent character. Why I told you this one? Because you have to solve this question. Tell me the answer of this one now, quick. Quick, we will quick, people. Quickly, guys, quickly, quickly, everyone. Cu positive, Na positive. Cu positive has got pseudo noble gas configuration. Na positive has got noble gas configuration. Polarizing power here is more. The covalent character is more. Done. There are some applications of this Fajan's rules as well. Some application of Fajan's rules as well. My dear students, Ag2S is less soluble than Ag2O. Remember the solubility is directly proportional to ionic character. Inversely proportional to covalent character. I remember this particular statement directly over here. Now, now, now. Talk about your AG2S. Talk about their AG2S and AG2O. Give their solubility order. Give their solubility order. Right? Solubility order will be decided by the ionic character or covalent character. Understand one thing. This is AG positive. This is S di negative. AG positive. O di negative. AG positive here is same. So leave that aside. S di negative or O di negative. Charge is same. But look at the size. Size of S di negative is more. Right? This oxygen, this sulfur. Perfect. Down the group, size increases. Oxygen of, I mean, size of S di negative is more. Right? More the size. More polarizability. Right? More covalent character. This is the covalent character order. If this is the covalent character order. If this is the covalent character order. Give me the order of ionic character. This is the order of ionic character. Whatever is going to be the ionic character order, same is going to be solubility. So, same is the order of solubility. So, Ag2S, it is less soluble than Ag2O. Correct? That is what I had written over here. That's what I had written over here. Simple, simple, simple stuff. Right? Number one. Number two. Number two. Number two. 
if you compare the solubility of FeOH whole thrice with FeOH whole twice, right? This is Fe tri positive air, this Fe di positive air. Where is the polarizing power more? Polarizing power is more here. This session is for NEED 2024, yes. Okay. So polarizing power is more, covalent character is more. If this is the order of covalent character, what will be the order of ionic character? Ionic character order will be this, right? What will be the order of solubility? Oh, same ionic character order. Done? I hope I'm clear. Number one, melting point order. Melting point order. Do remember melting point of? Melting point of. Ionic compounds is generally more than that of melting point of covalent compounds. Melting point of ionic compounds is, direct, is greater than that of, is generally greater than that of melting point of covalent compounds. And remember one thing, remember one thing, which you already do now. Melting point, I can say, is directly proportional to ionic character, or I can say it is inversely proportional to covalent character. Is inversely proportional to covalent character. Now you have got, for example, BeCl2, right? MgCl2, CaCl2, magnesium calcium, strong, magnesium calcium, sorry, barely magnesium calcium, strontium, BaCl2, right? If I ask you, if I ask you, what is the order of melting point? What is the order of melting point? Down the group, tell me the order of covalent character. Size of cation is increasing, size of cation is increasing, covalent character is decreasing. If covalent character decreases, that means ionic character increases. If ionic character increases down the group, that means their melting points will increase down the group. So BaCl2 will have maximum boiling point. BaCl2 will have maximum boiling point, right? BeCl2 will have least boiling point. Am I clear? I mean, if you talk about the melting point, I'm giving the melting point order. Similarly, similarly, you can talk in terms of thermal stability as well. Remember, ionic compounds have got more thermal stability than Covalent compounds, then covalent compounds. Ionic compounds have got more thermal stability than covalent compounds. Then covalent compounds. Ionic compounds have got more thermal stability than what? Then covalent compounds. Right? Or in short, you can say thermal stability is directly proportional to ionic character, inversely proportional to covalent character. Inversely proportional to covalent character. Inversely proportional to covalent character. Now, for example, you have got Li2CO3. Right? Perfect. You have got Na2CO3. You have got K2CO3. You have got Rb2CO3. Perfect. You have got Rb2CO3. If you look at them carefully, down the group, and N is same. Look at the cation. Size of cation is increasing. If size of cation is increasing, if size of cation is increasing, then what's happening basically? If size of cation is increasing, polarizing power of cation is decreasing. Polarizing power is decreasing down the group. Polarizing power decreasing, covalent character decreasing. Right? Covalent character decreasing, that means ionic character increasing. So down the group, ionic character increases. And if ionic character increases, that means your thermal, thermal stability will increase. Your thermal stability will increase, right? So down the group, thermal stability of these one, they increase. It increases. I hope I am clear to everyone. Yeah, I hope I am clear to everyone. Perfect, guys. Now, one more short, short question. One more short, short question from one more topic that is dipole moment. But before discussing dipole moment with you, can you quickly let me know whatever things I discussed with you till now? All the things are clear? Are all the things clear? There are some electricity issues. I hope this is fine, yeah? 
I hope it's fine now. Quickly, people in the chats. Quickly in the chats. Are all the things clear? I want every one of you to say it. I want every one of you to say it quickly. Perfect. Talking about the dipole moment now. From this, again I'm saying, a short, short question is asked. Bond parameters, everything will be done. Relax. Everything, everything will be discussing. Okay? Perfect. Perfect, guys. So, let's talk about dipole moment. So, first of all, what is a dipole? What is a dipole? Whenever you have got two equal and oppositely charged species, two equal and oppositely charged species separated by certain distance. Whenever you have two equal and oppositely charged species separated by certain distance, the system of charges over here is what you call as dipole. The system of charges over here you'll be calling as dipole. To equal and oppositely charged species separated by certain distance, you call the system of charges as dipole. And for the dipole, what do we calculate? For the dipole, we calculate its moment. We calculate the dipole moment. We calculate the dipole moment. Dipole moment, which is represented by mu which is defined as charge multiplied by distance. And this dipole moment, let me tell you, it is a vector quantity. And if it is a vector quantity, it will be having the direction as well. And the direction of the dipole moment is taken from less electronegative element to more electronegative element. More electronegative element. Or in general, you can say it is taken from positive to negative in chemistry positive to negative in chemistry or i can say one more thing i can say one more thing i can say one more thing lone pair also contributes lone pair also contributes to the dipole moment and the direction of dipole moment direction of dipole moment due to lone pair is towards the lone pair is towards the lone pair what is meant by that? For example, this atom A, it has got the lone pair like this. Perfect. So the lone pair also contributes to the dipole moment, right? It's the, the moment due to this lone pair. It is direction is towards the lone pair. Remember this particular point as well. Remember this particular point as well. Again, whenever you have got a system of equal and opposite charges separated by certain distance, you call the system of charges dipole. For the dipole, we define its moment. Dipole moment, which is the product of charge multiplied by distance. This dipole moment is a vector quantity. Its direction is from less electronegative to more electronegative element. Positive to negative. Lone pair also contributes towards the dipole moment. And its direction is from positive to... I mean, its, its, its direction is always towards the lone pair. Simple. Simple. Okay? One more point. One more point, people. That particular molecule wherein... The net dipole moment is zero. That particular molecule wherein the net dipole moment is zero, you call that molecule as a non-polar molecule. Non-polar molecule, right? Net dipole moment non-zero, you call that particular molecule as the polar molecule. You call that molecule as the polar molecule. If the net dipole moment is zero in a molecule, non-polar. Net dipole moment non-zero. Polar molecule. Okay, polar molecule. For example, you have got HF, HF, HF. Okay, fluorine is more electronegative, so it will attract the bonded pair towards itself. So delta negative, delta positive, delta negative, delta positive. Right? So if this is positive, this is negative. Can I say this molecule is behaving like a dipole? Positive and negative charge separated by certain distance. It is a dipole now. Right? For the dipole, we define a moment. And dipole moment is from positive to negative. Dipole moment is from positive to negative. Dipole moment is from positive to negative. Right? So this molecule has got some dipole moment. If it has got some dipole moment, it is definitely a polar molecule. It is definitely a polar molecule. 
let's say you have got carbon dioxide you have got carbon dioxide due to this particular bond this is negative this is positive right negative positive similarly this will be negative this will be positive so moment in this direction moment in this direction positive negative positive negatives they'll cancel out if they cancel out net dipole moment is zero so carbon dioxide it is a non-polar molecule because it's net dipole moment is zero because it's net dipole moment is zero okay I hope I'm clear to everyone till here. Right, people? Am I clear till here? Am I clear till here? Am I clear till here? One more thing, do remove directly. More the electronegativity difference. More the electronegativity difference between the atoms. More the charge on the atoms. And more the charges means more the dipole moment. More the charge means more the dipole moment. Let's try to solve questions so that it becomes clear. Let's solve the question so that it becomes clear. Let's solve this question first. HF, HCl, HBr, HI. Give me the order of the dipole moment quickly. Give me the order of dipole moment quickly. Give me the order of dipole moment quickly in this question. See guys, this is HF, this is HCl, HBr, HI. More the electronegativity difference, more the electronegativity difference, more the dipole moment. In short. Clear? Look at this particular question. This is CCl, this is CCl. Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So lesser to more. Less electronegative to more electronegative. Less electronegative to more electronegative. So both these vectors are in the same direction. So this is your net dipole moment direction. Right? Less electronegative to more electronegative. Less electronegative to more electronegative. It cancels out. So net dipole moment here is zero. Net dipole moment is zero. Right? So where is the dipole moment more? In the first case. In the first case. NH3, NF3. NH3, NF3, it is a special case. Have a look. NH3, this is nitrogen, this is hydrogen, 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 and it's a lone pair. NF3, this is nitrogen, this is fluorine, 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 and a lone pair. Perfect, and a lone pair. First of all, lone pair also contributes towards the dipole moment, right? So, the moment due to lone pair is towards the lone pair. The moment due to lone pair is towards the lone pair, okay? Leaving aside. NH, less electronegative to more electronegative. Less to more. Less to more, right? Similarly, nitrogen and fluorine. Nitrogen is less electronegative, fluorine is more. Less to more. Less to more. Less to more. Perfect. If you see, all these four vectors, they are basically converging in the same direction. They are converging in the same direction. Over here. One is going up, one is going down. There will be some cancellations. There will be some cancellations. Here, you don't have any cancellations. Here, cancellations are there, right? No cancellation means more dipole moment. Done? Is it done and dusted? Recently, you would have studied your CH3. Is CH3 donating or withdrawing? Is CH3 group donating group or withdrawing group? Tell me that. Just that. Quick people. Quickly, 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 everyone. Quickly, everyone in the chats. Absolutely, you know it. CH3 is donating. If it donates, if it, is do if it donates, delta positive, delta negative. This one will be donating. Delta positive, delta negative. Positive to negative. 
positive to negative. Both the vectors are in the opposite direction, right? Net dipole moment here is zero. Net is zero, right? See, positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. One vector is pointing downwards, one vector is pointing in this direction. Both the vectors are at an angle of what? 120 degree, right? Positive to negative. Positive to negative. One vector is pointing downwards. One vector is pointing in this direction. Angle is 60. Angle is 60. Perfect. Here the angle was 180. 120. Angle is 60. Dipole moment. Dipole moment is inversely proportional to the angle between the vectors. Lesser the angle, more the net dipole moment. Lesser the angle, more the net dipole moment. So 3, greater than 2, greater than 1. Okay. Perfect. Look at this particular question. This will have positive to negative. So positive to negative. Downwards. NO2 is withdrawing. It will withdraw. It will get delta negative. This will get delta positive. Positive to negative in this direction. So one vector is pointing downwards. One in this particular direction. The angle over here is 120. Perfect. Positive to negative. Positive to negative. One vector pointing downwards, one in this particular direction. The angle here is 60, right? Positive to negative, positive to negative. Both vectors downwards, so angle here is zero. Lesser the angle, so three will have more dipole moment, followed by two, followed by one. Yes? Am I clear, people? Am I clear to everyone? Leave this particular case aside, talk about the other ones. H2O, H2S, more electronegativity difference, more dipole moment. Here it is oxygen, hydrogen. Here it's sulfur, hydrogen. Where is the electronegativity difference more in the first case? More difference, more dipole moment. In the second case, <coughs> more electronegativity difference, more the dipole moment. In the third case, more electronegativity difference, more the dipole moment. Okay, more the dipole moment. Am I clear? Because here you have got OH. Let's say you have got OH bond here. Here you have got NH bond. O is more electronegative than N. So electronegativity difference here is more. If difference here is more, dipole moment is more. Difference here is less, dipole moment is less. I believe I'm clear. I believe I'm clear. Look at the first case. I mean, look at the first case, right? This is something which you will remember. This is something which you will remember. My dear students, here you have got bond between C and F. Here you have got bond between C and L. C and L, correct? Dipole moment, it depends on two factors basically, charge and distance, right? So more the charge, more the charge, more the charge means, more the electronegativity difference, more the charge, more the dipole moment, you know it. At the same time, it is directly proportional to distance as well. Distance, more the distance, more the dipole moment. Perfect. These are the two factors basically, charge and distance, which, which actually decide the overall dipole moment, right? Charge as well as distance. Charge as well as distance. Perfect. Now, as per electronegativity difference, as per electronegativity difference, as per electronegativity difference, as per electronegativity difference, if this is 1, if this is 1, this is 2, as per charge factor, as per charge factor, which one should have more dipole moment? 1 will be greater than 2 because more electronegativity difference here. As per distance factor, CCL bond length is more than CF as per distance factor. 2 is greater than 1, right? This is the special case where his distance factor dominates. Where his distance factor dominates. So in this particular case, in this particular case, in this particular case, let me tell you, this is 3, this is 4, right? The order will be 2, 1, 3, 4. 2, 1, 3, 4. Do remember it directly. Distance part dominates over here in this particular case. In this particular case. Look at this nice question. Among these four, among these four, give the order of dipole. Give the order of net dipole moment. Understand one thing, guys. Just one thing, just one thing. This I believe you would have studied in your vectors. If this is one vector pointing in this direction, one vector pointing in this direction at, at an angle of what? At an angle of 90. Its magnitude is x, this is x. Your resultant will be in this direction. It will be root 2x, which you would have studied, right? I believe. I believe you would have studied that. Okay, perfect. Let's say this one vector, 
एंड वन मोर वैक्टर एंड वन मोर वैक्टर परफेक्ट परफेक्ट एट एन एंगल ऑफ लेट्स से लेट्स से एट एन एंगल ऑफ व्हाट एट एन एंगल ऑफ सिक्सटी एट एन एंगल ऑफ सिक्सटी व्हाट विल बी द रिजल्टेंट व्हाट विल बी द रिजल्टेंट क्विकली व्हाट विल बी द रिजल्टेंट क्विकली 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 रिजल्टेंट मास्किंग एट सिक्सटी व्हाट इज द रिजल्टेंट गाइस रिसेंटली यावर सर वाज टीचिंग ऑल दिस इन इलेक्ट्रोस्टैटिक्स राइट फ्यू डेज बैक ओनली राइट रिजल्टेंट इज गोइंग टू बी रूट ऑफ 3x करेक्ट If this is one vector, this is one more vector at an angle of one twenty. Resultant at an angle of one twenty. Resultant. If this is x, this is x. Resultant. Resultant here is going to be x only. Resultant here is going to be x only. Yeah. Resultant here is going to be x only. ओके मुंग सी गैस फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल क्लोरीन वॉट इज इट वॉट इज इट डोनेटिंग और विद ड्रॉइंग डोनेटिंग और विद ड्रॉइंग क्विकली क्लोरीन डोनेटिंग और विद ड्रॉइंग इट्स विद ड्रॉइंग इट्स विद ड्रॉइंग राइट तो डेल्टा नेगेटिव डेल्टा पॉजिटिव डेल्टा नेगेटिव डेल्टा पॉजिटिव सो पॉजिटिव नेगेटिव हेयर पॉजिटिव नेगेटिव हेयर परफेक्ट पॉजिटिव नेगेटिव हेयर Similarly, this is going to be positive and negative. Similarly, this is going to be positive and negative. Perfect. If you look at this vector and this vector, they are at an angle of what? Let's call this as x. Let's call this as x. Let's call this as x. This and this, they are at an angle of one is going upwards, one is going in this direction, right? They are at an angle of one twenty. So resultant of this and this at an angle of one twenty is going to be x only. Already in this direction there was x. So x plus x makes it two x, right? Similarly, positive to negative, positive to negative. Positive to negative, correct? These two, they are at angle of one twenty, so resultant is x. So this is x, and this is x, right? They'll cancel out, so net is zero. This is the resultant of these two, resultant of these two, and this one. They'll cancel out, net is zero. Similarly, positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative. Perfect. So this and this cancels. The resultant here is x, right? Okay. Positive to negative. Positive and negative, right? Cancel out. This is zero. Perfect. Now, which one has got maximum dipole moment here? This is two x zero zero x. So first one has got maximum dipole moment. I hope you can solve these sort of questions. Need twenty twenty one question was asked from the same. Need twenty twenty one question was asked. Can you give it by? Which of the following set of molecules will have zero dipole moment? Zero dipole moment. Quickly. is this something which you should answer now quickly in the chats quickly in the chats everyone which of the following will have zero dipole moment pf3 pf3 bf2 carbon dioxide 14 dichlorobenzene this is going to be the answer okay one more thing which i want you guys to remember for now right you'll get the actual idea in some time remember whenever you see a molecule of the type ab2l0 ab3l0 ab4l0 ab5l0 ab6l0 ab4l2 ab2l3 ab2 l3 all these molecules have got their net dipole moments will be zero now how do we check this how do we check what is the type of the molecule whether it is ab2 l0 ab3 l0 etc etc that is something which you will understand in some time just remember it for now 
just remember it for now okay all these molecules all these type of the molecules they'll be having net dipolement always zero right how do we check how do we check it what is the type of the molecule that you'll understand in some time perfect i hope all the things are absolutely clear till here now now let's talk about one of the most important theories of this chapter that is valence bond theory my dear students valence bond theory but before starting the valence bond theory let me know in the chats if every single thing is clear <clears throat> Quickly, people. Perfect, guys. Let's talk about, let's start this amazing theory, which is the valence bond theory, right? From this theory. Short, short question will be asked again. Okay, short, short question guys, from this particular theory. And it's simple, it's very simple. What this VBT is all about? My dear students, this valence bond theory, it explains the formation of covalent bonds. First thing, it explains the formation of covalent bonds. This theory is going to let you know how a covalent bond actually gets formed. How a covalent bond actually gets formed. Right, how a covalent bond actually gets formed. As per this theory is concerned, a covalent bond is formed by the overlap, by the overlap of atomic orbitals of the bonding atoms. As per this particular theory is concerned, a covalent bond gets formed when the, when the orbitals, when the orbitals of the bonding atoms, when they overlap, when they penetrate into each other. First of all, you must be thinking what is overlapping? Overlapping of atomic orbitals means Penetration of atomic orbitals into each other. Penetration of atomic orbitals into each other. For example, this is one of the orbital of one of the atom. This is one more orbital of one more atom. Now, let's say they are coming closer. If they are coming closer, what is going to happen? Their atomic orbitals, they'll overlap, right? They'll merge into each other. This merging of electron cloud, this merging of electron cloud into each other is something which you call as overlapping, right? And do remember, Whenever you see overlapping of atomic orbitals taking place, it always leads to the formation of which bond? It always leads to the formation of covalent bond. So as per VBT is concerned, a covalent bond is formed by the overlapping of atomic orbitals into each other. Okay? And people, you know, in order to show the overlapping, in, in order to show the overlapping, the bonding atoms, the bonding atoms, they must come close. They must come close. They must come close, right? In order to show overlapping, the bonding atoms, they have to come close. Then only this overlapping, then only this merging of electron cloud into each other will happen. Right? And whenever electron clouds merge into each other, remember overlapping has happened and due to overlapping, covalent bond gets formed. As simple as that. As simple as that. As simple as that. Now, here are a few things which I would want to discuss with you. My dear students, before understanding this VBT in detail, there are few things. There are some, there are some basic things which you need to know. What are, the, what are those? Let's say this is one atom. Okay. This is one atom A, let's say. This is the electron of this atom. Let's say this is the atom B. And this is the electron of B. I'm calling this as nucleus of A, electron of A. I'm calling this as nucleus of B. Electron of B. Can you let me know how many forces exist? How many forces will arise between these two atoms? First thing, this nucleus will be attracting its own electron towards itself. Yes. This nucleus will be attracting its own electron towards itself. Yes. This nucleus will be attracting this particular electron towards itself. Yes. This nucleus will be attracting this particular electron towards itself. Right. Perfect. 
Between these two electrons, there will be repulsions. Between these two nucleus, there will be repulsions. So between these two atoms, how many forces are arising? How many forces do we have? We have got two types of forces. Attractive forces between the atoms. And we have got repulsive forces between the atoms too. Attractive forces as well as repulsive forces between the atoms. Let me tell you, attractive forces, they stabilize the system. They try to increase the stability of the system. They try to increase the stability of the system. Repulsive forces, it, it destabilizes the system. It destabilizes the system. Remember these two points. Attractive forces, they try to increase the stability of the system and repulsive forces, they will try to destabilize the system. Number one. Number two. Number two. My dear students, imagine these are two atoms. Imagine these are two atoms. These two atoms are at maximum, I mean, these two atoms are at infinite distance apart. Imagine that. These two atoms are at infinite distance apart. You know, Force of attraction is inversely proportional distance. Is inversely proportional distance. If these atoms are at infinite distance apart, can I say force of attraction between them will be zero? So right now, between these two atoms, force of attraction will be absolutely zero. Force of attraction will be zero because these atoms are at infinite distance apart. Now, if these atoms will start coming closer, distance between them will decrease. Distance between them will decrease. Force of attraction will increase. Force of attraction will increase. Force of attraction will increase. Can I say there will be a scenario when these atoms will be at maximum closest distance? There will be a scenario when these atoms will be at maximum closest distance. And let me tell you, when the atoms are at maximum closest distance, force of attraction between the atoms is maximum. Force of attraction between the atoms is maximum. At this point, when the atoms are at maximum closest distance, at this point, we say molecule has got formed. Molecule formation has taken place. First, atoms will be at infinite distance apart. Force of attraction zero. Now, atoms are coming closer. Distance is decreasing. Distance is decreasing. Force of attraction increasing. Force of attraction increasing. Now, the atoms are at maximum closest distance. Right? Force of attraction is maximum. Right? Force of attraction is maximum. Stability is maximum. Force of attraction is maximum and force of attraction leads to increase in the stability of the system. If force of attraction is maximum, stability is maximum, stability is maximum. That means we say molecule has got formed. We say molecule has got formed. Yes. Now, one more thing. If you want these atoms, if you want these atoms to come a little more closer after that, which force will start? Repulsive forces will start after this point. Repulsive forces will start after this point. Can I say when atoms were far, attractive forces were existing the, between the atoms. When the atoms are so close, repulsive forces arise between them. Okay. So can I say your attractive forces, they are long range forces. Your repulsive forces, they are, they are short range forces. Can I say something like this? Attractive forces are long range forces, whereas repulsive forces, they are basically your short range forces. Okay. There is one graph which is super important. You need to know that. You need to know that people. Try to understand what exactly I'm going to talk about. This is your potential energy. This is your potential energy. Okay. And. And. This is your internuclear distance. This is the internuclear distance. Potential energy versus internuclear distance. Please tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. At this point, what are the coordinates of this point? Its origin. Its coordinates are 0, 0. 0, 0 its coordinates. So at this point, R is 0. R is 0 means distance between the atoms is zero basically, is approaching towards zero. Distance between the atoms is approaching towards zero, right? Now, if you go in this direction, R is increasing, R is increasing. That means distance between the atoms is increasing. Distance between the atoms is increasing. 
if you go in this direction, distance between the atoms is increasing. And I say somewhere, somewhere, when R tends to infinity, when the distance between the atoms will be infinity, at that point of time, force of attraction between the atoms will be zero. Right? At that time, force of attraction between the atoms will be zero. You know it. Perfect. Somewhere here. Now, if you go opposite, if you go in this direction, R is decreasing, R is decreasing. Atoms are coming closer. R is decreasing. Atoms, R was, I mean, initially the atoms were at infinite distance apart. Now, you are moving in this direction. R is decreasing. R is decreasing. Atoms are coming closer. If the atoms are coming closer, force of attraction is increasing. Force of attraction is increasing. Due to attractions, energy is released. Energy is released. Due to attractions, energy is released. So, so continuously energy is being released. Continuously energy is being released. If, when atoms are coming closer, continuously energy is being released. So, energy within the system, that is decreasing with time. Energy within the system, that is decreasing with time. Right? Energy within the system, that is decreasing with time. And stability is increasing with time. Energy within the system, that is decreasing with time. Stability is increasing. Right? This is the point. This is the point. This is the point. This is the point at which energy of the system is minimum. This is the point at which energy of the system is minimum. Stability is maximum. That means at this particular point, that means at this particular point, I would say, I would say atoms are at maximum closest distance. Atoms are at maximum closest distance. So I would say force of attraction between the atoms is maximum. Right? Potential energy of the system is minimum. Stability is maximum. Perfect. Now guys understand. Understand. Atoms are right now at maximum close resistance. If you want these atoms to come a little more closer, what will happen? Repulsions will arise. Repulsions will start. And repulsions, they will try to do the repulsions. Energy of the system will increase. Stability will decrease. Energy of the system now will increase and stability will decrease. Perfect. So this is the graph. I hope you got to know how this graph is made. I hope you got to know how this graph is made. Perfect. Right? From here to here, you'll be calling this as bond energy of the molecule. Right? You'll be calling this as bond energy of the molecule. And this particular distance over here, you'll be calling as bond length. You'll be calling this as bond length. And at this particular point, one more thing. If you draw the tangent at this particular point, slope of that tangent will be zero. Slope. That means du upon dr at this particular point is equal to zero. Is equal to zero. Right? Slope of this is the criteria which I use in order to calculate the bond length. How exactly? This is the criteria which I use in order to calculate the bond length. How exactly? For that, I've got a question for you. Let's try to solve. See guys, as per the question is concerned, you are given with, the, with, with some variation of potential energy with R between two atoms. U is equal to 6 by R means 6 R raised power minus 2 plus 3R plus 2, right? Variation of potential energy with internuclear distance. Calculate the bond length. In order to calculate the bond length, what is the criteria we use? DU by DR has to be 0. DU by DR has to be 0, right? DU by DR has to be 0. So differentiate, differentiate this U with respect to R. Differentiate, with U, differentiate this U with respect to R. So DU by DR will be equal. This is 6 I am writing as such, right? X raised per N. Which means nx n minus 1. So 6 2s are 12. It's going to be 12 r raised power minus 3. Perfect. Differentiation of 3r is nothing but r. Perfect. This constant is 0. And this term has to be 0. Right. So I'll say 12. This minus 12, sorry. So minus 12 r raised power minus 3 is equal to minus 3. Right. So r raised power minus 3 is equal to 1 by 4. r raised power minus 3 is equal to 1 by 4. What does that mean? That means 1 divided by r raised power 3 is equal to 1 by 4. So r raised power 3 is equal to 4. If I, if I, if I, right, if I take cube root on both the sides, this is going to be r is equal to 4 raised power 1 by 3 and the answer is going to be in angstroms. Am I clear? So one criteria I used, one criteria I used in order to calculate bond length, du by dr has to be 0. Quickly in the chats if this is super clear to everyone. Let me know. Let me know in the chats if it is clear to everyone.
quickly guys I want every one of you to say it if it is clear quickly quickly done okay so we were talking about vbt valence bond theory as per valence bond theory valence bond theory lets you know how a covalent bond gets formed and we got to know covalent bond gets formed by by the overlapping of atomic orbitals into each other and what is overlapping what is overlapping what is overlapping penetration of atomic orbitals into each other and due to overlapping what happens covalent bond gets formed now this overlapping is of two types axial overlapping parallel overlapping axial overlapping parallel overlapping axial overlapping it leads to the formation of sigma bond parallel overlapping it leads to the formation of either pi bond or a delta bond pi bond or a delta bond parallel overlapping leads to the formation of pi bond or a delta bond Okay, now what happens in actual overlap? You call it either actual overlapping or you can call it as head on overlap. You call this as you call this as head on overlapping as well. You call this as head on overlapping as well. Okay, now first of all, we'll get to know about actual overlapping, then we'll get to know about the parallel overlapping. So let's talk about the actual overlapping. In case of actual overlapping, which bond gets formed? As I told you, sigma bond gets formed. Absolutely, sigma bond formation takes place. Sigma bond formation takes place. Now, as per actual overlapping is concerned, two atomic orbitals overlap along their axes, which leads to the formation of sigma bond. Two atomic orbitals will overlap along their axes. Along their axes. What is meant by that? See. In order to understand, in order to make you understand the actual overlapping, I'll take its first case as SS overlap. SS overlap. This is the first example of what? This is the first example of actual overlap, which I'm showing. My dear students, let's say this is the S orbital of one atom. And this is one more S orbital of one atom. S orbital of one atom, S orbital of one atom, right? Okay. Now, they have to come closer and they have to do overlapping, right? This over here, this line which I'm drawing over here, I'm calling this line as internuclear axis, which is generally kept as z-axis. Internuclear axis, which is generally kept as z-axis, as per sign conventions. Now people, there are two things which will happen here. There are two things. When these atoms will overlap, when the atoms will overlap, there are two things which will happen. There are two types of overlap which are going to happen. Positive overlap, negative overlap. Positive overlap, negative overlap. Positive overlap leads to the formation of bond. Negative overlap, it does not lead to the formation of bond. Now, how do you show the positive and negative overlap? See, let's say this is positive here, this is positive. Right? Positive, positive. Same sign. This, this, this is not, I'm not representing, it's not the nucleus which I'm representing. I just want to show you how to check whether the overlap is positive or negative. Positive, positive. Same sign, same sign. Same sign, same side. Same sign, same side. Right? Same sign, same side. So, this is the example of what? It is going to be the example of positive overlap or you call this as in-phase overlap. You call this as in-phase overlap. You call this as in-phase overlap. Now, what's going to happen? They are going to merge into each other. They are going to merge into each other. They are going to merge into each other. Right? They are going to merge into each other. What is this called? Overlapping. Due to overlapping, what happened? Due to overlapping, Due to overlapping, covalent bond gets formed. Now, which overlapping this is? This is your actual overlapping. So, which bond got formed? It is a sigma bond which got formed. It is a sigma bond which got formed. Okay? It is a sigma bond which got formed here. Perfect? It is a sigma bond which got formed over here. 
right people now now once this overlapping is done once this overlapping is done this electron cloud it will arrange itself in such a way that it comes under the influence of both these both the nuclei at the end what happens the electron cloud it arranges itself in such a way that it comes under the influence of both the nuclei let's say this nucleus of one atom let's say this was nucleus of one atom and this is the electron density which has come in between right okay tell me one thing if you want to have a look on the negative overlap negative overlap so this is s this is one more s how do we represent it right pause to here right negative to here opposite sign on same side what do i call this overlap as either you will be calling this as negative overlap or you will be calling this as out of phase overlap you will be calling this as out of phase overlap which does not lead to the formation of any bond okay was this overlap head on overlap yes this was head on overlap so this was the first example of your this was the first example of your actual overlap right first example second example of the actual overlap second example of the actual overlap sp overlap sp overlap sp overlap this is the s orbital for example and this is the p orbital s orbital p orbital s orbital p, or p orbital okay s orbital p orbital is this again going to be head on overlap yes this is going to be the head on overlap right let's say i'm showing now the positive overlap here i'm showing the in phase overlap here how do i show it how do i show it understand if let's say this is positive then this has to be positive this has to be negative same sign on same side it's going to be positive overlap it's going to be positive overlap right so this one of the atom and this is one more and this is the common electron cloud over here perfect i believe i'm clear till here i believe i'm clear till here so this was your sp overlap positive perfect if you want to have a look on the negative overlap as well so this is let's pick this s let's make this as p if this is positive call this is negative this is positive right opposite sign on same side opposite sign on same side opposite sign same side means negative overlap perfect so this was your sp overlap now the third in actual overlapping is your pp overlap it is your pp overlapping right so this is one of the p orbital this is one more p orbital right perfect and this is your internuclear axis this is your internuclear axis right let's call this positive let's call this negative let's call this positive let's call this negative same sign same side same sign same side positive overlap positive overlap in phase overlap positive overlap in phase overlap right so it is again the head on overlap it will lead to the formation of a sigma bond finally you are going to represent it like this right if this is negative this this part is negative right this positive positive so here you will write positive and here you will write negative again head on overlap so which bond has formed over here it is a sigma bond which has got formed over here so in case of actual overlapping what happens overlapping happens head on there is head on overlapping basically okay there is head on overlapping basically just a second guys just give me a second
Perfect. So guys, is the actual overlapping clear to everyone? Is the actual overlapping clear? Actual overlapping leads to the formation of what? It leads to the formation of your sigma bond, right? Now, I'm going to move on to the parallel overlapping. I'm going to move on to the parallel overlapping. I'm going to move on to the parallel overlap. Parallel overlap. Parallel overlap. What happens in parallel overlap? Which bond gets formed? It is the pi bond which gets formed or delta bond. Leave delta bond aside. That's not in your syllabus, right? I'm just talking about the pi bond formation. I'm just talking about the pi bond formation. Two parallel overlap and I'll just show the positive overlap now right it is just I wanted to show you how to identify whether the overlap is positive or negative same sign same side means positive overlap opposite sign same side means negative overlap that's all right okay let's say I'm first of all showing you the pp parallel overlap pp parallel overlap let's say this is one of your p orbital this is one of your p orbital and they are going to have their axes parallel they are going to have their axes parallel. Okay. They are going to have their axes parallel. Now they are going to overlap in this way, keeping their axes parallel. What is going to happen? What is going to happen? What's going to happen? Let me give the signs as well. Let's say this is positive. Okay. Let's say this is negative. Let's say this is positive. This is negative. Same sign, same side. So it is the example of the positive overlap, in phase overlap, positive overlap, in phase overlap. What is going to happen? What is going to happen? What is going to happen? Are your students? Overlapping will happen over here. Right? Overlapping will happen over here. How do I represent it at the end? How do I represent it at the end? How do I represent it at the end? My dear students, first of all, I am going to make a plane over here. This is one plane. Above this plane, there is electron density. And below this plane again, there is electron density. Below this plane, again, there is electron density, right? This is the nucleus of one atom, and this is the nucleus of one atom. Perfect. So, through parallel overlapping, what happens? A pi bond got formed. Pi bond got formed. On this particular plane, is there any electron density? No, there is no electron density here. So, this plane I'm calling as a nodal plane. This is what I'll be calling as a nodal plane, right? This is what I'll be calling as a nodal plane. Perfect. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Am I clear? This is one of the example of the parallel overlapping with the help of which pi bond gets formed. Second example. If I talk about PD overlap, PD parallel overlap. If I talk about PD parallel overlap, right? Let's say this is your P orbital here. Perfect. And this is your d orbital. This is p and this is d. Okay. Let's call this positive. Let's call this as negative. Let's say this is positive. This is negative. This is negative. This is positive. Same sign, same sign. Positive overlap. But right now, this is going to be the parallel overlap. How exactly? This was your p orbital. Perfect. And this is your d orbital. This is the common electron cloud part. Merging of electron cloud into each other. Perfect. So, what do you get over here? You got a pi bond. You got a pi bond over here. What do we call this pi bond as? You call this as P pi D pi bond. You call this as P pi D pi bond. And I'm right now showing which overlap? Positive overlap. If you want to show the negative overlap, then keep the signs opposite. Opposite signs on the same side. That's all. Opposite signs on the same side. That's all. Right? This was your PD overlap. Then you have got, then you have got DD overlap. Then you have got DD overlap. Two lobe interaction. Two lobe interaction. DD overlap, two lobe interaction. How exactly? Let's say this is your one of the D orbitals. One more D orbital, right? Now, how they are going to overlap exactly? First of all, let me give the signs. Let's say this is positive, this is negative, right? Perfect. 
positive negative negative positive perfect positive negative negative positive do you see same sign on same side so it is positive in phase overlap it is positive in phase overlap so this is what is going to happen this is what is going to happen perfect so merging of electron clouds into each other merging of electron clouds into each other perfect this is called as two lobe two lobe interaction and it leads to the formation of your pi bond this is d this is d you call this particular pi bond as d pi d pi bond you call this particular pi bond as d pi d pi bond i hope i am clear with every single thing okay and my dear students one thing which i would want to which i would want you guys to remember you know your sigma bonds they are stronger than your pi bonds sigma bonds gets formed by the axial overlapping pi bond gets formed by the parallel overlapping right pi bond gets formed by the parallel overlapping do remember do remember sigma bonds they are stronger than pi bonds what is the reason what is the reason because in axial overlapping extent of overlap is more extent of overlap extent of overlap in axial in axial is always more than that of extent of overlap in parallel and do remember strength of the bond is directly proportional to extent of overlap more the overlap stronger the bond in case of axial overlap in case of axial overlap what happens in case of axial overlap what happens extent of overlap is more more the extent of overlap more the strength of the bond that's all that's all people now i am going to take few examples so that you can understand all this in detail all this in detail few examples with the help of few examples try to understand what exactly i am going to do now i am going to apply the valence bond theory for example i have to show the f2 molecule formation let's say i have to show the f2 molecule formation with the help of what with the help of vbt with the help of vbt correct so this is your one fluorine atom this is one more fluorine atom can you let me know the outermost configuration of fluorine it is 2p5 this one is also what this is 2p5 configuration how do i show this 2p5 configuration 1 2 3 4 5 Similarly, over here, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Let me call this as P Z. Let me call this as P X. Let me call this as P Y. Let me call this as P Z. This is P X. This is P Y. Now, what is going to happen if I talk about this fluorine atom? How many orbitals do we see here? Three orbitals, right? This axis I am calling as Z axis, internuclear axis. This is your Z axis, internuclear axis, right? If I look at this fluorine, this is P Z. This is P Z containing one electron, containing one electron. Now P X is containing two electron. Let's say this is P X. This P X is containing two electrons. Now this is P Y. P Y is also containing two electrons. Let's say this is your P Y containing two electrons, right? Now if I look at this particular fluorine, what is going to happen here? What's going to happen here? This is P Z containing one electron. That P Z will come from here and will do the head-on overlap. This is the head-on overlap. So which bond got formed here? Sigma bond got formed. Now, what about the rest? What about the rest? This is your P X. So P X containing two electrons. P X containing two electrons. And at the same time, and at the same time, your P Y is also containing two electrons. So this is P Y containing two electrons. Do you see an overlap happened? Right? It was the head-on overlap. Which leads to the formation of sigma bond. How do I show it at the end? One fluorine, one fluorine, fluorine and fluorine. Between them, there is a single bond, right? Between them, there is a single bond. I hope you got to know about the formation of F two through VBT. This is the formation. This is the formation of F two through VBT. If I'm clear, let me know once in the chats. If I'm clear, people, let me know quickly in the chats. All of you. Yeah. All clear. One more example, which will make it more interesting. One more example, which will make it more interesting. 
Let me show you the formation of O2 molecule. O2 molecule formation through VBT. O2 molecule formation through VBT. My dear students, if I talk about oxygen, its outermost configuration is 2P4. If I talk about one more oxygen, its outermost configuration is 2P4. Right? Now, this is 1, 2, 3, and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. If I call this as Px, this is your Py for example, this is your Pz for example. Pz, Py, Px. Correct? First of all, I am going to draw the internuclear axis. This is your internuclear axis which you call as Z axis. Z axis, right? This is your Pz here, containing one electron. Pz containing one electron. Then you have got Py containing one electron. This is Py containing one electron. Then you have got Pz, Px containing two electrons. Let's say this is Px, which is containing two electrons. Correct? Now, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? This is Pz. Pz of one more fluorine will come from this side. We'll do the head-on overlap. So which bond got formed? It's a sigma here. It is a sigma here. It is a sigma here. Now, now, Py is also containing one electron. So this is Py containing one electron. Perfect. So this Py and this Py, they are going to show the sideways overlapping. So they'll show the sideways overlapping, parallel overlapping. So there's a pi bond here, right? Then you have got, you have got Px as well. So Px is already full, fulfilled, two electrons there. So this is Px. Correct? So one sigma and one pi got formed. One sigma and one pi got formed. Which bond got formed first? A sigma bond got formed first. A sigma bond got formed first. After that, a pi bond got formed. So do remember sigma is formed first, followed by pi. Do remember sigma is formed first, followed by pi. Am I clear till here? Am I clear till here, people? Okay. Do you want to see more about it? I believe N2 molecule formation you can easily do. N2 molecule formation. I believe N2 molecule formation you can easily do. Right? The final structure I'm making. Sigma. Pi. One more pi. So one sigma, one sigma and two pi bonds here in case of N2. And finally, how do you represent it? This is N triple bond N. Out of this triple bond, one is sigma and one is pi, right? I think let's take a break for 20 minutes and be back. Huh? Okay. What time you guys are going to be back? <clears throat> So, are you guys going to be back or not? Honestly, I would want every one of you to be back on time, okay? I'll see you all at 1 10 p.m. sharp. Perfect. Till then, you can have. Yes, yes, I'll cover all the topics. I'll cover all the topics. You need not to worry. But be back on the time. Otherwise, there's no fun in teaching. Yes, it is your lunch break. Go. And come back.
I think everyone is back. Yes. Let me know quickly in the chats. Is everyone back? <clears throat> welcome back, people. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. What's up? Perfect, guys. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, once, let me know in the chats, whatever I discussed till now, are all the topics absolutely clear? Let me know in the chats quickly, people. Let me know in the chats quickly. Whatever I discussed till now, are all the things clear? Are all the things absolutely clear? <laughs> yes. And guys, one thing I'm telling you, whatever I'm going to discuss in the today's session, you're not going to get anything apart from these things in your actual examination. Okay? <clears throat> Perfect. Now comes one more important, I would say the most important topic of the chapter, the most important topic of your inorganic chemistry, that is hybridization. Okay, that is hybridization. Before knowing the meaning of hybridization, you should know exactly why do we need this concept. That is more important. Why do we need this concept of hybridization? That is more important, guys. Okay? So let's have a look why the concept of hybridization was introduced. Right? Let's get to know about that. Hmm. For example, for example, I'll show you the formation of CH4 molecule. I'm going to show you the formation of CH4 molecule as per VBT. Formation of CH4 molecule as per VBT. My dear students, try to understand very carefully. In case of CH4, the central atom is your carbon. The central atom is your carbon. If I ask you, what is the outermost configuration of carbon, you will say 2s2, 2p2. This is the outermost configuration of carbon. This is 2s2. And this is 2p2. This is the outermost configuration of carbon. Right now, I can say carbon is present in its ground state. Right now, the carbon is present in its ground state. If I ask you, how many unpaired electrons carbon has in ground state? It has got two unpaired electrons. It has got two unpaired electrons. But how many bonds carbon is forming? Carbon is making four bonds. In order to make four bonds as per VBT, there should be four unpaired electrons. Now, how do you get the four unpaired electrons here? If one of the electrons from here shifts here, when one electron shifts, I am getting the excited state of carbon like this. This is the excited state of carbon. This is the excited state of carbon, right? This is your S electron. This is P orbital containing one electron, one more P, one more P, right? Now, my dear students, this S, this is P, this is P, this is P. Now, carbon has to form bonds with hydrogen. If I ask you, what is the configuration of hydrogen? You will say 1s1. Perfect. So, what I'll say, I'll say one of the S orbitals of hydrogen will come from this side, right? One of the S orbitals of hydrogen will come from this side and will do the overlapping. Similarly, one more s orbital of one more hydrogen will come from this side and will do the overlapping. One more, one more. Perfect. And due to overlapping, what happens? Covalent bond formation takes place. So, how many bonds are taking place? Four. So, C, this for example, H, this is H, this is H, and this is H. So, how many bonds? Four. Now, if I ask you, out of this, these four bonds, out of these four bonds, one bond is forming, these, one bond is formed due to SS overlapping. One bond is formed due to SP overlapping. One more SP, one more SP. 
is the overlapping same everywhere? Look here. This is SS overlapping. This is SP overlapping. SS overlapping, SP overlapping. It's different. Right? It's different. And you know, bond strength is directly proportional to extent of overlapping. Bond strength is directly proportional to extent of overlapping. Perfect. And bond strength is inversely proportional to bond length as well. Stronger the bond, lesser the bond length. Stronger the bond, lesser the bond length. If the extent of overlapping is different, that means bond strengths are different. If bond strengths are different, that means these bond lengths will be different. That means CH bond lengths will be different. All the four CH bonds, bond lengths won't be same. All the four CH bond lengths won't be same. As per VBT, as per VBT, all the four, all the four, CH bond lengths won't be same. Won't be same. As per what? As per VBT. But, 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 when you analyze the CH4 molecule actually, you'll find all the four bond lengths are same. When you analyze, it is observed, it, is, it has been seen that in CH4, all the bond lengths are same. But as per VBT, all the four bond lengths won't be same. Right? Now, how do you explain it? How do you explain it? As per VBT, all the bond lengths should not be same. Right? But in reality, all the bond lengths are same in CH4. Now, how do you explain it? Explain it, we introduce a concept of hybridization. To explain it, we introduce the concept of hybridization. Now, what happens in this hybridization concept? What happens in this hybridization concept? My dear students, first point you have to remember, hybridization is a complete theoretical concept. It is a complete theoretical concept. It does not have any experimental background. It is a complete theoretical concept. No experimental background. Number one. Number two. Number two. Number two. How do you define the hybridization? What happens in hybridization? My dear students, in hybridization, in hybridization, what happens? Atomic orbitals, atomic orbitals, which have got nearly same energy. Atomic orbitals, which have got nearly same energy, belonging to the same atom. Belonging to the same atom. Belonging to the same atom. They are going to intermix. They are going to intermix. Atomic orbitals of a bonding atom. Atomic orbital of that atom which is going to participate in the bonding. Atomic orbitals of the bonding atom which have got nearly same energy. They are going to intermix. And they are going to lead to the formation of new orbitals. They are going to lead to the formation of new orbitals. Which have got, which are identical in all the respects. Which are identical in all the respects. Be it shape, be it size, be it energy. They are identical in all the respects. And those new orbitals, which are identical in all the respects, those are what you call as hybrid orbitals. Those are what you call as hybrid, hybrid orbitals. As per hybridization, atomic orbitals of the bonding atoms, which have got nearly same energy, they are going to intermix. They are going to intermix. Right? They are going to lead to the formation of new orbitals, which are identical in all the respects, be it shape, be it size, be it energy. And those new orbitals which we get, those are called as hybrid orbitals. Point number one. Point number two, point number two, you'll get the exact feel after five to ten minutes of this particular topic, right? Number two, number of atomic orbitals which participate in the intermixing is equal to number of hybrid orbitals formed. Number of atomic orbitals which participate in the intermixing is equal to the number of hybrid orbitals formed. Is equal to the number of hybrid orbitals formed, right? Once the hybrid orbitals are generated, once the hybrid orbitals are generated, those hybrid orbitals, they arrange, they arrange themselves in such a way, they arrange themselves in such a way that there are minimum repulsions between them. That there are minimum repulsions between them. If repulsions are minimum, stability is maximum. Stability is maximum. Once these hybrid orbitals arrange themselves in such a way that repulsions are minimum, then what happens? Then what happens? Then these hybrid orbitals overlap. Then these hybrid orbitals overlap. With, with, with 
with either with either the hybrid orbitals of other atoms or atomic orbitals of other atoms of other bonding atoms and remember when hybrid orbitals overlap they lead to the formation of sigma bonds when hybrid orbitals overlap they lead to the formation of sigma bonds one exception except benzene in case of benzene hybrid orbitals overlap and lead to the formation of pi bond and lead to the formation of pi bond is all this theory clear this is the only theory which is required here now we are going to apply this theory now we are going to apply this theory now we are going to apply this theory yes i believe this theory is clear till here okay now it is the time apply the theory but 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 before applying the theory you should know few things more then i'll apply the concept you'll get to know how this hybridization is beneficial right and what kind of things we get from it try to understand people hybridization there is a method which i'm going to define with you define over here that is steric number method steric number method is used to check the hybridization steric number method is used to check the hybridization what is the steric number steric number is the number of sigma bonds plus the number of lone pairs steric number is basically the number of sigma bonds plus the number of lone pairs plus the number of lone pairs right now people try to understand try to understand if steric number comes out to be 2 if steric number comes out to be 2 hybridization involved is going to be sp that means one of the s orbital and one of the p orbitals have intermixed and they have led to the formation of two hybrid orbitals because two are intermixing so two hybrid orbitals will get formed okay and in case of s sp hybridization the geometry which is predicted through hybridization linear linear if steric number is 3 hybridization involved is sp2 <clears throat> sp2 right and the geometry involved the geometry which is predicted through hybridization that is planar trigonal planar trigonal planar if steric number comes out be 4 hybridization involved is sp3 the geometry involved is tetrahedral the geometry which is predicted through hybridization that's tetrahedral similarly if the steric number is 5 hybridization is sp3d the geometry involved the geometry which is predicted through hybridization that is what you call as trigonal bipyramidal geometry trigonal bipyramidal trigonal bipyramidal if steric number is 6 hybridization involved is sp3d2 geometry involved is octahedral geometry involved is octahedral and if the steric number is 7 the hybridization involved is sp3d3 and geometry predicted through hybridization is going to be pentagonal bipyramidal it is going to be pentagonal bipyramid it is going to be pentagonal bipyramid now remember one more thing now remember one more thing in case of sp hybridization one of the s orbital and one of the p orbital it can be either x or y or z whatever right they have intermixed one of the s orbital one of the p and one more p right sp2 over here s orbital your px py and pz they have participated in the intermixing sp3d one of the s orbital px py pz and dz square they have participated in the intermixing s px py pz dx square minus y square dz square participate in the intermixing s px py pz dxy dx square minus y square dz square participated in the intermixing they have participated in the intermixing these are the questions many times asked which d orbital is as which d orbital participates in sp3d it is dz square which d orbitals participate in sp3d3 right look at the d orbitals which d orbitals participate in sp3d2 you should know them okay now guys understand where and how we are going to introduce this concept of hybridization understand carefully what exactly i'm going to talk about this is something super important on which entire bonding is based on entire bonding try to understand the first molecule which i have taken over here that is becl2 becl2 try to understand becl2 the central atom is beryllium over here 
The center atom is beryllium over here. If I ask you, how many valence electrons beryllium has? Beryllium, atomic number 4, 2, comma 2. How many valence electrons it has? 2, right? How many surrounding atoms are here? There are two surrounding atoms. Do remember the number of surrounding atoms is equal to number of sigma bonds. The number of surrounding atoms is equal to number of sigma bonds. Now, beryllium had two valence electrons. Beryllium had two valence electrons. And both these valence electrons of beryllium have been used to form two sigma bonds. Both these valence electrons of beryllium have been used to form two sigma bonds. That means, will there be any lone pair on beryllium? There will be no lone pair. Right? Where beryllium had two valence electrons and all these valence electrons have participated to form two sigma bonds. So, there will be no, no lone pair on beryllium. If there is no lone pair, if I ask you what is the steric number, steric number is sigma plus lone pair. So, 2 plus 0 is 2. If steric number is 2, hybridation involved is sp. If hybridation involved is sp, geometry which is predicted through hybridation, that is linear. That is linear. That is linear. That is linear. Try to understand how it's going to solve all the issues. See hey guys, if I talk about beryllium, what about the outermost configuration of beryllium? Beryllium has got atomic number 4, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. It has got atomic number 4. So, outermost configuration is 2s2, 2p0. This is the outermost configuration. But people, if I ask you, is this the ground state configuration? Yes, this is the ground state configuration of beryllium. This is the ground state configuration of beryllium. If I make the excited state of beryllium, what is going to happen? This electron, one of the electrons will shift here and it's going to be one here. Right? This is the excited state of beryllium. This is the excited state of beryllium. This is S, this is P, containing one electron. Now, which, which hybridization is involved? Is involved? SP. So, this S and this P, they are going to involve in the intermixing. And when they get involved in the intermixing, since two atomic orbitals are participating in intermixing, so two hybrid orbitals will get formed. Two hybrid orbitals. So, there has been SP intermixing and two hybrid orbitals will get formed over here. Two hybrid orbitals will get formed over here. How, what is the shape of these hybrid orbitals? One lobe is made bigger in size. Another lobe is made smaller in size. So, these are the two hybrid orbitals which got generated over here. And these hybrid orbitals, they'll be containing one one electron each. Okay. Now, once these hybrid orbitals are made, once these hybrid orbitals are formed, once these hybrid orbitals are formed, now these hybrid orbitals, they are going to arrange themselves in such a way that there are minimum repulsions between them. Now you think how they are going to arrange themselves. If this is one hybrid orbital containing one electron, right? This is going to be one more hybrid orbital containing one more electron. Perfect. Hybrid orbitals, they have arranged themselves in such a way that there are minimum repulsions between them. Let me make them properly. Just a second. Let me make them properly. This is one of the hybrid orbital containing one electron and one more hybrid orbital containing one more electron. Okay. Perfect. Now people, understand. Beryllium has to form bonds with chlorine, right? If I ask you about the outermost configuration of chlorine, it is 2p5. It is 2p5, right? It is 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. This is the unpaired orbital. The unpaired orbital of chlorine, the unpaired orbital of chlorine, which is the p orbital, it will come from this side. It will show the overlap. One more, one more chlorine will come from this side. It's p orbital and it will show the overlap. If I ask you which overlap this is, which overlap this is, first of all it's a head-on overlap between sp hybrid orbital of beryllium and pure p orbital of chlorine. Similarly, sp hybrid orbital of beryllium and pure p orbital of chlorine. Was the overlap head-on? Yes, the overlap is head-on and due to head-on overlap, I would say sigma bond got formed, sigma, got, sigma bond got formed. So if I show it at the end, this is beryllium, there is one chlorine from this side, one chlorine from this side, right? This geometry is something which you call as linear geometry. Linear geometry, right? Linear geometry. If I ask you, what is the bond angle here? Absolutely, you should say it. It's 180 degree. Perfect. Am I clear to everyone? Quickly, people. Am I clear to everyone? Quickly, people. Quickly, quickly, everyone in the chats. 
everyone in the chats. Yes? So this was your SP hybridization. This was your SP hybridization. Now guys, there is one more question which is asked. If they ask you, in these SP hybrid orbitals, since this SP hybrid orbital got formed when S and P orbitals intermixed, right? So this hybrid orbital, it will have some S character, it will have some P character. If I ask you, what is the percentage of S character in this hybrid orbital? What is the percentage of S character in this hybrid orbital? So one S orbital was used for intermixing divided by total orbitals were 2 multiplied by 100. So 50% of S character is here in one of the S in one of the SP hybrid orbitals, right? If 50% is S character, that means the remaining 50% P character. So SP hybrid orbital will have equal characters of S orbital and P orbital. Am I clear? Am I clear people? Let me take one more example. Let me take one more example. Look at this particular example. Now you are going to write everything in the chats. You are going to write everything in the chats. Over here, the, the central atom is boron. How many valence electrons boron has? How many valence electrons boron has? Quickly. Atomic number 5, 2,3. Three valence electrons. How many surrounding atoms? Three surrounding atoms. Number of surrounding atoms is equal to number of sigma bonds. How many lone pairs? There were three valence electrons. And all the three have been used for three sigma bonds. So no lone, no lone pair. Steric number. Sigma plus lone pair. 3 plus 0 is 3. Right? Hybridation involved. Sp2. Right? Geometry predicted through hybridation. That is trigonal planar. This is something which I concluded till now, till now. Okay. This is something which I conclude till now. Now comes a point. How the formation has taken place. How the molecule will look like exactly. So if I talk about boron, its outermost configuration is 2s2, 2p1. 2s2, 2p1. So two electrons here. And in case of p, there is one electron. This is the ground state. Now make the excited state. If when you make the excited state, this one electron here, right? And people, there is one here, one here. This is the excited state. Now, which hybridization is taking place over here? SP2. So, this S and these two P orbitals will start intermixing. And since three atomic orbitals are intermixing, so three hybrid orbitals will get formed. Three hybrid orbitals will get formed, right? Three hybrid orbitals will get formed. Perfect. Now, those three hybrid orbitals, they'll arrange themselves in such a way that there are minimum repulsions between them. So, this is one of the hybrid orbital. This is one more hybrid orbital. And this is one more hybrid orbital. And all the hybrid orbitals are containing one one electron each. Okay. Now, boron has to form bond with fluorine. Fluorine's configuration is 2p5. Right? Uh, so this is 3p5, sorry. Okay. This is 3p5 in case of chlorine. Mistakenly, I wrote 2p5. Right? Okay. Perfect. Now, <clears throat> boron has to form bonds with fluorine. If you talk about fluorine, fluorine configuration is 2p5. 2p5. In 2p5, there is one unpaired p, p orbital. One unpaired p orbital. So I would say, I would say, I would say, one of the p orbital of fluorine will come from this side and will show the overlap, right? One more will come from this side, will show the overlap. One more will come from this side, will show the overlap. Which overlap this is? All these overlaps are basically head-on overlaps, right? This is basically your overlap between sp2 hybrid orbital of boron with pure p orbital of fluorine this is again the same this is again the same how do i represent it at the end how do i represent it at the end so boron this is fluorine this is fluorine and this is fluorine this particular geometry is what you call as trigonal planar geometry and over here over here the angle is 120 degree if i'm clear let me know once in the chats <clears throat> done Done and dusted people? Is it clear? Is it clear quickly? Quickly guys. Now I do not sh need to show all these stuff here again and again. Okay. I hope this particular part is clear. Right. This particular part is clear. Now I'm directly showing you the examples. Right? I'm directly showing you the examples. You just need to tell me the hybridization, etc, etc. Okay. Carbon. How many valence electrons? Four. How many surrounding atoms? Four. 
How many lone pairs? Zero. Steric number? Four plus zero? Four. Hybridization? SP3. Geometry which is predicted through hybridization? That is tetrahedral. If it is tetrahedral, tetrahedral looks like this. This is C. This is H. This is H. This is one more H. This is one more H. The bond angle over here is 109 degree, 28 minutes. Perfect. Now, now I'm asking you a question. I'm asking you a question. Take any of the bond, any of the bond. Take this bond. Can you tell me this bond has got formed by what kind of overlap? What is the overlap happened here? It is sp3 hybrid orbital of carbon with pure s orbital of hydrogen. sp3s, 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 sp3s. Everywhere the overlap is same. So all the bond lengths in case of CH4 are supposed to be same, which are same actually, right? Perfect. Perfect guys, perfect. Okay, PCL5. <clears throat> PCL5. PCL5. Phosphor is the central atom. How many valence electrons? Five. Surrounding atoms? Five. Lone pairs on phosphors? Zero. Steric number? Five. Hybridization? SP3D. Geometry predicted hybridization? Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Right? Now how it looks like? This is P. One chlorine, one more chlorine, and one more chlorine. And these three chlorine atoms, including phosphorus, these three chlorine atoms, including phosphorus, they are present on one plane. They are present on one plane, which is what you call as equatorial plane. This plane containing phosphorus and these three atoms, this plane is called as equatorial plane. Now, 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 Perpendicular to the plane upwards, perpendicular to the plane upwards, there is one more chlorine. Perpendicular to the plane downwards, there is one more chlorine, right? And these two bonds, which I've shown with yellow color, these are what you call as axial bonds. These are what you call as axial bonds. These are what you call as axial bonds. And all the bonds which are present on the equatorial plane, those are what you call as equatorial bonds. For example, this one. This one is what I call as equatorial bond. Right? And my dear students, at the end, at the end, if I just do one thing, if I just do one thing, if I join this with this, right? If I join this with this, right? If I join this with this, yes. If I join this with this, right? If I join this with this, correct? If I join this with this, this particular, this geometry is what you call as trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal geometry. I hope it is clear to everyone. Yeah? Am I clear people? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? <clears throat> yeah? Perfect. Yeah, it's a styly geometry, right? It's a styly geometry. Okay, if I ask you one question here, think over it and let me know. Think over it. Yes, can you tell me what is going to be the bond angle in the equatorial plane? So basically, I'm asking you, what is the angle between? What is the angle between this equatorial and this equatorial? Angle between this equatorial and this equatorial bond, it is going to be 120 degree. If I ask you what is the angle between this axial and this equatorial, axial equatorial bond angle, that will be 90 degree. If I ask you what is the bond angle between axial and axial, 180 degree. If I ask you how many 120 degrees are there, how many 120 degrees? This is 120, this 120, this 120. So there are three 120 degree angles. If I ask you how many 90 degrees are there, this is forming 90 degree with this, 90 degree with this, 90 degree with this. So three from upside, three from downside. So six 90 degrees, right? How many 180 degrees are there? One 180 degree. Okay. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yes. Moving ahead. This was PCL5. Now, talking about SF6. <clears throat> talking about SF6. How many valence electron sulfur has? Six. Surrounding atoms, 6, lone pairs, 6 minus 6, 0, steric number, 6 plus 0, 6, hybridization, 
sp3 d2 geometry predicted through hybridization that is octahedral that is octahedral right that is octahedral now how it looks like have a look have a look understand understand octahedral geometry how it looks like this is your sulfur present here this is your sulfur it is forming one of the bond with fluorine here it is forming one more bond with fluorine here it is forming one more bond with fluorine here it is forming one more bond with fluorine here so on this equatorial plane how many bonds are there four bonds right this is your equatorial plane right now from the top perpendicular upwards fluorine from the bottom perpendicular downwards fluorine correct right people now 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 have a look over here if i join this with this at the same time if i join this with this this with this and this with this correct similarly joining these two similarly joining these two similarly joining these two similarly joining it with this one this particular geometry is what you call as octahedral geometry this is what you call as octahedral geometry octahedral geometry now 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 if i ask you which d orbitals are involved here it is dz square and dx square minus y square okay this geometry is what you call as octahedral look at all the bond angles look at all the bond angles people if i ask you what is the bond angle between equatorial and equatorial 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 this bond angle this will be 90 right bond angle between axial and equatorial axial and equatorial it will be 90 bond angle between axial and axial it will be what it will be 180 now i'm asking you a question now i'm asking you a question how many 90 degrees are there how many 90 degrees are there quickly how many 90 degrees are there first of all this is 90 this is 90 this is 90 this is 90 so four 90s on the equatorial plane right now this forming 90 with this 90 with this 90 with this 90 with this so four from top four from bottom right so four four eight four twelve so twelve 90 degrees okay if I ask you how many 180 degrees are there? How many 180 degrees are there? How many 180 degrees are there? Between axial and axial, 180. Now, between this equatorial and this equatorial, 180. Between this equatorial and this equatorial, 180. So, there are three 180 degrees. Yes, there are three 180 degrees. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. Right? I have seven. Iodine being the central atom. How many valence electrons? Seven. Sigma bonds, 7. Lone pairs, 0. Steric number, 7. Hybridization, sp3d3. Which d orbitals? dz square, dx square minus y square, and dxy. Right? Geometry predicted through hybridization, pentagonal, bipyramidal. How it looks like? How it looks like? How it looks like? This is iodine at the center. Iodine at the, at the center. This is one of the fluorine. One more fluorine. One more fluorine. One more fluorine. One more fluorine. All these fluorine atoms, including iodine, they are present on one plane. Perpendicular upwards. One fluorine perpendicular downwards. One more fluorine. Right? And when you join them, you call this geometry as pentagonal bipyramidal geometry. Pentagonal bipyramidal geometry. Now, people, if I ask you something. The angle between equatorial equatorial, the angle between equatorial equatorial, there is going to be 72 degree. The angle between axial and equatorial, that is 90 degree, right? The angle between axial and axial, that is 180 degree. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Am I clear, people? <clears throat> Am I clear? Am I clear? Now tell me, these are few questions which I have for all of you. Tell me for this. BCL2. This you can make on your own. C2H6. C2H6. Make it like this. We see. C2. This is H6. C2. This is H6. Carbon. How many sigma it's forming? It's forming 4 sigma. 4 sigma. That means it will have no lone pair. Steric number is 4. Hybridization is sp3. Similarly, this will have sp3 hybridization. Simple. Carbon dioxide. You know it. Carbon dioxide. Perfect. This carbon. It's hybridization. It's hybridization. It's forming how many sigma? 2 sigma. It's forming 2 sigma. How many valence electrons it had? 
how many valence electrons it had four but it's forming four bonds as well so all the four valence electrons have been used right so lone pair is zero steric number is steric number is two plus zero two hybridation involved is sp done understood right <coughs> sp okay c to h4 this is your c to h4 tell me how many valence electrons carbon has four how many sigma it's forming it's forming three sigma one two and three three sigma how many lone pairs it has it had four valence electrons and it is using all the four valence electrons see one two three four four all the four are used so lone pair zero steric number sigma plus lone pair sigma plus lone pair three hybridation sp2 yes similarly h2o h2o oxygen how many valence electrons six right how many valence electrons six or let me make it directly or okay have a look valence electron six how many surrounding atoms two right so out of six valence electrons two have been used to form two sigma bonds so there are four electrons left as such there are four electrons left as such on oxygen on in the form of two lone pairs so sigma plus lone pair steric number is four if steric number is four hybridization involves sp3 geometry which is predicted through hybridization geometry which is predicted through hybridization i'm not talking about the actual shape i'm talking about the geometry which is predicted through hybridization that is that's sp3 right tell me oh, acha pcl5 we are done sf4 quick sf4 <clears throat> SF4. SF4. Quick. <clears throat> quick, people. <clears throat> SF4. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Guys, you have to be super fast. You need to be super fast. Perfect. Will be done. Four sigma bonds, one lone pair. Steric number is five. Steric number five means SP3D. Geometry predicted through hybridization is a uh, trigonal bipyramidal. Dusted. Okay. XCO2F2. See, 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 what do you do in this particular case? This is a special case. Why is that? Whenever you see oxygen as the surrounding atom, whenever you see oxygen as the surrounding atom, at that point of time, there's something which you need to do. See, valence electrons in xenon are eight. Surrounding atoms are four. Surrounding atoms are four. Assume, now assume certain things. Assume certain things. Oxygen is a surrounding atom. It's a divalent. It's divalent. So normally, what do we see? Divalent atoms, they found two bonds, right? So these two oxygens, understand it like this. Remember it like this. These two oxygens will form four. 4 plus 2 is 6. So out of 8 valence electrons, 6 have been used. So there'll be 2 valence electrons on xenon in the form of a lone pair. Right? In the form of a lone pair. Now steric number. 4 plus 1, 5. This is sp3d. <coughs> Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Am I clear, people? <coughs> yes? Quickly, quickly. <clears throat> Tell me the answer of this one quickly. BRF5. Hybridization of BR. Hybridization of BR. Hybridization of bromine. <clears throat> Hybridization of bromine. Hybridization of bromine. Five sigma bonds, one lone pair, right? SP3D2. XCF4. XCF4. Quick, quick. You have to be very quick. XCF4. XCF4. Quick. Mm. Done. Four sigma, two lone pairs. SP3D2. Perfect. 
XCOF4, XCOF4, everyone, XCOF4. XCOF4. Look here, oxygen here is not the central atom. Oxygen is a surrounding, right? So one oxygen, you have to consider two bonds. Done? Sudhir, I'm sorry, I need to block you, bro. You're creating a lot of here in the chats. Yeah. God bless you. Hello. XCOF4. Done? Perfect. So I believe whenever a question comes from hybridization, geometry, steric number, bond angle between axial axial, number of number of bond angles, etc. etc. I hope this should be a cakewalk for all of you. Yeah. Am I done? Say it in the chats, everyone. And trust me, sure short question will be there from hybridization. Sure short question. Yeah. Perfect. Now comes your valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Valence shell electron pair a repulsion theory. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. This is again one very important topic. Oh, this again one very important topic. Valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. My dear students, one thing. One thing. I'm not going to write the postulates, etc. etc. Right? I'll show you the direct application part so that you can solve the question in lesser time. That's all. Right? So we will, for example, I'm making NH3 molecule here. This is your NH3 molecule. This is your NH3, you know it. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Out of five, it has used three of its valence electrons to form three bonds. So two electrons will be there on nitrogen in the form of a lone pair, right? In the form of a lone pair. Perfect. Now, my dear students, this is something which you call as non-bonded pair or lone pair, right? This is something which you call as bond pair. So basically, in the molecule, you have got lone pairs and bond pairs. In the molecule, you have got lone pairs and bond pairs. As per VSCPR, lone pairs plus bond pairs, they are called as basically total valence electron pairs. Total valence electron pairs, right? They are called as total valence electron pairs. Now, as per VSCPR, as per VSCPR, the molecule tries to acquire, the molecule tries to acquire that shape, that shape in which the molecule tries to acquire that shape in which, in which repulsions, in which repulsions between the valence electron pairs are minimized are minimized molecule tries to acquire that shape in which the repulsions between the valence shell electron pairs are minimized and once the repulsions are minimized we say stability is maximized stability is maximized so basically your valence shell electron pair repulsion theory it gives you the idea about the actual shape of the molecule. It gives you the idea about the actual shape of the molecule. Okay? Now try to understand how exactly. Try to understand how exactly. But before that, one thing. There was a question asked long back. 
order of repulsions you remember lone pair lone pair repulsions are maximum followed by you know it lone pair bond pair followed by bond pair bond pair followed by bond pair bond pair this is the order of repulsions right lone pair lone pair repulsions are considered to be maximum followed by lone pair bond pair followed by half mod followed by bond pair bond okay now see exactly how i'm going to utilize this via cpr and it will solve a lot of our issues try to understand <clears throat> the first case i'm writing over here what is that i'm writing if steric number if steric number is equal to 3 if steric number is equal to 3 you know if steric number is 3 you know if steric number is 3 the geometry predicted through hybridization is trigonal planar you know it for steric number 3 geometry predicted through hybridization is hybridization is trigonal planar now guys what is steric number sigma plus lone pair so there are two possibilities here there are two possibilities here if there are three sigma and zero lone pairs second if there are two sigma and zero lone pairs sorry and one lone pair sigma plus lone pair is three sigma plus lone pair is three so steric number in both the in both the ones is three right steric number three steric number three now first of all that molecule wherein the central atom is forming three sigma bonds and has got zero lone pair we say the type of the molecule is a b 3 l 0 a is the central atom three sigma bonds zero lone pair the type of this molecule is going to be a b 2 l 1 a b 2 l 1 do remember do remember do remember when the central atom when the central atom does not have any lone pair does not have any lone pair at that point of time whatever was the geometry predicted to hybridization that is the actual shape of the molecule so when geometry and shape are same when central atom does not have any lone pair right over here central atom is not having any lone pair l0 so geometry predicted through hybridization is the actual shape right i'll say in this particular case your shape and geometry is same and both are what trigonal planar and how do you represent it this is a this is b this is b and this is b this is your trigonal planar geometry am i clear i should be clear sigma 2 lone pair 1 sigma 2 lone pair 1 lone pair 1 what is the geometry which is predicted through hybridization that is trigonal planar but what about the shape what about the shape what about the shape make the geometry first geometry is trigonal trigonal planar right so this a this is b this is b this is b i made the geometry right this a b3 type now do one thing remove one of the bond pair and place a lone pair remove one of the bond pair place a lone pair so two sigma one lone pair two sigma one lone pair now if i ask you just hide this lone pair when you hide this lone pair how this molecule looks like when you hide this lone pair how this molecule looks like bent it looks bent so its actual shape is bent Am I clear with this? This was your first case wherein steric number is 3. Wherein steric number is 3. Right? Second. Second. If steric number is 4, hybridization will be sp3. Geometry predicted through hybridization is tetrahedral. Geometry predicted through hybridization is tetrahedral. Now, now, now. Now. Understand? Understand people. When can be steric number four? There are few cases which arise. First case, if there are four sigma bonds and zero lone pair. Second one, if there are three sigma bonds and one lone pair. Third one, if there are two sigma bonds and two lone pairs. In all these cases, steric number will be four, right? In all these cases, steric number will be four. In the first one, that uh, what is the type of the molecule? Type of the molecule here will be AB4L0. Here is going to be AB three L one, and here is going to be AB two L two. AB two L two, right? AB two L two. AB two L two. Now, people, let me ask you certain things. Over here, lone pairs are zero, so geometry predicted through hybridization is the, basically the actual shape of the molecule, and both are tetrahedral. And how do you show this tetrahedral molecule? This is A, this is B, this is B, this is B, and this is B. 
this AB4 tetrahedral. Okay. Now AB3 L1. Geometry already we know that's tetrahedral, but shape won't be tetrahedral because there's a lone pair associated with the central atom, right? So how do you make the shape? Just do one thing. Make the geometry first. Make the geometry first. Now uh, remove one lone pair. Uh, remove one lone. Remove one bond pair. And instead of that, put a lone pair. Now do you see three sigma one lone pair? Just hide this lone pair. How it looks like? It looks like a pyramid, right? Actual shape of this particular molecule of the type AB3L1. It's pyramidal. It is pyramidal, right? It is pyramidal. It's pyramidal. AB2L2. Geometry is geometry is tetrahedral. Geometry is tetrahedral. What about the shape? Make the geometry first. Make the geometry first. Right? Make the geometry first. There are four sigma zero lone pairs. Now I have to introduce two lone pairs. So I'll be removing. I'll be removing two, two bond pairs and place two lone pairs. So this A, for example, this B, for example, this B, one lone pair is here, one lone pair is here. Right? So this is AB to L2 type. What will be the actual shape? Actual shape of the molecule will be. What is it going to be? Quickly, it's V-shaped. It's V-shaped. Right? It's V-shaped. Yeah? All right, moving ahead. So this was your steric number four, guys. Okay, now steric number five. Steric number five. Steric number five means hybridization is sp3d, right? Hybridization is sp3d. Geometry which is predicted through hybridization that is trigonal bipyramidal. That is trigonal bipyramidal. Now tell me the cases, people. Tell me the cases. Tell me the cases quick. Tell me the cases. The first case which is involved here. That will be 5 sigma, 0 lone pair. The second case which is involved, 4 sigma, 1 lone pair. The third case which is involved, 3 sigma, 2 lone pairs. The fourth case which is involved, 2 sigma and 3 lone pairs. These are the possible cases which arise over here. These are the possible cases which arise over here. Now people, what is the type of this molecule? Tell me quickly. AB5L0. This is AB4L1. This is AB3L2. And this is AB2L3. Yes. Type is done. What is the geometry everywhere? Tell me the geometry everywhere. Geometry predicted through hybridization. Geometry predicted through hybridization. Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Trigonal bipyramidal. Right? First one does not contain any lone pair. So it will be its actual shape as well. And how you represent it. This is A. This is B. This is B. This is B. Present in the equatorial plane. One more B and one more B. Right? This is your pentagonal, bi trigonal bipyramidal geometry. Trigonal bipyramidal. Now, what about the shape of this one? AB4L1. AB4L1. What do I do? I'll remove one of the bond pair here. Place a lone pair. I'll remove one of the bond pair here. Place a lone pair. See how. I'll remove one of the bond pair and instead of that, I'll place a lone pair. If you, if you hide this lone pair, how it looks like? It looks like a seesaw shape. So, it's a seesaw shaped one. It's a seesaw shaped, right? Look at this one. AB3L2. AB3L2. This is A, right? 
B3L2. AB3L2. So, I'll be doing what? AB3L2. I'll be doing what? I'll be removing two bond pairs and place two lone pairs there. So, let me remove these two bond pairs and place two lone pairs. This is AB3L2. Now, hide these lone pairs. How it looks like? It looks like a T-shaped molecule. So, its actual shape is T-shaped. What about the next one? AB3, sorry, AB2L3. AB2L3. This is A, right? AB2L3. So, three lone pairs are the equal positions. This is B and this is B. Hide these. It looks like linear. It's a linear one. Perfect. Its shape is linear. I hope I'm clear. I hope I'm clear to everyone. Done, people? Okay. So, moving on to one more. This was steric number 5. Now, I'm going to move on to steric number 6. You tell me. Steric number 6. Tell me everything. Steric number 6. Hybridization. Quick. In the chats. Steric number 6. Hybridization. SP3D2. Geometry predated through hybridization. That is? That is octahedral, right? That is octahedral. Now, tell me what all possible cases arise here. What all possible cases arise here, people? The first one. The first one. Sigma 6, lone pair 0. Second one. Sigma 5, lone pair 1. Third one. Sigma 4, lone pair 2. These are the three possibilities which arise over here. These are the three possibilities which arise over here. Now, First thing, the type of this molecule is AB6L0, this is AB5L1, this is AB4L2. Yes. Geometry. What is the geometry which is predicted through hybridization everywhere? Geometry predicted through hybridization is octahedral, 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 right? This is going to be its actual shape as well because there is no lone pair. So this is A, this is B, this is B. And this is B, this is B, this is B on this side, this is B on this is your octahedral geometry, right? Perfect. You know the equatorial axial, etc. etc. We have discussed that. Now, guys, one thing. Over here, AB5, L1. AB5, L1. What I'll be doing? In the geometry, I'll be removing one of the bond pairs. Right? I'm removing one of the bond pairs. And in place of that, I'm keeping a lone pair. In place of that, I'm keeping a lone pair. In place of that, I'm keeping a lone pair. This is AB5, L1. Hide this lone pair, how it looks like. This is a square here in the equatorial plane. It is a square pyramid, right? It looks like a square pyramid. So square pyramidal shape. Square pyramidal shape. Now, AB4L2, AB4L2, this A, this is B, this is B, this is B, and this is B. One lone pair here, one lone pair here. Hide these lone pairs, how it looks like. It looks like a square planar shape, right? It's a square planar shape. Square planar shape. Yes? <clears throat> it's a square planar shape. Perfect. Now comes the last, that is steric number 7. Steric number 7, hybridization sp3d3, sp3d3, geometry is going to be pentagonal bipyramidal, geometry is going to be pentagonal bipyramidal. Now, the first case here, the first case here, first case, 7 sigma, 0 lone pair. Second one is six sigma, one lone pair. These are the two cases which arise here. These are the two cases which arise here. Tell me the type first of all. This is AB7L0. 
this is ab6 l1 right over here geometry and shape both are pentagonal bipyramidal this is a this is for example b this is b this is b this is b and this is b right so it looks like a right it looks like a plane now this is one b here one b here so pentagonal bipyramidal one pyramid from the top one from the bottom okay perfect now a b 6 l 1 so remove one of the bond pair remove one of the bond pair and place a lone pair right remove c first of all geometry over here is pentagonal bipyramidal what about the actual shape this is a this is b here this is b this is b this is b right place a lone pair now lone pair will be here but lone pair won't be present on this plane right it will be above or below the plane lone pair will be above or below the plane right lone pair will be above or below the plane it won't be present on the same plane so this is b over here this is b over here how it looks like how it looks like hide this lone pair it looks like octahedron and we call this as distorted octahedron distorted octahedron right guys tell me now if any question is asked from this will you be able to solve it will you be able to solve it will you be able to solve it quickly if yes tell me the answer of all these everything 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 bcl2 quick let me sit for 2 minutes and solve right Someone is asking why this is happening, why that is happening. You do not have time for why right now. Whatever I'm telling you, remember it. Okay, BCL2. If you have got BCL2, guys. BCL2. First of all, how many sigma bonds? Two sigma bonds. How many lone pairs? How many lone pairs? Zero lone pairs. Steric number? Steric number is two. Type of the molecule is AB2L0. AB2L0, geometry predicted through hybridization. That is, that is linear. Hybridization is sp. Central atom does not have any lone pair, right? So shape also is shape also is linear. So all these things can be done now. All these things can be done now easily, easily, guys, right? Right? For example, you have got SF four. For example, you have got SF four. How many sigma it's forming? Four sigma. How many lone pairs on sulfur? One lone pair. Steric number 4 plus 1 5 hybridization sp3d geometry a trigonal bipyramidal trigonal bipyramidal type of the molecule ab4l1 ab4l1 shape shape ab4l1 is seesaw shaped correct yes uh, what else do we have let's say we have got nh4 positive <clears throat> nh4 positive if I ask you how many valence electrons with nitrogen, it has 5, but there's a positive charge. So 5 minus 1 is 4. Sigma bonds are 4, right? Lone pairs, 0. Steric number, 4 plus 0, 4. Hybridization, sp3. Type of the molecule, AB4L0. AB4L0. Geometry predicted through hybridization, that is tetrahedral. Shape, actual shape, that is also tetrahedral. So I believe all these type of questions you can do now. Is it looking easy now? Trust me, if you got to know how to do this, you are done. <clears throat> yeah? Perfect, perfect, perfect. These three are all asked questions in your NEET and JE. This has been many a times repeated in JE mains. I3 negative. Give me all the data about I3 negative. See, these two you can do easily. We have done them. I3 negative. Give me all the data about I3 negative. First of all, I3 negative, you can write it like this. I, I2 negative. You can write it like this. I, I2 negative. Correct? Yes? Now, call this a central atom. How many valence electrons? 7. There is a negative charge, so 7 plus 1 is 8. Okay? Sigma bonds? 2. Lone pairs? Out of 8, 2 are used. So 6 will be as such in the form of 3 lone pairs. Steric number, 3 plus 2, 5. Hybridization, sp3d. Right? Type of the molecule, ab2l3. Geometry predicted through hybridization, 
ज्योमेट्री प्रेडिक्टेड थ्रू हाइब्रिडेशन ट्राइगोनल बाई पेरामिडल एक्चुअल शेप एक्चुअल शेप ए बी टू एल थ्री मीन्स लीनियर यस एम आई क्लियर एम आई क्लियर एम आई क्लियर क्विक राइट बीबल now 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 a short short question a short short question which is asked about the bond angle it is asked about bond angle here i am going to give you one table guys here i am going to give you one table just remember that just remember that table i am going to give you one table and you need to remember that and whenever a question is asked from the bond angle you are done Yeah, your life is sorted if you remember that table. Okay. So, look at this table carefully, guys. Look at this particular table carefully. Look at this particular table carefully. This table is used. when a question is asked about the bond angle when a question is asked about the bond angle just give me a second why there is no electricity <clears throat> okay my dear students whenever you have to compare the bond angles whenever you have to compare the bond angles first thing that should strike your mind via cpr first thing we a cpr so whatever molecules will be given with first check is there any molecule of the type ab to l0 or ab to l3 if there was any molecule of the type ab to l0 ab to l3 they will have maximum bond angle of 180 they will have maximum bond angle of 180 first you need to check through we a cpr if you see any molecule of the type ab to l0 or ab to l3 maximum bond angle of 180 right right then if you are unable to decide from via cpr if there was no molecule which of the, which was of the type ab to l0 ab to l3 then you will move on to hybridization then you will move on to hybridization right if hybridization of the molecules were different you know in sp 180 sp2 120 sp3 109 right then sp will have maximum bond angle followed by sp2 followed by sp3 if hybridization of the central atom is different you let's say you are given three molecules i'm showing you examples in some time if you are given with three molecules and you calculate the hybridization of the central atom everywhere right if one central atom has got sp another one has got sp2 another one has got sp3 sp will have maximum bond angle right sp will have maximum bond angle yeah now if hybridization is different if hybridization is different if hybridization is different then i break it into two parts then i break it into two parts number 1 if lone pair is absent at the central atom if lone pair is absent at the central atom you will give the answer as per hybridization for example you have got bf3 understand bf3 bcl3 and bi3 bf3 bcl3 bi3 understand hybridization here is sp2 hybridization here is sp2 hybridization is in sp2 no lone pair no lone pair give your answer as per hybridization since hybridization is same so bond angle will be same bond angle will be same if hybridization is same if hybridization is same if hybridization is same and there was a lone pair on the central atom if hybridization is same and there was lone pair on the central atom if hybridization is same and there was lone pair present on the central atom then bond angle is inversely proportional lone pair bond angle is inversely proportional number of lone pairs more lone pairs lesser bond angle if hybridization is same and there was a lone pair present everywhere there was a lone pair present everywhere on the central atom remember bond angle will be inversely proportional number of lone pairs you will see its application in some time now if hybridization as well as number of lone pairs are same let's say you are given three molecules hybridization same For the central atom, number of lone pairs on the central atom also same. Then two things arise here. 
रिमेम्बर बॉन्ड एंगल इज डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल टू साइज ऑफ द सराउंडिंग एटम बॉन्ड एंगल इज डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल टू साइज ऑफ द सराउंडिंग एटम रिमेम्बर बॉन्ड एंगल इज इनवर्सली प्रोपोर्शनल टू हेयर साइज ऑफ द सेंट्रल एटम what mistake you do normally you only remember these two things you only remember these two things or this is the actual table whatever question comes from the bond angle you are done have a look have a look bond angle here is directly proportional to size of surrounding atom bond angle here is inversely proportional to size of central atom whatever question is asked you are done sorted for life have a look people carbon dioxide no2 positive xcf2 First of all, we have CPR. If there is any molecule of the type AB two L three or AB four L two, right? See, guys. See, this is of the type AB two L zero. This is of the type AB two L zero. This is of the type AB two. What AB two? AB two L three. AB two L three. Right. Already, I have told you, AB two L zero, AB two L three. They have got the maximum bond angle of one eighty. So all the three, all the three here, they have equal bond angles, and all the bond angles here will be one eighty. Done. Look at the next one. First, check the type of the molecule. This is AB two L zero. This is AB three L zero. This is AB four L zero. There is no one here as Ah uh, yes, yes, wait. We have got AB two L zero here, and AB two L zero as per V S C P R will have maximum bond angle. So carbon dioxide will have maximum bond angle. AB two L zero, perfect. AB two L zero. Now is there any AB two L three? No. So leave it, leave leave it aside. Now go to hybridization. This S P, this S P two, this S P three. Hybridization is different. Hybridization is different. You go for hybridization. Hybridization is different. SP will have maximum. SP will have maximum. SP will have maximum. Followed by BF three. Followed by CH four. Done. Go to the next one. First, AB four L zero. AB three L one. AB two L two. Is there any one which resembles with AB two L zero or AB two L three? No, nothing like that. So we are unable to. Judge on the basis of VSC pair, leave VSC pair. Talk about hybridization. SP three. This is also SP three. This is also SP three. Why? Because there are two lone pairs here on oxygen. There are there is one lone pair here. There is no lone pair here. Hybridization is same. Do you see? Hybridization is same. Hybridization is same. And and there are lone pairs on the central atom. Hybridization is same. And there is lone pair on the central atom. Bond angle is inversely proportional to number of lone pairs. More the lone pairs, more the lone pairs, lesser the bond angle. More the lone pairs, lesser the bond angle. Done. Do you see the technique? Do you see the technique, people? B C L three, B B R three, B I three. This is A B three L zero, A B three L zero, and A B three L zero as well, right? So there is no one of the type either A B two L zero or A B. Or AB two L three. So leave E S C P R. Talk about hybridization. Talk about hybridization. S P two S P two S P two. Hybridization is also same. Hybridization is same. And when hybridization is same, and there is no lone pair on the central atom. When hybridization is same, there is no lone pair on the central atom. Give your answer as per hybridization. Give your answer as per hybridization. This is S P two. This is S P two. This is S P two. Same bond angle, right? Same bond angle. Yes. Got it, people? Moving ahead, moving ahead. Tell me the answer of the fifth one. I want to see whether you got it or not. Tell me the answer of the fifth one, people. Tell me the answer of the fifth one quickly. Tell me the answer of the fifth one. CCL four, SiCl four, GCl four. Quickly, quickly! I want everyone to answer it. Type everywhere is same. AB four L zero, AB four L zero, AB four L zero. Hybridization is same. SP three, SP three, SP three. 
there is no lone pair on the central atom. So all will have same bond angles. Same. All will have same bond angles. NCl3, PCl3, ACl3, SBCl3. Hybridization everywhere is same. SP3. And hybridization as well as the lone pair on the central atom is same. Hybridization as well as the lone pair on the central atom is same. And you know, when hybridization and lone pair both are same. You know, when hybridization and lone pair. When hybridization and lone pair both are same. Then talk about these two factors. Talk about these two factors. Bond angle is inversely proportional to size of central atom. Bond angle is inversely proportional to size of central atom. Bond angle is inversely proportional to size of central atom. Right? Size of central atom is maximum here. So bond angle minimum. Tell me the answer of this one. Seventh one. Seventh one people. Seventh one. Quickly. Seventh one. Here in the seventh one, bond angle is directly proportional to size of surrounding atom. Bond angle is directly proportional to size of surrounding atom, right? Perfect, because hybridization as well as lone pairs, lone pairs are same. And you know bond angle is directly proportional to size of? Bond angle is directly proportional to size of? Bond angle is directly proportional to size of surrounding atom. Okay? Bond angle is directly proportional to size of surrounding atom. 3 to 1. Tell me the last one. Cl2O Br2. Cl2O Br2. Cl2O Br2. Quick. Cl2O Br2. See guys, oxygen here has got two lone pairs. Here also has two lone pairs. Hybridation involved is sp3. Hybridation of oxygen here is sp3. Hybridation same, lone pair same. Hybridization same, lone pair same. Right? Now, surrounding atom is different. Surrounding atom is different. More the size of surrounding atom. More the size of surrounding atom. More will the bond angle. Am I clear to everyone? From now onwards, if a question is asked from bond angle people, you should kill it. You must kill it. Yes? Are we done? A physical chemistry class 11th marathon will be uh, on uh, 10th, 11th, something like that. Perfect. Okay. Now comes the last topic of the chemical bonding that is your molecular orbital theory. Okay, molecular orbital theory. See, as I told you, I don't want to teach you in very depth. I just want to give you that amount of theory which is required to solve the questions. Right? Perfect. If you would have watched my one shot of chemical bonding, I have done this chapter in 9-10 hours, I believe. Right? But right now, as I told you already, only that much I'm teaching you which is required for the questions to be solved. That's all. That's all. So let's complete this MOT over here. Let's complete this MOT over here. Okay? See guys, as per molecular orbital theory is concerned, what happens basically? What happens? Molecular orbital theory says that atomic orbitals, atomic orbital. First of all, this molecular orbital theory, let me tell you, it is the extension of ABT. It is the extension of VBT. What VBT used to say? VBT used to say that atomic orbitals overlap. Atomic orbitals of the bonding atoms, they overlap, right? Atomic orbitals of the bonding atoms, they overlap. That VBT used to say. This theory says the similar stuff. This theory says that atomic orbitals of the bonding atoms, atomic orbitals of the bonding atoms, 
दे कंबाइन दे कंबाइन एंड दे लीड टू द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ वॉट दे लीड टू द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ मॉलिकुलर ऑर्बिटल एटॉमिक ऑर्बिटल्स कंबाइन लीड टू द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ मॉलिकुलर ऑर्बिटल्स वन विल बी कॉल्ड एज बॉन्डिंग मॉलिकुलर ऑर्बिटल अनदर वन विल बी कॉल्ड एज एंटी बॉन्डिंग मॉलिकुलर Atomic orbitals of the combining atoms, they combine, they lead to the formation of molecular orbitals. One will be called as bonding, one will be called as anti-bond. Number of atomic orbitals combined is equal to number of molecular orbitals formed. Here two atomic orbitals are combined. So two molecular orbitals are being formed. One is bonding, one is anti-bond. Let me tell you, energy of bonding is less, energy of anti-bonding is more. That means stability of anti-bonding is less, stability of bonding is more. Stability of bonding is more. Okay. This bonding, for example, for example, understand like this. Let's say I've got 1s orbital of one atom and similarly 1s orbital of another atom. 1s, 1s. Perfect. Now these 1s, 1s, they are combining. They are combining and they will lead to the formation of two molecular orbitals. One, be, one will be bonding. One will be bonding molecular orbital. Another one will be anti-bonding molecular orbital. Bonding molecular orbital I'll be representing here by sigma 1s. Anti-bonding I'll be representing was by sigma 1s star. Sigma 1s star. Sigma 1s star. Okay, sigma 1s star. Remember directly, bonding molecular orbital is formed through constructive interference. To in-phase interference. This is formed to destructive interference, right? To out of phase interference, right? Constructive interference leads to the formation of bonding. Destructive interference leads to the formation of anti bonding. Okay. Now, my dear students, understand and remember when two combining atoms, when their atomic orbitals combine, they lead to the formation of molecular orbitals. Once these molecular orbitals are formed, once these molecular orbitals are formed, then in these molecular orbitals, we have to fill the electrons. We will fill the electrons in the molecular orbitals. We'll fill the electrons in the molecular orbitals, which got generated. Which got generated. As per, as per a Bohr's principle, a Pauli's exclusion principle and as per Hund's rule. Once these molecular orbitals are generated, then we are going to start filling the electrons in those molecular orbitals as per what? As per your, as per Abbas principle, Pauli's exclusion principle, as well as the Hund's rule. As well as the Hund's rule. As well as the Hund's rule. And once we are done filling electrons in these molecular orbitals, then my dear students, the most important thing which is calculated here, that is bond order, which is calculated half of number of electrons in bonding molecular orbital minus the number of electrons in anti-bonding molecular orbital. This is the most important stuff here. And remember, if the bond order comes out to be 1, that means there is a single bond between the atoms. If the bond order comes out to be 2, that means there is a double bond involved between the two atoms. And if the bond order comes out to be 3, there is a triple bond involved. 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 Right? Let me tell you one more thing. Bond order is directly proportional to bond strength. Is directly proportional to bond dissociation energy. Is inversely proportional to bond length. Is inversely proportional to bond length. Question can either be asked on bond order or it can be asked on bond strength or bond dissociation energy or bond length. One more thing which I would want to tell you. If the bond order, if the bond order as per this formula comes out to be less or equal to zero, that means the molecule does not exist. Molecule does not exist or you say Molecule is non-viable. Molecule is non-viable. When? When the bond order comes out to be less than zero. Right? 
remember if the bond order of two species comes out to be same if the bond order of two species comes out to be same remember at that point of time at that point of time more the electrons in anti bonding molecular orbital more the electrons in anti bonding molecular orbital lesser is going to be the stability more the electrons in anti bonding molecular orbital lesser is going to be stability lesser is going to be stability when when is this case if the bond order is same if the bond order of two species is the same and 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 more electrons are present in anti bonding that species wherein more electrons are present in anti bonding bond a stability will be less stability will be less okay what else can be asked from this yeah next point which can be asked next point which can be asked if there were unpaired electrons if there were unpaired electrons in the molecular orbitals in the molecule there, are, there can be two cases either there will be paired electrons in all molecular orbitals right or there can be unpaired electron in some of the molecular orbitals if you see unpaired electron in if you see unpaired electron in the molecular orbital any molecular orbital do you remember that species is going to be paramagnetic this particular species is going to be diamagnetic this species is going to be diamagnetic and at the same time how do you calculate this magnetic moment magnetic moment is calculated by the formula under root of n into n plus 2 bohr magnetrons where n represents where n represents number of unpaired electrons in the molecular orbitals number of unpaired electrons in the molecular orbital okay okay now guys directly jump into the questions and kill all the questions first of all we'll see we'll see the electron filling order in those species which have got electrons up to 14 which have got electrons up to 14 see these are all the molecular orbitals, sigma 1s, sigma star 1s, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, pi 2px, pi 2py. And I have written all these molecular orbitals as per the increasing order of their energies. Why did I do that? Because Abbas principle says that electrons are to be filled in the increasing order of the energies. Right? So this order you have to remember first of all. And this order is valid only up to 14 electrons. This order is valid only up to 14 electrons. Now try to understand how exactly I'm going to use this order. Understand. In case of H2, in one hydrogen there is one electron, in two hydrogen there are two electrons. There are two electrons, right? Two electrons. Those two electrons will go here. So it is going to be sigma 1s2, sigma 1s2 configuration. All the starred 1s, the ones which have got star on them, they are anti bonding molecular orbital. The ones without star, they are bonding molecular orbital. So the configuration here is the molecular orbital configuration is sigma 1s2, right? This is all these are your molecular orbitals. This is P, right? Don't do this. Perfect. All these are molecular orbitals and every molecular orbital here can accommodate maximum of two electrons. All these molecular orbitals maximum can accommodate two electrons. Now guys understand. Sigma 1 is 2. Sigma 1 is 2. Over here total four electrons. So adjust those four electrons. Two here, two here. So this is sigma 1 is 2. Sigma star 1 is 2. Okay. 6 electrons in total. 6 electrons, 2 here, 2 here, 2 here. Right. So this is sigma 1 is 2. Sigma star 1 is 2. Sigma 2 is 2. 8 electrons in total. 8 electrons. 2, 4, 6. 2, 4, 6. 8. This is sigma 1 is 2. Sigma star 1 is 2. Sigma 2 is 2. Sigma star 2 is 2. Okay, I wrote the molecular orbital configurations of these species. After writing the molecular orbital configurations of these species, now what do I need to calculate bond order, which is half of number of electrons in bonding two minus anti bonding is zero, so the value comes out to be one. Bond order is one. If bond order is one, that means between two hydrogen atoms there is a single bond. Do you see any unpaired electron here? Every molecular orbital can adjust maximum of two electrons, and those two are full, right? So, this species is basically diamagnetic, 
If you ask me, it's magnetic moment, it's going to be zero. Over there, two electrons in bonding, two in anti-bonding. Calculate the bond order. It is half of number of electrons in bonding minus number of electrons in anti-bonding. Bond order is zero. So this molecule does not exist. Right? Li2. Li2. Calculate the bond order. Half of half of number of electrons in bonding, two, four. Minus anti-bonding, two. Four minus two is two. Two by two is one. So bond order is one. That means there is a single bond between two lithium atoms. Single bond between two lithium atoms, right? Look at the next one. Be2, eight electrons. Calculate the bond order. Calculate the bond order. Half of number of electrons in bonding, two, four. Minus anti-bonding, two, four. Right? The value comes out to be zero. Molecule does not exist. Non-viable. Non-viable molecule. Yes? Non-viable molecule. Yes? Right, people? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Talk about B2. One boron, atomic number 5, 5 electrons. So 5 twos are 10. So 2 here, 2 here, 2 here, 2 here. 2, 4, 8. Sorry, 2, 4, 6, 8. Right? 2, 4, 6, 8. 2, 4, 6, 8. 9, 10. Right? 9, 10. Because these are degenerate molecular orbitals. And pairing won't be done until each degenerate orbital gets 1, 1 electron each. Okay? So 10 electrons. Calculate the bond order. Half of. Number of electrons in bonding 2, 4, 5, 6. Minus anti-bonding 2, 4. Right? The value comes out to be 1. So in case of B2, there is a single bond. There is a single bond. Is there unpaired electron? Yes, this is unpaired, this is unpaired. There are two unpaired electrons. Two unpaired electrons. Calculate the magnetic moment. Under root of 2 into 2 plus 2. 2 plus 2 is to 4, 4 to 0, 8. Root 8 Bohr magnetrons. So, this particular species is paramagnetic. This particular species is paramagnetic in nature. Paramagnetic in nature. Okay. Talk about C2. Total 2 electrons. 10 we have already filled. Now, 11, 12. Right? So, calculate the bond order. Half of number of electrons in bonding 2, 4, 6, 8. Minus antibonding 2, 4. 8 minus 4 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So bond order is 2. So in case of C2, the bond order is 2. Is there any unpaired electron? No. Species is diamagnetic. Now C2, this is a special case. C2 is the only molecule. Let me tell you C2, it is the only molecule wherein both the bonds here are pi bonds. Otherwise, it should have been what? It should have been what? One should have been sigma, one should have been pi. But C2 is the only, only molecule which MOT says that it has got both the bonds as pi bonds. N2, 14 electron species, right? Already 12 we have filled. 12 and 2 makes it 14, right? So bond order you can calculate. Perfect. This will be half of. Number of electrons in bonding, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Minus anti-bonding, 2. 4. 10 minus 4 is 6. 6 by 2 is 3. So there is a triple bond. There is a triple bond. Is there any unpaired electron? There is no unpaired electron. So it is diamagnetic. Right? N2 positive. 14 minus 1, 13 electrons. 13 electrons. Bond order is equal to half of electrons. Bonding. 2, 4, 6, 8 and 1, 9. 1, 9. Because I am not going to consider 2. Because 1 electron has been taken out. It is N2 positive. Right? It is 13 electron. If it is 13 electron, one you have to remove. So how much it was? 2, 4, 6, 8, 9. Minus anti-bonding. 2, 4. Correct? 9 minus 4 is 5. This is 2.5. Perfect. Similarly, when you calculate this, it will also come out to be 2.5 only. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Quickly, am I clear? One question I have. One, uh, one question I have. I've got N2. I've got N2 positive. I've got N2 negative. Can you give me the order of their stability? Can you give me the order of their stability? More the bond order, more the stability. Bond order here is 3. Here it's 2.5. Here it's 2.5. So more the bond order, more the stability. So N2 will be maximum stable. Right? Now among N2 positive and N2 negative. Since bond order is same. Now you will write their molecular orbital configurations. And then you will see the number of antibonding electrons. 
more anti bonding electrons lesser stability anti bonding electrons are more in n2 negative right so least stable and n2 positive comes in the middle this is the stability order got it this is the stability order similarly guys this is the electron filling order of the species which contain more than 14 electrons accordingly same thing you need to do here accordingly same thing you need to do here this is the electron filling order of those species which contains electrons greater than 14 okay greater than 14 greater than 14 there is one thing which i would want to tell you right now i hope you know what are isoelectronic species i hope you exactly know what are isoelectronic species tell me what are isoelectronic species isoelectronic species are the ones which have got same number of electrons and whenever you see isoelectronic species, do remember their bond order is same. Do remember their bond order is same. Do remember their bond order is same. Okay. There is a question asked from that as well. Calculate the bond order of NO positive and CN negative. NO positive, nitrogen 7, oxygen 8, subtract this positive charge. Carbon 6, right? Carbon 6, nitrogen 7, negative charge. So add this one. So 8, 7, 15, minus 1, 14. This is a 14 electron species. 7, 6, 13, and 14, it's a 14 electron species. If electrons are same, for all the 14 electron species, they have got bond order 3, right? They have got bond order 3. And I hope you know the trick also to calculate the bond order. Perfect. Let me write the trick. If the total electrons are 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 13, 12, 11, 10, all the 14 electron species, they have got bond order 3. Now decrease by 0.5. Decrease by 0.5, 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 decrease by 0.5. This you can also use, right, in most of the cases. This you can also use in most of the cases. So, total electrons and their bond orders respectively. Okay, so with this our most important chapter from which expect four questions this year, right? Perfect. We are done with this. Now comes your periodic classification. But periodic classification will start after the break. Okay. We'll start after the break. Let's take a break. Because I'm not well, you know it. Right? You know what is my current fever? What is my current body temperature? Let me tell you. It is 102. Yeah? It is 102, guys. Trust me. <coughs> So you can intensity of how unwell I am. Trust me, I'm standing right now. I feel like my legs will break in between. It will break at the knees. Trust me on that. So I would need more breaks today. Okay. So we'll take, it's 2.50 right now. 3. Let's get back at 3.10. But I would want you guys to be back on time, huh? please. Because this is the only chapter which we have to do, periodic classification, and we are done. And we are done, okay? Periodic classification will not take more than two hours. Not more than two hours. And everything will be taught. Everything will be taught. Okay? P block, guys, listen. P block will do will do in class 12th in organic marathon. Today it's class 11th in organic marathon. Let me tell you once again. Yeah, it's class 11th in organic marathon today. Okay, but please and please everyone be back at 310. Because this is something very important from which two questions sure sure you'll get. Okay, I'll see you.
Is everyone back? Is everyone back? Is everyone back? Yes. <clears throat> Let's complete this chapter also, periodic classification, and we are done with class 11th in organic chemistry, guys. Okay? And tomorrow we'll have the extra question practice session. Perfect. Uh, oh, after watching these two sessions, today's session and tomorrow's session, you are not supposed to solve any other thing. Okay, that is more than sufficient. That is more than sufficient for you. That is more than sufficient for you. <clears throat> welcome back. Welcome back. Okay, have you studied this chapter before? <clears throat> have you studied this particular chapter before? Tell me once in the chats. Tell me once in the chats. Have you studied this chapter before? <clears throat> yeah? I know you have studied this for 9 hours, huh? But I'll complete it in just 2 hours. This is the easiest of all the chapters. You should know it. This is the easiest of all the chapters. You should know it. There is no need to remember all the elements in the period table. There is no need to remember all the elements in the period table. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <clears throat> okay. Let's start with the modern period table. I believe at least you would have seen the modern period table once. Right? This is your modern period table. This is your modern period table. You would have seen this, I believe. Now, my dear students, there is some general information which you need to know about the modern period table first. What is that general information? What is that general information? I'll be asking you the questions which I believe you all know, right? Can you let me know in the modern periodic table how many periods and how many groups are there? How many periods and how many groups are there? Quickly, everyone. This is something I believe everybody would be knowing, right? There are seven periods here and there are 18 groups. There are 18 groups in total, right? If you see, this is your period 1, this is your period 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So these horizontal rows over here are called as periods. So you have got 7 periods in the period table, right? And how many groups? Groups are these vertical verticals one, right? This is your group 1, this is group 2, this is group 3, group 4. So in total we have got 18 groups, perfect. My dear students, this periodic table, the modern periodic table we have, how many blocks are there? It is divided into four blocks. It is divided into four blocks. You should know it. Okay. S block, P block, D block, and F block. Okay. If you see these two groups, the first two groups, the first two groups over here combinedly is called as S block. It contains your S block. What about P block? Group 13 to the final group. Group 13 till 18, right? It is your P block. It is your P block, right? 
perfect and this remaining part it is your d block and something which is excluded i mean these two they consist of your f block elements perfect the first series over here is called as lanthanide series starting from 57 the second series over here is called as actinide series this is the general information about what this is the general information about the period table so basically what you have to remember over here in the period table first of all this period table the modern period table which we have it is based on bohorbury's electronic configuration right it is based on the bohorbury's electronic configuration concept and as per atomic number now the point is this model this modern period table this modern period table it was proposed by rang and werner and as per the modern period table is concerned it consists of seven periods and it consists of 18 groups and we divide this particular the modern period table into four blocks as i told you one is called as s block one is p one is d and one is f this is the general information about the modern periodic table right perfect this is all factual which you have to remember basically now what about the general configuration of s block elements p block elements d block elements and f block elements that general electronic configuration you will have to remember for sure that general electronic configuration you will have to remember for sure for example if i talk about s block elements your group one and group two they consist of what group one group two elements they are what you call as combinedly your s block elements right if you look at their general configuration their general can configuration is ns1 to 2 ns1 to 2 for example for example take the element let's say beryllium right take the element beryllium its atomic number is its atomic number is 4 right now its configuration is 1s2 1s2 2s2 perfect what is the highest principal quantum number over here highest principal quantum number is 2 so n value n stands for highest principal quantum number it's 2 it is 2 if you look at its outermost configuration outermost configuration it is 2s2 it is 2s2 perfect is 2s2 satisfying this n value is 2 s can be 1 or 2 2s2 is satisfying this perfect so your beryllium it is what it is an s block element if you know the general electronic configuration if you know the general electronic configuration of a particular block you can identify whether the element is from that block or not the way i did for example you have got let's say let's say you have got magnesium let's say you have got magnesium its atomic number is 12 its atomic number is 12 if you write its outermost configuration its outermost configuration is 3s2 its outermost configuration is 3s2 the maximum principal quantum number here is 3 right the maximum principal quantum number here is 3 right check is this is this 3s2 satisfying our general configuration ns1 to 2 n value if you put as 3 s can be 1 to 2 and here s is 2 right so this is your s block element perfect right for example talk about sodium talk about sodium its atomic number is how much 11 its atomic number is 11 if you write its outermost configuration it is 3s1 outer i mean the maximum principal quantum number here is 3 check whether this particular configuration is satisfying our general configuration or not it is satisfying n value is 3 s can be 1 or 2 and here i'm writing s1 s can be 1 or 2 perfect right so this is your what this is your s block element so my dear students what is something which i want you guys to remember here the general configuration of s block elements from now onwards is going to be ns 1 to 2 that's all okay ns 1 to 2 this is something which i want you guys to remember number one if I talk about P block elements, in case of the P block elements, in case of the P block elements, these are all your P block elements from your group 13 to group 18. These are your P block elements. My dear students, in case of your P block elements, the general configuration is what? NS2, NP1 to 6. You can check it. NS2, NP1 to 6. NS2, NP1 to 6. Take any element. For example, I'm taking carbon. If I take carbon, write its outermost configuration. 2S2, 2P2. What is the maximum principal quantum number here? Maximum principal quantum number n is equal to 2. n is equal to 2. Put this value of n over here. So 2s2, 
2p 1 to 6 it can be 1 it can be 2 it can be 3 it can be 4 it can be 5 or it can be 6 so this is satisfying it perfect this is satisfying it for example if i take let's say chlorine if i take chlorine its outermost configuration is 3s2 and 3p5 right what is the maximum principal quantum number here it is 3 put the value of n3 in the general configuration it becomes what it becomes 3s2 and 3p can be 1 to 6 it's containing 5 it can be 1 to 6 so it's satisfying it so basically this is your general outermost configuration of your p block elements which you have to remember it is what was s block ns1 to 2 p block is ns2 np1 to 6 ns2 np1 to 6 ns2 np1 to 6 these can be direct questions asked what is the general configuration of s block p block d block f block s block ns1 to 2 p block ns2 np1 to 6 p will contain 1 to 6 electrons right similarly if i talk about d block elements if i talk about d block elements the general outermost configuration of the d block elements is n minus 1 d 1 to 10 and ns can be 0 to 2 ns can be 0 to 2 for example take any element take iron take iron you know the outermost configuration of iron 3d6 4s2 this is the outermost configuration of iron what is the highest principal quantum number here highest principal quantum number is 4 if n is equal to 4 that means n minus 1 has to be n minus 1 will be 3 check whether it is satisfying this or not put n is equal to 4 put n is equal to 4 in this equation so 4 minus 1 is 3 right so 3d it can contain electrons from 1 to 10 anything between 1 to 10 n value is 4 n value is 4 s can have the electrons from 0 to 2 right is this configuration satisfying the general check it out this particular configuration it is satisfying the general 3d is containing 6 valid 4s is containing 2 valid right so this can this is basically your d block element basically right so in short what i want to convey over here remember the general configuration that is very important n minus 1 d 1 to 10 and s 0 to 2 okay so say it with me for s block it was ns2 for p block quickly in the chats ns2 np 1 to 6 for d block elements the general configuration is n minus 1 d 1 to 10 n minus 1 d 1 to 10 ns2 i mean n is 0 to 2 right perfect n minus 1 d 1 to 10 ns 0 to 2 where n is the maximum principal quantum number highest principal quantum number highest principal quantum number right same goes for what same remember the general outermost configuration of f block elements as well right n minus 2 f from 1 to 14 n minus 1 d 0 to 1 and s2 perfect this is the general outermost configuration of f block elements which you need to remember now comes certain points now comes certain points now comes certain points now comes certain points okay try to understand them one by one because questions have been asked right the first question that is identification of the block how do you exactly identify whether the element is from s block whether the element is from p block d block f block whatever right identification of the block how do we do that first of all first of all if you look at this particular slide if you look at this particular slide identification of the block my dear students i'll start with case one if in a question you are given with the electronic configuration of an element if you are given with the electronic configuration of an element okay if you are given with the electronic configuration of an element and from the electronic configuration you have to identify element belongs to element belongs to element belongs to which block okay how do we do that how do we do that for that purpose you need to remember the general outermost configuration of all the blocks first for example for example for example have a look i've mentioned over here if np electron is present then p block what is meant by this what is meant by this for example my dear students look at this particular element this is sulfur understand carefully this is sulfur right you wrote its configuration, you wrote its configuration, right? You wrote its configuration. Now, 
Check whether the outermost configuration is resembling, whether the outermost configuration is satisfying the general configuration of S, P, D, or F. Check it out. Check it out. Highest principal quantum number is 3. Highest principal quantum number is 3. Perfect. So, highest principal quantum number is 3. So, if I put 3 here, it is 3s2 and it can be 3p1 to 6. 3p will be 1 to 6. So, 3s2 and 3p4, which is present here, it can be 3p1 to 6. So, directly you will say it's a p block element. Directly you will say it's a p block element. What you need to do, for example, if you have got a question wherein you are given an element sulfur, take it. Uh, you, are, you have written the, I mean, the electronic configuration of sulfur is given. Perfect. If the outermost configuration of sulfur is satisfying this particular condition, then it's a p-block element. As simple as that. Look at the second one. Look at the second one. Again, 3s2, 3p6. If you put ns3, 3s2, 3p6. 3s2, 3p6 is present here. That means directly you can say it's a p-block element. Is it clear? Is it clear to everyone? 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 For example, I have got an element X. I'm giving you its outermost configuration. 3s2, 3p5. Can you let me know what is going to be the block of this element? Can you let me know what is going to be the block of this element? Quickly guys, I want you guys to let me know in the chats quick. It's a p-block element. It's a p-block element because this particular outermost configuration, it is satisfying our general configuration. Right? It's satisfying our general configuration. I hope step number one is clear. Right? Step number two. Step number two. My dear students, I have mentioned over here two elements. I have mentioned over here two elements. Perfect. Two elements. I have mentioned over here. Outermost configuration is 3s2 here. Electronic configuration is given. Electronic configuration is given. Now check whether this electronic configuration, whether this outermost configuration is satisfying our general configuration or not. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. Highest principal quantum is 3. So 3s1 to 2. 3s1 to 2. 3s1 to 2. You can. This is D0, this is F0, right? Leave it aside. Perfect. N value is 3. N value is 3. So it is satisfying this. It is satisfying this. Perfect. It is satisfying this. Correct. It is satisfying this. So it belongs to which? It belongs to which block? It belongs to S block. It belongs to S block. Look at the next configuration. Next configuration is your 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Look at this configuration. 4s2. Put n value as 4. Put n value as 4. 4s1 to 2. This is also satisfying it. If it is satisfying, if the configuration which is given to us, if it is satisfying this particular configuration, then it is the S block element. As simple as that. As simple as that. As simple as that. Similarly, similarly, this is the general configuration of F block. Now you are given with the element whose electronic configuration is given. Right? These are the two elements which are, which, which are given to us. Right? These are the two electronic configurations which are given to us. Perfect. What is the highest principal quantum number here? 6. N value is 6. N value is 6. If N is 6, N is 6, it will be 6s2. 6 minus 1 is 5. So 5d will contain 0 to 1 electron. Right? N is 6. 6 minus 2 is 4. So it's going to be 4f can contain 1 to 14 electrons. Look at this particular configuration. It is satisfying this particular configuration. 4f6. 4f6, 6s2, 6s2, it is satisfying it. So this particular element which is given to us, whose electronic configuration is given to us, it is basically your, it is basically your F block element. Look at the next one. Look at the next one. What is the highest principal quantum number? 6 here. Again, if you see, when you put 6 here, right, it will satisfy. It will satisfy. So basically, the point is, that's why I told you, you have to remember the general Elect outermost configurations, right? And if you remember the general outer outermost configuration, if the question is asked like this, you are given with some electronic configuration and you have to check whether the element is S block, P block, D block or F block. You have to check whether the given configuration is satisfying our general configuration or not. 
If it is satisfying the S block configuration, it is S block element. If it is satisfying the P block configuration, then it's P block. If it is satisfying the D block configuration, then D and eventually F. This was case number one. That is identification of the block when, it gen when electronic configuration of an element is given. Identification of the block when the electronic configuration is given. Correct? Identification of the block. Identification of the block when the general electronic configuration is given. Similarly, this is your D block configuration. If you are given with a question, electronic configuration is given. If this electronic configuration is satisfying the general one, then the given element is your D block element, which is pretty much simple now, I believe. I believe this is pretty much simple now. So question number one, question number one, what was this question? What was this question? Question was identification. You can write it in your notes in the form of questions, okay? Identification of the block. If electronic configuration of an element is given to us, how do we do that? For that purpose, first of all, we have to remember the general outermost configuration. If the given configuration is satisfying whatever block configuration, accordingly, you can solve it. Yes? Perfect. Number one. Number two, that is identification of the period. Identification of the period. How do we exactly identify whether the element is from period number one, period two, period three, period seven or whatever, right? There are seven periods in total. How do we check? How do we check the period number of an element? Again, case number one. Again, case number one, if, if, if you are given with an element and its electronic configuration, imagine you are given with the element X, its electronic configuration is given. From the electronic configuration, how do you check, how do you check which period element belongs to? How do you check which period element belongs to? Look at this particular statement here, guys. The highest principal quantum number available in the electronic configuration is always the period number of that element. For example, I am given with two configurations like this. I am given with two configurations like this. Perfect. Two electronic configurations have been given to me. I am asked to check the period of these two elements. How do I do it? I will check the highest principal quantum number. What is the highest principal quantum number here? Three. Right? So directly I will say its period number is three. What is the highest principal quantum number? Three or four? Four. I will say its period number is four. So in short, if electronic configuration is given, if electronic configuration is given, check the highest principal quantum number. Whatever is the highest principal quantum number, that is going to be your period number. That is going to be your period number. Okay, that's going to be your period number. Point number one. Point number two. Okay, here we have got one exception for uh, palladium. Do remember this one. Okay, just the, leave this five as zero. If I ask you, look at this configuration. Look at this configuration. If I ask you from this configuration, what has to be its period number? Its expected period number is supposed to be 4, but actually it is 5. Okay, remember this in the form of exception. Palladium, its expected period number is 4, but its actual period number is 5. Okay, but its actual period number is 5. Okay, so right now I'm making you understand. If you are given with some electronic configuration and you have to identify the period number, what do you have to do? You have to check the highest principal quantum number. Highest principal quantum number is always your what? It is always your period number. Okay. Exception one is there. That is palladium. Perfect. Its period number should be four, but it is actually five. Remember it in the form of exception itself. Okay. This was question number one on period. Question number two. What if electronic configuration is not given? What if you are given with atomic number? What if you are given with atomic number? And you are supposed to identify the period. How do you do that? How do you do that? What if, what if you are not given with electronic configuration? What if you were unable to write electronic configuration? Right? What if only atomic number is given and you are supposed to check the period? How do we do that? There are few things which you need to remember. There are few things which you need to remember. My dear students, remember this number. 58 to 71. If you are given with the element, if you are given with the element X, for example, I mean, if you are given with the element whose atomic number is 65 or atomic number is 70, let's say you are given with a general element. 
If the atomic number given to you, if the atomic number given to you lies between 90 and 103, if the atomic number given to you lies between 90 to 103, directly you are going to remember its period number is 7. Directly you are going to remember its period number is 7. For example, 93 atomic number, it lies between 90 to 103. Yes. This lies between 90 to 103. Yes. So period number for both both them period number of for both of them is seven so two things two two numbers first number is 58 to 71 first number is 58 to 71 58 to 71 second number is second number is second number is 90 to 103 perfect if atomic number lies between these two its period number is six and over here period number is this is how this is not done yet by the way this is not done yet by the way this is not done yet i am showing you how to calculate the period from the atomic number how to calculate period from the atomic number if if your atomic number lies between 58 to 71 period number 6 if it lies between 90 to 103 directly period number 7 no need to check anything no need to check anything <coughs> no need to check anything now understand. Now understand. Now understand. So two numbers I gave you. 158 to 71 atomic number. 190 to 103. What if you are given with some atomic number which does not lie in this? Which does not lie in this as well? What if? What if? For example, I am given with the element X whose atomic number is 32. I have to check its period. I have to check its period. Now this atomic number, neither it lies between these two, nor it lies between these two. Perfect. How do we check at that point of time? My dear students, first of all, first of all, you have to remember the atomic numbers of your noble gases. You have to remember the atomic numbers of your noble gases. Helium, atomic number 2. It belongs to period number 1. Right? Neon, atomic number 10. Argon, 18. Krypton, 36. Xenon, 54. Radon, 86. You have to remember their atomic numbers 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, 86, 118. 2, 10, 18, 36, 54, 86, 118. Now, now, now. Understand, understand. For example, I am given with the element whose atomic number is 32. Its atomic number is 32. 32 atomic number neither lies between this number nor with this number. Now, how do I check its period number? How do I check its period number? Now, my dear students, tell me one thing. After 32, which noble gas do you have? After 32, you will have this noble gas. After 32, you will have this noble gas. Right? After 32, atomic number, you will have this noble gas. Perfect. What is its period number? 4. So, its period number will be also 4. Am I clear? Am I clear, people? Am I clear? For example, I am given with, with the element. I don't know what is the element name. I just remember its atomic number. I mean, one atomic number is given to me. And they have asked me to check its period number. How do I do that? 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 Does this atom is this atomic number coming in between this number and this number? It's not. It's not. Now. Now. It's not. Now. Now. What is the next noble gas atomic number after 52? After 52, the noble gas atomic number is what? After 52, noble gas atomic number is 54. 
it belongs to period 5. So I'll say this particular element will be belonging to period 5. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear people? Am I clear? Am I clear? We are given with element X whose atomic number is 44. After 44, the next, the next noble gas configuration, the next noble gas atomic number is 54. 54, its period number is how much? 5. So its period number is 5. And same goes for the other ones. I believe it's clear. I believe it's clear. This was identification of the period if atomic number is given. And that atomic number does not lie among those two values which I gave you. Let me know once in the chats if I'm clear. Let me know once in the chats if I'm clear. Yes. Is it clear to you? But, 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 this is all volatile. If you do not remember all these things afterwards, you are gone, you are over. You are over. Guys, let me tell you, uh, when I earlier used to teach this periodic classification, it used to take me 7 to 10 hours. Why? Because in this chapter itself, I used to deal with all the compounds of S block. All those trends of S block. But now your S block is over. That is deleted. Right? So we do not need to relate this particular chapter with S block. Right? All the trends, you would have seen a lot of lectures wherein teachers in periodic classification, they complete all the trends of inorganic from S block at least. Right? That's why it used to take time. But now S block is not there. So you are not supposed to do that. Yeah? Now, now comes identification of the group. First one was identification of block. Second one is identification of, of period. Third one is identification of what? Identification of group. Whether element belongs to first group, second group, third group, fourth group, fifth, sixth, till eighteenth. Right? Okay? Right? Now have a look. Now have a look. Few things, that's what. Few things to remember. Few things to remember. First of all, let's say you are given the question in which you are given with the electronic configuration of an element. Let's say you are given with the electronic configuration of an element. Okay, let's say you are given with electronic configuration of an element. From the electronic configuration, can you identify the block? You can identify the block. You can identify the block. Once you identify the block, if the element belongs to S block, if the element belongs to S block, if the element belongs to S block, then, 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 total number of electrons in a valence shell, total number of valence shell electrons, total number of valence shell electrons is equal to its group number, if the element belongs to S block. So first of all, first of all, if electronic configuration is given, from the electronic configuration, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to check the block of the element. If the element belongs to S block, then just check the total valence electrons. Just check the total valence electrons. This is the electronic configuration given to me, right? I identified it as an S block element. I identified this is an S block element. Now check the valence electrons. Valence electrons here are two. Valence electron here is one. Here is one. And in this particular case, in S-block elements, number of valence electrons is equal to group number. So group number here will be 2, group number here will be 1, right? Group number here will be 1. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? This is for what? This is for S-block elements. This is for S-block elements. Now, now, if you are geared with electronic configuration, right? If you are geared with electronic configuration and you identified which block element it is. If the element is from P block. If the element is from P block. If the element is from P block. How to identify its group then? Simple. Simple. Total number of valence electrons. Plus 10. Total number of valence electrons plus 10. Or, or you can remember it like this. NS electrons plus NP electrons plus 10. What it means? NS electrons plus NP electrons plus 10. Have a look on the examples. NS plus NP plus 10. 
NS plus NP plus 10, right? First of all, this is the general electronic configuration that's given. I identified that this configuration is, it belongs to P block element. This also belongs to P block element, right? NS plus NP plus 10. NS plus NP plus 10. NS is here, 2. NS is here, 2 electrons. NP contains 1 electron. Plus what? Plus 10. It comes out to be 13. So 13 is the group number of this particular element whose configuration is given. Right? Perfect. N. N is the principal contributor, by the way. Right? NS is containing... NS is containing two electrons, NP is containing six electrons, and it's a P block element, so plus 10. So group number here is nothing but 17. Group number here is nothing but 17. Group number here is nothing but 17. Right? Now, for the D block elements, for the D, for S block elements, total number of electrons in NS, right? That gives you the block number. Here, it was NS electrons plus NP electrons plus 10. In case of D block, it is N minus 1 D electrons plus NS electrons. N minus 1 D electrons plus NS electrons. For example, for example, for example, for example. This is the electronic configuration that's given to me. Right? From the electronic configuration, if the element belongs to D block, it is N minus 1 D plus NS. N minus 1 D plus NS. This is N minus 1 D. This is NS. This is NS. This is N minus 1D. Right? So, two electrons in NS, one electrons in N minus 1D. So, your group number of this particular element will be 3. Perfect. Look at this one. Look at the next one. NS is containing two electrons. N minus 1D is containing five electrons. So, 5 plus 2 is 7. So, if electronic configuration is given, and from the given electronic configuration, you identified that element is from D block then you can identify its group number as well, right? Now, what about, what about the F block elements? What about the F block elements? All the elements, all the elements are placed in group P. Here you do not have to remember any formula. Here you do not have to remember any formula, guys, right? Here you are not supposed to remember any formula. Perfect. 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 Perfect guys. All your F block elements, they are in group 3. Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? You can take the example. For example, you are given with the electronic configuration. You identified this electronic configuration resembles with the general electronic configuration of a block. So it's a block element. If it is a block element, its group number is three. If this is a block element, its group number is three. That's what. Yeah, that's what. Now, now, I was telling you how to identify the group if electronic configuration is given. If electronic configuration is given. Now, now, how do you identify the group if atomic number is given? How do you identify the group if its atomic number is given? How do we identify the group if its atomic number is given? Look at this particular slide once. How do you identify the group if its atomic number is given? Look at this particular slide. Check if the given number is between 58 to 71 or 90 to 103. Then the elements, element belongs to third group. Right? Then the element belongs to third group. Third group. A block. This is, this is something which you know now. Right? Perfect. Element belongs to third group. And you can identify whether it's lanthanoid or actinoid. You can identify whether it's lanthanoid or actinoid. Perfect. If atomic number is given as 63, for example, 63 is lying between this particular number. So group number is 3. 63 means a block, right? And which, which one? Which one? Lanthanoid. Perfect. Similarly, 96, it belongs to that particular number, between that particular number, 90 to 103. So at that point of time, group number is 3. This is the first case. If if my dear students atomic number is given and you are supposed to check the group number, first remember these two numbers 58 to 71, 90 to 103. If atomic number is coming in between them, so do remember the element is your 
ab block, right? And all your ab block elements, they lie in group 3. They lie in group 3. Now, if the atomic number given to us, if the atomic number given to us, I'm giving you all the tricks. If atomic number given to us is between, is between 104 to 118. If the atomic number given to us is between 104 to 118, then check the last two digits in the atomic number. For example, 110. Check the last two digits, 10. So its group number is 10. 104. Coming in between those two values, 104 to 118. Last two digits, right? Group number 4. Isn't it easy, guys? Isn't it easy? Isn't it easy? Okay. Right? Now guys, the first thing which I told you here, that was, that was, if the atomic number is between these two or between these two, group number directly is 3, right? And if the atomic number given to us, given to us is between these two values, then last two digit is the group number. What about all the other atomic numbers except these? What about all the other atomic numbers except these? Except these. Okay, tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. 116. Atomic number 116. Tell me the group number. Tell me the group number quickly. It is not lying in between any two numbers which I gave you already. Right? So last two. Done. Is that? Group number 16. Now what about the other atomic numbers which do not belong to this category as well as which do not belong to what? Which do not belong to this particular category. What about them? What about them? What about them? Their group number is calculated with the help of this particular formula. Group number is equal to 18 minus next inert gas number minus atomic number. What it means? What it means? Let's have a look. Let's have a look what it means. First remember this formula. 18 minus energy minus x. What is x? x is the given atomic number. X is a given atomic number. X is a given atomic number. I hope you are getting what I am trying to say. X is a given atomic number. Okay. See guys. Understand. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say. X is equal to 44. I am given with an element whose atomic number is 44. Whose atomic number is 44. What is the next inert gas atomic number? That is 54. Energy value is 54. X is 44, NIG is 54, right? So put it in this formula, 18 minus, 18 minus 54, 18 minus NIG minus X. The value comes out to be what? Value comes out to be 8, so its group number is 8. So group number is 8. If X is 32, for example, if X is 32, what is the next inert gas number? Next inert gas number, NIG is 36, right? So it is 18 minus NIG minus X, right? Value comes out to be, value comes out to be 14. And by chance, by chance, by chance, if you are given with some number x, right, you identified energy also. Then you use this formula. Then you used this formula, 18 minus NIG minus x. If this value comes out to be negative, if this value comes out to be negative, then change the formula. Instead of 18, write 32. Instead of 18, write 32. This will give the correct result. I hope you are getting what I am trying to say. I hope you are getting what I am trying to say. I hope you are getting what I am trying to say. Yes? Am I clear people? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Tell me the answer of this question. Element with atomic number 114 has been discovered recently. It will belong to which of the following family, group and electronic configuration? Family, group, electronic configuration. Quick, 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 quick. Quick. Tell me the answer. Whatever I taught you, if you use those things, you can easily kill this question.
Why are you saying option A? I need the logic. I need the logic. I need the logic. I need the logic. <clears throat> Did you use any formula? Hundred fourteen. Last two digits one one four. Which group? Group fourteen. Group fourteen. Which family is that? Carbon family. There is only one option which is saying carbon family. That's option A. Did you know this trick before? Did you know all these tricks before? Honestly, you can say yes or no. Accordingly, you can get the period, group, block, whatever. Even I struggled to do these questions when I was preparing for my JE back in 2013. Because I did not knew. I did not know these things. Honestly, I'm saying. And I had to, for that, I had to, I mean, I had to remember the entire period table. That was a mess. But if you know all these things, you are not supposed to remember the period table at all. Yeah, <clears throat> done and dusted. Okay, one more question. Tell me. Tell me the answer. Quickly. Quickly, guys. Quickly, I, I need its answer, guys, quickly. An element has electronic configuration. This you will place in you will place it in which group? Electronic configuration is given. Electronic configuration is given from the electronic configuration. First of all, you need to identify which block it belongs to. Which block it belongs to. And once you identify which block which block it belongs to, then easily you can do it. What is the correct answer? Just a second, guys. <clears throat> Need to close down one light. I don't know what happened to electricity since morning. Since morning, I'm teaching with the help of UPS. Absolutely, it's a fifth group, right? It is the it is the fifth group. N S plus N minus one D. N S plus N minus one D. Right? Okay. All right. Have you heard about shielding effect? Have you heard about shielding effect? If you actually want to know the shielding effect, then it is basically very detailed. 
in order to understand the shielding effect, you should, I mean, there, is, there has to be physics involved, Gaussian surface, etc. Right? But we do not need to go there. We do not need to go there. We'll remember things which will help us out in order to solve the equations. Okay? What is the shielding effect? My dear students, as per the definition, one of its definitions, the decrease in the force of attraction, the decrease in the force of attraction on the valence electron, the decrease in the force of attraction, the decrease in the force of attraction on the valence electron, due to the inner shell electrons, due to the inner shell electrons, due to the inner shell electrons, okay? Uh, someone is saying Z minus sigma. Why do you want to go for the Slater's rules, etc., etc.? You do not have to study that. Why do you want to go for that? Guys, whatever I'm teaching, you just keep this in your brain. Right? We do not need to remember the irrelevant things which are not asked in. No irrelevant stuff. All right. Have a look on what this shielding effect is all about. The decrease in the force of attraction on the valence electron due to the inner shell electrons is called as screening effect or shielding effect. Right? See. See what it means. For example, for example, this is the nucleus. Let's say this is the nucleus. Perfect. Let's say this is the electron which I'm taking into consideration. This is the electron which I'm taking into consideration. Okay. This is the electron which I'm taking into consideration. Now, my dear students, this nucleus contains positive charge. I'll say this nucleus will be holding this electron firmly. This nucleus will be holding this electron. Nucleus is positive, electron is negative. Right? Now, now, this is my electron which is taken into consideration. Perfect. Imagine there are Z protons here inside the nucleus. So all these Z protons, all these Z protons, they are all these Z protons, right? They are attracting this particular electron towards itself, correct? With the force of attraction Z. With the force of attraction, for example, Z. Just to make you understand. Now imagine, now imagine there are inner shells as well. Imagine there are inner shells as well. If there are in inner shells, if there are inner shells, if when there were no inner shells, when there were no inner shells, this nucleus was completely focusing on one electron. Now, if there are, let's say, inner shell electrons, what will happen? What will happen? Now, this nucleus has got a lot of other work to do. It has to attract this one also. 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 Now, the same electron, is it going to experience the same attraction which it was experiencing before? No. No. Now, nucleus, it has got other work to do as well. Number one. Number two. Number two. Just to make you understand. Number two. When you are putting the inertial electrons, can I say these inertial electrons will be repelling this particular electron as well? So what is happening due to the inertial electron, the force experienced, the force experienced by the outermost electron, does it increase or decrease? Due to the inertial electrons, the force experienced, the force experienced, the force experienced by the outermost electron, does it increase or decrease? It decreases. Due to the inertial electrons, due to the repulsions caused by the inertial electrons, and this decrease in the force of attraction. This decrease in the force of attraction. This decrease in the force of attraction is something which you call a screening shielding effect. Right? Perfect. So if I ask you about the effective nuclear charge, effective nuclear charge, effectively now, now, effectively now, effectively now, what will be the nuclear charge? Is it going to be same Z? Or you'll be subtracting something. You'll be subtracting something sigma. Right? No, redox reaction will be taken in the physical chemistry class 11th marathon. Okay? Perfect. 
Now people do remember. S shows maximum shielding, then P, then D, then F. This is something which I believe every one of you would be knowing. Even S has more penetrating power, then P, then D, then F. Why is that? Because S is closest to the nucleus, followed by P, followed by BD, followed by F. Right? This is something which I believe you all would be knowing already. S, maximum shielding, followed by P, right? Followed by D, followed by F. Followed by F. Now tell me one thing. I have taken N positive, N and N negative. I have taken N positive, N and N negative. These are the species which I have. Understand carefully what I will say. In case of nitrogen, there are 7 electrons, 7 protons. Here you have got 7 protons, but only 6 electrons. Here you have got uh, 7 protons, but 8 electrons. But 8 electrons. If you look carefully, if you look carefully, in this particular case, 7 protons, they are holding 7 electrons. Here, these 7 protons now are not holding 7 electrons. Now they are holding only 6 electrons. So the force experienced by the outermost electron here will be completely more. Right? Perfect. The force experienced by the outermost electron here, that will be least because 7 protons are now holding 8 electrons. Which is completely difficult. You can understand it like this. So what will be the effect in nuclear charge? Where is the force of attraction experienced by the outer electron the maximum? Where? Where there are lesser electrons, lesser number of electrons. So that repulsions are minimum, etc, etc. Perfect. So what is the effective nuclear charge order? Can I say this is the effective nuclear charge order? I hope you got what I said. See, 7 protons are holding 7 electrons. 7 protons here are holding only 6 electrons. That means force experienced by the outermost electron here will be more. 7 protons are holding 8 electrons. Force experienced by the outermost electron will be less comparatively. Right? More the force experienced by the outermost electron, more the Z effective. So where is the Z effective more? N positive. N positive. Rest, nothing to remember. Okay. Look at this particular thing. Look at this particular thing. H negative. Li positive, Li positive, B di positive, B tri positive. Are all, all of them, they have got same number of electrons. Two electrons here. Two electrons here. Right? Two electrons here. And two electrons here. Isoelectronic. Isoelectronic. They have got same electrons. Perfect. But what about protons? Hydrogen, its atomic number is one. Right? One proton. Lithium. Hydrogen, helium, lithium. Its atomic number is three. Three protons. Four protons. 5 protons. Over in the last case, 5 protons are holding 2 electrons. Right? 5 protons are holding, 4 protons are holding 2 electrons. 3 protons are holding 2 electrons. 1 proton is holding 2 electrons. Can I say over here, the outermost electron will be experiencing maximum attraction. More the attraction experienced by the outermost electron, more is going to be the effective nuclear charge. Right? Same is the case with this one. Same is the case with this one. Right? Perfect. If you look, these are again isoelectronic. 10 electrons, 10 electrons, 10 electrons, 10 electrons, 10 electrons, right? Atomic number 7. So 7 protons, 8 protons, 9 protons, 10 protons, 12 protons. More protons, less electrons. So outermost electron here will be experiencing maximum attraction. So maximum effective nuclear charge in the last case. Right? Perfect. Okay, can you tell me the answer of this question, quick? In sodium atom, the screening of 3s electron is due to? Screening of 3s electron is due to? Is due to what? In sodium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. The screening of this particular one, the shielding of this particular one is done by? All these electrons, right? All these electrons, the inner electrons I say. Perfect, the inner electrons I say. I hope this is also clear. <coughs> now, my dear students, comes your topic that is atomic radius. I believe atomic radius, everyone would have studied, right? Have you?
<laughs> See guys, if you talk about the atomic radius, let's read its definition. And you know, it is done, right? It is the simplest. Half the internuclear distance, half the internuclear distance. Internuclear distance means the distance between two nuclei. The distance between two nuclei is the internuclear distance. Half the internuclear distance between the two atoms in the homo diatomic molecule. Homo means same, diatomic means two atoms. So I believe this is atom A, this is atom A. Same atoms, right? Same atoms as well as two atoms we have. So this particular molecule which we have, it is homo diatomic. It is homo diatomic. Perfect. So what you need to do over here is in order to define the atomic radius, what you need to do? Get the internuclear distance, get the internuclear distance, divide this internuclear distance by 2, you will be getting the atomic radius. You will be getting the atomic radius. So, atomic radius is nothing. It is just defined as half the internuclear distance between the two atoms, but in what? In homo diatomic molecule. In homo diatomic molecule. In homo diatomic molecule. So, get the internuclear distance, divide it with 2, right? You will be getting atomic radius of the atom. Till now you used to say atomic radius is basically the distance from the nucleus to the outermost electron, right? Till now we used to say that, correct? But my dear students, you know the position of the outermost electron, the boundary, I mean this, this last surface is not defined basically. We talk in terms of probabilities as per quantum mechanical model. As per quantum mechanical model, we talk in terms of probabilities. So you cannot define the surface over here. Perfect? That's why we calculate atomic radius like this. Get the internuclear distance, divide it with 2, get the atomic radius. Now, this atomic radius we classify into four types. One is covalent radius, right? One is covalent radius, which is defined for covalent molecules. Metallic radius, which is defined in case of metallic bonds, etc. Uh, ionic radius, which is defined for ionic compounds. And Van der Waals radius, which is particularly defined for gases. Right, which is particularly defined for gases, noble gases particularly. Right, particularly for noble gases. Okay, and it's not only defined for noble gases, by the way. So we'll start with the covalent radius first of all. What this covalent radius is all about? Do you remember how covalent bond is formed? Penetration of atomic orbitals into each other. Penetration of atomic orbitals into each other. Do you remember that? When you talk about the covalent compound, atomic orbitals, they penetrate into each other. Overlapping happens. So imagine, imagine I've got a homo atomic, homo atomic molecule. Same atoms, A atom, A atom, right? Imagine I've got A atom here, I've got A atom here. Now, for the covalent bond formation, their electron clouds have to merge into each other. Let's say this is the nucleus of this, this is the nucleus of this. I'll be calling this particular distance as the internuclear distance, B, right? So divide this internuclear distance by 2, you'll be getting what? You'll be getting the covalent radius. Okay? Divide the, divide the internuclear distance by 2, you'll be getting the covalent radius of the atom over here. Correct? Correct? This is for homo atomic molecule. Now, if you'll be having a heteroatomic molecule, if you're having the heteroatomic molecule, if you're having the heteroatomic molecule, for example, this is atom A, this is atom B. Their electron clouds are, have merged. Their electron clouds have merged. But atoms are different. There is some electronegativity difference as well. Then how do you calculate? Then what kind of result do you use? What kind of result do you use? This is this DAB, it represents the internuclear distance. It represents the internuclear distance, DAB, right? It is equal to radius of atom A plus radius of atom B minus 0.09 multiplied by electronegativity difference electro negativity difference between the two atoms and if you are you are using this particular result you will be getting the answer in angstroms if you are using this particular result you are using you are getting the answer in picometers for example you are i hope this is clear all the values all the values here will be given if you get a question from this if you get a heteroatomic molecule if you get a heteroatomic molecule my dear students right and out of all these things over here Right? See how many unknowns we have. One, two, three, four. Four unknowns. Out of four unknowns, if three are given, fourth one you can calculate. Yeah? Fourth one you can calculate. 
it is just remember this particular delta x represents electron negativity difference between the two atoms which will be given in the equation okay perfect now if i talk about metallic radius what is metallic radius metallic radius my dear students <clears throat> let's say this is metal let's say this metal and these are the positively charged kernels these are the positively charged kernels right positively charged kernels we have okay so basically metallic bond exists in this particular metal right now how what do we do here how do we calculate the metallic radius it is the it is again half the internuclear distance between the two adjacent metallic atoms in the crystal line in the crystal line lattice structure it is again what you need to do what you need to do get the internuclear distance and divide it with half right get the internuclear distance divide it with 2 you'll be getting the radius of the metal you'll be getting the radius of the metal overlapping was there in when i defined the covalent radius but here you are not you are not going to define overlapping here perfect you are not going to define overlapping right now guys understand understand if i need to compare covalent radius with metallic radius which will be more covalent radius or metallic radius which will be more which one is going to be more covalent radius or metallic radius which one which one metallic radius will be more because in covalent atomic orbitals say merge into each other right perfect if i talk about van der waals radius if i talk about van der waals radius let's say you are taking two noble gases neon neon perfect there will be van der waals force of attraction between them there will be van der waals force of attraction between them perfect the distance between their nuclei is what you call as internuclear distance perfect right it is called as internuclear distance again get get the internuclear distance divide it with 2 you'll be getting what you'll be getting the van der waals radius you'll be getting the van der waals radius perfect now it is not only for what it's not only for noble gases for example for example for example let's say you are taking this is i2 molecule let's say you are taking i2 molecule this is iodine iodine this is i2 this is i2 this is again one more i2 this is iodine this is iodine this is i2 right between this iodine and this iodine you are going to define covalent radius between this iodine and this iodine you are going to define covalent radius but 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 between these two iodine molecules you are going to define what you are going to define van der waals radius and how do i get the van der waals radius get the internuclear distance divided with 2 you'll be getting what you'll be getting the van der waals radius over here okay perfect okay guys i remember this thing and i believe you already understood this <coughs> now tell me one thing metallic covalent or van der waals radius which one will be maximum which one will be maximum which one will be maximum metallic covalent or van der waals van der waals will be maximum followed by followed by metallic followed by or uh, followed by your covalent radius okay followed by your covalent radius this is the order which you have to remember this can be asked as well this can be asked as well now one more that is ionic radius ionic radius we define for ionic compounds like nacl like nacl okay generally my dear students if i talk about nacl if i talk about nacl this is your cation and this is your anion generally generally what do you observe you observe cation is smaller sized and anion is larger sized and generally it happens not every time okay generally it happens cation is smaller sized and anion is larger sized right now in case of the ionic compound in case of the ionic compound imagine this is your cation and this is your anion this is your anion right how do i define the ionic radius over here how do i define the ionic radius over here first of all first of all your internuclear distance that means the distance between the nuclei is going to be equal to radius of anion plus radius of cation you know it right radius of cation plus radius of anion again what you have to do ionic radius can be calculated by measuring the distance between the cations and ions in an ionic crystal in case of ionic compounds you need to get the radius of cation radius of anion accordingly you can get what accordingly you can get ionic radius over here accordingly you can get ionic radius over here by dividing it with 2 by dividing it with 2 by dividing it with 
Okay. All right. Tell me one thing. Look at this particular statement. Get ionic radius is always smaller than the atomic radius. What does that mean? That means radius of cation, radius of cation is always less than the radius of its parent atom. And it can be explained with the help of Z effective. It can be explained with the help of Z effective. It can be explained with the help of what? Z effective. Right? Perfect. For example, let's say you have got sodium, you have got Na positive. Correct? 11 electrons, 11 protons. Perfect. 11 protons, 10 electrons. 11 protons, 10 electrons. Right? Now, my dear students, 11 protons are holding 11 electrons. 11 protons are holding 10 electrons. The force experienced by the outermost electron will be more. Z effective is more. If Z effective is more, if the outermost electron is, is getting more attraction from the nucleus, right? It will come closer. Size decreases, right? So, this is the size order basically. Perfect. So, basically, your cationic size, your cationic size, your cationic radius is always less than the radius of the parent atom. Okay, for example, you have got atom A, then you are taking one electron out, A positive, take one electron out, A, a di positive, take one electron out, A, a tri positive, A tri positive. Perfect, right? Now, you can easily define their radiuses, you can easily compare their radiuses. A P block will be done in class 12 in Organic Marathon. This is class 11. Right? Can you compare, guys? Can you compare? Can you compare? This one will be having the least radius because effective nuclear charge is maximum here. More effective nuclear charge, lesser the size. In short. In short. In short. <clears throat> now guys, here I have to tell you one more thing. Na, Na positive, Na2 positive. Na, Na positive, Na2 positive. We know, we know, when you take one one electron, effective nuclear charge increases, size decreases, right? Size decreases, cationic radius decreases, cationic radius decreases. But do you see this Na size is far, far, far greater than, than that of Na positive? And over here it's not. Why is that? Why is that? Because if you see, here you had three shells. Now here you have, you have only two shells, right? So shell number is changing. Shell number is changing here, right? Shell number is changing. Over here you have got three shells, only two here. So, so the decrease in the size here is completely drastic than decrease from here to here. Okay? Similarly, similarly, similarly. When you take one electron out from Mg, it has to be from 3s. It gets converted into Mg positive. Now, when you are taking this electron out, right? Perfect. When you are taking this electron out, it becomes Mg di positive. Now, Mg di positive, there are only two shells. So, again, difference in the shells here. So, that's the reason why drastic decrease increase is happening. Because of the change in the shell number. I hope it's clear. I hope it is clear. I hope it is clear. Perfect. So, till now, it was about what? It was about the cationic species. Now, what about the anionic species? What about the anionic species? What about the anionic species? Talk about their size. Talk about their size. Talk about their size. X, X negative, X di negative. There are more electrons here. More electrons, same number of protons everywhere. So, nuclear charge, effective nuclear charge is least here. If effective nuclear charge is least, size will be maximum. Size will be maximum. Size will be maximum. Now, all these are isoelectronic species. Isoelectronic species. How do you compare their size? On the basis of effective nuclear charge. On the basis of effective nuclear charge. This is the asked question. 10 electrons. 10 electrons everywhere. Now talk about protons. 7 protons, 8 protons, 9 protons, 10 protons, 12 protons, 13 protons. Electrons are same everywhere. 10 electrons, 10 electrons, 10 electrons. Everywhere electrons are same, right? Where is the effective nuclear charge more? Effective nuclear charge is more in the last case. More the effective nuclear charge, lesser is going to be the size, right? Lesser is going to be the size. So you can talk in terms of this as well. 
Correct, guys? What are the factors? What are the factors which exactly affect the radius? Atomic radius. My dear students, there are a few factors which exactly affect the radius. One is effective nuclear charge. You should be knowing it, right? Radius and effective nuclear charge. Radius and effective nuclear charge. They are inversely proportional. Right? More the effective nuclear charge, less are the radius. This is one of the factors. Number of number of shells increases, radius increases. You know this. Right? Radius depends on number of shells as well. More the shells, more the radius. Third is bond order. Bond order means number of bonds in between. More the bonds, more force of attraction. More the bonds, more force of attraction. Lesser the internuclear distance, lesser the radius. Right? So more the bond order, lesser the radius. Perfect. Cleaning constant. Sigma. It represents what? Repulsions. Which? Which? Which inner shell electrons? Which inner shell electrons are going to do with the outermost electron? More the repulsions. More the repulsions. More is going to be the radius. More the repulsions. More the radius. More the repulsions. More the radius. Okay, these are the four factors which you need to know, my dear students. These are the four factors which you need to know. Okay, am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Am I clear? Do you want to see the trends here now? What happens? General trends you should know on moving from left to right. On moving from left to right, what happens to the effective nuclear charge? Effective nuclear charge increases, therefore atomic radius decreases. Down the group, atomic radius increases. Left to right, atomic radius decreases due to increase in the effective nuclear charge. Down the group, the atomic radius decreases. Okay. Now people, whenever you need to compare atomic radius in the period, whenever you need to compare atomic radius in the period, you'll be comparing it with the help of effective nuclear charge. And you know atomic radius that is inversely proportional to that effective. For example, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. They belong to the same period. So you will be comparing their atomic radius with the help of what? With the help of effective nuclear charge. Right? On moving from left to right, on moving from left to right, effective nuclear charge increases. So size automatically decreases. I mean the atomic radius decreases. Perfect. But in a period, in a period, in the group, in the group, if you not, if you need to compare. In the group, if you need to compare the atomic radius, you'll be comparing, comparing it with the help of number of shells. So, when you move from, for example, group 2 to group 3, shell number increases. 3 to 4, shell number increases. Perfect. Right? Okay. So, atomic radius is directly proportional to number of shells. So, on moving from top to the bottom, number of shells increases. That is the reason why atomic radius also increases. That is the reason why atomic radius also increases. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. Down the group, atomic radius increases. Correct? Correct, people? Okay. Uh, just a second. I remember this particular exception over here. Well, you, you should be knowing it by now. Let's say uh, you are comparing fluorine with neon. Fluorine with neon. Same period. On moving from left to right, on moving from left to right, what happens to size? Size generally in the period decreases because effective nuclear charge increases. So, so it is, so expect, we are expecting fluorine should have more size than neon. But, but what happens? Neon has got more size than fluorine. The actual thing. Why is that? Because neon is a noble gas. For noble gas, what do we define? We define Van der Waals radius. And you know, Van der Waals radius is far greater than covalent, metallic, ionic, etc. So do remember this particular thing. The size of neon will be basically the size of noble gases. Perfect. So, uh, in this particular case, size of your noble gas, neon, will be greater than that of fluorine. Remember this particular thing as well. It can be asked. It can be asked. All right. These are some species which are given to us. Arrange them on the basis of their atomic radius. Arrange them on the basis of their atomic radius. Quick. Quick. 
quickly. What is the correct answer of this question? What is the correct answer of this question? Anyone wants me to solve this? These are isoelectronic species, right? More the effective nuclear charge, lesser the size. More the effective nuclear charge, lesser the size. Tell me the answer of this one. Tell me the answer of this one. B di positive is isoelectronic with B di positive contains how many electrons? B di positive contains two electrons. Now, which of the following here contains two electrons? Li positive, right? Li positive also contains two electrons. What is the answer of this one? Identify the wrong statement in the following. Wrong statement. Identify the wrong statement quickly. Atomic radius increases as one moves down the first group. This is correct. Atomic radius decreases as one moves from left to right in the second period. Correct. Among isoelectronic species, smaller the positive charge on cation, smaller the ionic radius. Smaller the positive charge on cation, smaller the ionic radius. Smaller the positive charge on cation. If there is more positive charge, lesser will be the size, right? More positive charge, lesser size. So it is reverse, not correct. Greater the negative charge, larger the anionic radius. Option C is the one which is incorrect, right? All these type of questions you should be able to solve by the way. Okay. What do you think about this one? What do you think about this one? Quickly. Quickly, guys. Magnesium you have. Calcium you have. These are group second. Okay. Group second. Phosphorus you have here. Okay, that is group 15. Then you have got one more, which one? Chlorine. This is group 17. What is the correct answer? What is the correct answer, people? Think over it. Quickly, everyone. Among the following, the order of increasing atomic radii. The order of increasing atomic radii. The order of increasing atomic radius. Do you want me to solve this or not? Absolutely, guys. See, on moving from left to right, radius decreases. Top to bottom, it increases. Correct? Perfect. These three, they belong to the same period. Now here, Cal number is getting increased. So calcium will have maximum radius, right? There is only one option which says calcium having maximum. That's option A. That is option A. What about this one? What about this one? Uh, in your class 11th in organic, there are only two chapters. Okay, bonding and periodic classification. Your P block is from 12th part now. That will happen in class 12th in organic marathon. Quickly, which of the following statements is correct? Ionic radius is proportional. Is proportional to atomic number. Is that? Please look carefully. Look carefully. Be careful. Read all the statements carefully. Read all the statements carefully. I don't want you guys to make a mistake here.
I don't want you to make a mistake here. Read carefully. Atomic radius is proportional to atomic number. Is that? On moving from left to right, left to right, atomic number is increasing. Is atomic radius increasing? Nope. It decreases on moving from left to right. No doubt, from left to right, atomic number increases. But at the same time, atomic number increases. Does that mean uh, atomic radius increases? No. So this is wrong. Did I ever talk in terms of atomic mass? On moving from left to right, atomic mass increases. If atomic mass increase, on moving from left to right, atomic mass no doubt is increasing. But is the atomic radius increasing? That is decreasing. It's wrong. So option D cannot be the answer. There is only one left, that is C. So be careful with these sort of questions. They can play with the words. They can play with the words, guys. They can play with the words. Tell me the answer of this question, quick. <clears throat> The correct order of decreasing ionic radius. These are all isoelectronic. Check the number of protons. More protons, lesser size. More protons, lesser size. Right? More protons, lesser size. Redox won't be done. Redox does not belong to inorganic. Redox belongs to physical. It will be done in physical chemistry marathon of class 11th. No need to worry about that. Okay? Okay guys, so people are saying option C, is that? Is that? If majority is saying C, then C would be the answer. Yes, C is the correct answer. Oh, a lot of questions. Even this is one asked question. Even this one asked question. Compare their ionic radii, quick. Compare their ionic radii. Compare their ionic radii, quick. Quickly. Done. People are saying option C. Absolutely, it's option C. Okay. Now comes your ionization energy. Now comes your ionization energy. What is ionization enthalpy? What is ionization energy? How do we define it? You should know it. Minimum amount of energy which is required. To remove the most loosely bonded outermost electron in the ground state from an isolated gaseous atom. So first of all, in order to define the ionization energy, what do we need? In order to define the ionization energy, we need an isolated gaseous atom. So atom, whatever atom we have, it has to be in gaseous form. It has to be in gaseous form, number one. Number one. Number two, it has to be isolated. It is not supposed to be in bonded form. It has to be isolated. No bonded form. Right? Now, from the, from the valence shell, the most loosely bonded electron. This is the, your valence electron. Right? This is your valence electron. It is at the maximum distance from the nucleus. Perfect. The force of attraction on this electron will be least. Perfect. So, in order to take this electron out, what do we need to do? We need to supply energy. We need to supply energy. Energy, the, the minimum amount of energy, the minimum amount of energy which is required to take the outermost loosely bonded electron out from the atom, out from the isolated gaseous atom. That amount of energy required is something which you call as, which you call as ionization energy. Perfect ionization energy. Right? Since this nucleus will be holding this electron. So there is force of attraction. So in order to take this electron out, we have to break this force of attraction. And in order to break the force of attraction, you have to supply energy. The minimum amount of energy which is required. Right? The minimum amount of energy which is required to take the most loosely bonded electron out. Something which you call as 
ionization energy. All right, that is something which you call as ionization energy. So, for example, you have got the metal, you have got the element which is in isolated gaseous form. If you are giving it the ionization energy, that means you are taking the electron out, the, the last electron you are taking out, and this atom gets converted into its cation. Very simple. Now, if you talk about the consecutive ionization energies, the consecutive ionization energy, the successive ionization energies. See guys, for example, you have got the element 1, you are giving it the ionization energy. So, you are taking one electron out, it is getting converted into M positive. Perfect. Now, from this M positive, you are giving, you are taking one more electron out by supplying this much amount of energy. It gets converted into M di positive. Now, from M di positive, again, you are giving ionization energy, right, and taking one more electron out. Perfect. What about these successive ionization energies? Right? What about these successive energy, ionization energies? Guys, this is pretty much simple. Understand. For example, this had, this was neutral. There were 7 protons, 7 electrons, for example. But here, it got converted into M positive. So, there will be 7 protons, but there will be only 6 electrons. Right? And over here, there will be 7 protons, but only 5 electrons. Perfect. So, M, M positive, M di positive. M, M positive, M di positive. M, M positive, M di positive. 7 protons were holding 7 electrons, but 7 protons are holding only 6 here. Only 5 here. The force of attraction which is experienced by the outermost electron here will be maximum. So, to take that electron out, you have to supply more energy, a lot of energy. So, can I say, can I say, IE3 will be maximum followed by IE2 followed by IE1. Right? IE3 will be maximum followed by IE2 followed by IE1. Okay, is it clear? Is it clear people? Now the factors on which ionization energy depends. Ionization energy first of all depends on effect nuclear charge. Simple. Ionization energy, it depends on effect nuclear charge. Leave this part, leave this part, right? More the effect nuclear charge, difficult it's going to be. Difficult is, difficult it will be to take the outermost electron out. Means more energy out of supply. That means indirectly more will be the ionization energy. Perfect. Right. Similarly, the ion which will be in highest positive oxidation state, it will have highest ionization energy. For example, Fe tri positive, Fe di positive, Fe. Here iron is in tri positive oxidation state. Di positive. Zero. Right. Over here you can say Fe tri positive, Fe tri positive because of more effect in nuclear charge, it will show. Maximum ionization energy among all these. To take electron out from Fe tri positive, it's completely difficult. As that of Fe di positive, as that of Fe. As that of Fe. Okay? As that of Fe. Now, one more thing. Ionization energy, it depends on the outermost configuration as well. It depends on outermost configuration as well. You know, your half-filled configurations, they are more stable. I mean, your half-filled and fully-filled configurations, they are considered to be stable. Right? Your half-filled configuration as well as fully filled configurations, they are, com they are considered to be very stable. You know them already. Perfect. In case of half-filled, due to exchange energy, due to symmetry, this configuration is more stable. For example, for example, just to make it clear, if you compare nitrogen and oxygen, if you want to compare their ionization energies, if you want to compare their ionization energies, here the outermost configuration is 2p3. This is your 2p3 configuration. Here the outermost configuration is 2p4. Here the outermost configuration is 2p4. This is half filled. This is partially filled. Half filled configurations are more stable. So to take electron out from here, more energy has to be supplied. Right? See guys, normally if I think like this, if I think like this, nitrogen, oxygen, on moving from left to right, effective nuclear charge increases. Right? Effective nuclear charge increases, that means ionization energy should increase. Right? So, expected order is this for ionization energy. But actual order will be this. This is the expected. This will be actual. What is the reason behind this? Over here, you have got half-filled configuration, which is more stable. To take electron out from that half-filled configuration, you will have to supply more energy. Correct, people?
perfect do remove this particular case as well this is super important this is super important this is super important 